Section 12 of the Canterbury Tales and Other Poems. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tim Bray Schaefer. The Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer. The Friar's Tale. The Prologue. This worthy limiteur, this noble frere, he made always a manner lowering cheer upon the sompner, but for honesty, no villain word as yet to him spake he. But at the last he said unto the wife, Dame, quoth he, God give you right good life, ye have here touched all so may I thee, in school matter a greater difficulty. Ye have said much a thing right well, I say, but, dame, here as we ride by the way, us needeth not but for to speak of game, and leave authorities in God's name, to preaching and to school eke of clergy, but if it like unto this company, I will you of a sompner tell a game, pardy, ye may well know by the name, that of a sompnor may no good be said, I pray that none of you be evil ped. A sompnor is a runner up and down, with mandaments for fornication, and is ebeat at every towner's end, then spake our host, Ah, sure ye should be hend, and courteous as a man of your estate, in company we will have no debate. Tell us your tale, and let the sompnor be, Nay, quoth the sompnor, let him say by me what so him list, when it comes to my lot. By God I shall him quite in every groat. I shall him tell a what a great honour it is to be a flattering limiteur, and his office I shall him tell you wis. Our host answered, Peace, no more of this. And afterward he said unto the frere, Tell forth your tale, mine Owen, master dear. The Tale Willem there was dwelling in my country, An archdeacon, a man of high degree, That boldly did execution In punishing of fornication, Of witchcraft and eke of bawdery, Of defamation and adultery, of church reeves and of testaments, of contracts and of lack of sacraments, and eke of many other manner crime, which needeth not rehearsen at this time, of usury and simony also, but certes lechers did he greatest woe. They should a singin, if that they were hent, and smell tithers were foul ishent. If any person would on them complain, there might assert them no pecunial pain. For small tithes and small offering, he made the people piteously to sing. For ere the bishop caught them with his crook, they were in, in the archdeacon's book. Then had he, through his jurisdiction, power to do on them correction. He had a sompner ready to his hand, a slyer boy was none in England. For subtlety he had his espi, that taught him well where it might aught avail. He could a spare of lechers one or two, to teach a him to four and twenty more. For, though this sompner would be as a hare, to tell his harlotry I will not spare, for we be out of their correction, they have of us no jurisdiction. Nay, never shall have term of all their lives. Peter, so be the woman of the stives, quoth this sompnor, he put out of our cure. Peace with mischance and with misaventure, our hostess said, and let him tell his tale. Now tell a forth and let the sompnor gale. Nor spare not, mine Owen master dear, This false thief, this sompnor, quoth the frere, Had always bought us ready to his hand As any hawk to lure in Ingleland, That told him all the secrets that they knew, For their acquaintance was not come of new. They were his approvers privily, He took himself at great profit thereaby. 
His master knew not always what he won, without a mandament, a lewd man. He could summon on pain of Christus' curse, and they were inly glad to fill his purse, and make him greater feastus at the nail, and right as Judas had a purse's smell. And was a thief, right, such a thief was he. His master had but half his duty. He was, if I shall give him his laud, a thief, an eke, a sumpnor, and a bawd. And he had wenches at his retinue, that whether that Sir Robert, or Sir Hugh, or Jack, or Ralph, or whoso that it were, that lay by them they told it in his ear. Thus were the wench and he of one assent, and he would fetch a feigned mandament, and to the chapter summon them both two, and pill the man, and let the wench go. Then would he say, Friend, I shall for thy sake do strike thee out of our letters, Blake. Thee thar no more as in this case travail, I am thy friend where I may thee avail. Certain he knew of bribers many more than possible is to tell in years too. For in this world is no dog for the bow that can hurt deer from a hole no. Bet then this sumpnor knew a sly letter, or an adulterer, or a paramour. And for that was the fruit of all his rent, therefore on it he set all his intent. And so befell that once upon a day this sumpnor, waiting ever on his prey, rode forth to summon a widow, an old rebibe, feigning a cause, for he would have a bribe, and happened that he saw before him ride a gay yeoman under a forest side. A bow he bare, and arrows bright and keen, he had upon a courtepy of green, a hat upon his head with fringes blake. Sir, quoth this sumpnor, hail and well or take. Welcome, quoth he, and every good fellow, whether ridest thou under this green shaw, said a this yeoman, wilt thou far to-day? The sumpnor answered him, and said a, nay. Here fast by, quoth he, is mine intent, to ride for to raisin up a rent. That longeth to my lord's duty. Ah, art thou then a bailiff? Yea, quoth he. He durst a not for very filth and shame say that he was a sompnor for the name. De pardieu, quoth this yeoman, leve brother, thou art a bailiff, and I am another. I am unknown as in this country, of thine acquaintance I will pray a thee. And eke of brotherhood, if that thee list, I have gold and silver lying in my chest. If that thee hap to come into our shire, all shall be thine right as thou wilt desire. Grand mercy, quoth this sumpnor, by my faith, each in the other's hand his troth alayeth. For to be sworn a brethren till they day, in dalliance they ride forth and play. This sumpnor, which that was as full of jangles, as full of venom be those wariangles, and ever inquiring upon everything, Brother, quoth he, where is now your dwelling? Another day, if that I should you seech, this yeoman him answered in soft speech. Brother, quoth he, far in the north country, where, as I hope, some time I shall thee see, Ere we depart, I shall thee so well wis, that of mine house shalt thou never miss. Now, brother, quoth this sumpnor, I you pray, teach me, while that we ride by the way, since that ye be a bailiff, as am I, some subtlety, and tell me faithful I, for mine office how that I most may win, and spare not for conscience or for sin, but as my brother, tell me how do ye? Now by my troth, a brother mine, said he, as I shall tell to thee a faithful tale, my wages be full straight and eke a full smell. My lord is hard to me and dangerous, and mine office is full laborious, and therefore by extortion I live, for sooth I take all that men will me give, I'll gate by slighter or by violence, 
From year to year I win all my dispense. I can no better tell thee faithful I. Now certes, quoth this Sompnor, so fair I. I spare not to take, God it wot, but if it be too heavy or too hot, what I may get in counsel privily, no men are conscious of that have I. Ne'er mine extortion I might not live, for of such japes will I not be shriv. Stomach nor conscience know I none, I shrew these shrift of fathers, every one. Well, be we met by God and by St. James, but, leva brother, tell me then thy name. Quoth this Sumpnor, write in this mean a while, this yeoman gan a little for to smile. Brother, quoth he, wilt thou that I thee tell? I am a fiend, my dwelling is in hell, and here I ride about my purchasing, to know where men will give me anything. My purchase is the effect of all my rent. Look how thou ridest for the same intent. To win a good thou reckest never how, right so fair I, for ride will I now. Into the world does end for a prey. Ah, quoth this Sompnor, benedicite. What say ye? I weened ye were a yeoman truly. Ye have a man as shape as well as I. Have ye then a figure determinate in Hella where ye be in your estate? Nay, certainly, quoth he, there have we none, but when us liketh we can take us one, or else make you seem that we be shape, sometime like man or like an ape, or like an angel can I ride or go, it is no wondrous thing though it be so, a lousy juggler can deceive thee, and party yet can I more craft than he. Why, quoth the Sompnor, ride ye then or gone, in sundry shapes, and not always in one? For we, quoth he, will us in such form make, as most is able our prey for to take. What maketh you to have all this labor? Full many a curse, lever Sir Sompnor. Said this fiend, but all thing hath a time, the day is short, and it is past prime. And yet have I won nothing in this day, I will intend to winning, if I may. And not intend or thingest to declare, for, brother mine, thy wit is all too bare. To understand, although I told them thee, but for thou askest, why labora we? For sometimes we be God's instruments, and meanest to do his commandments, when that him list upon his creatures, in diverse acts and in diverse figures, without a him we have no might certain, if that him list to stand a there again. And sometimes at our prayer have we leave only the body, not the soul, to grieve. Witness on Job, whom that we did full woe, and sometimes have we might on both the toe. This is to say, on soul and body eke, and sometimes be we suffered for to seek upon a man, and do his soul unrest, and not his body, and all is for the best, when he withstandeth our temptation. It is a cause of his salvation. Albeit that it was not our intent, he should be safe, but that we would him hent. And sometimes be we servants unto man, as to the archbishop St. Dunstan, and to the apostle servant eke was I. Yet tell me, quoth this Sompnor, faithful I, make ye you newer bodies thus alway of the elements? The fiend answered, nay, sometimes we feign, and sometimes we arise with deader bodies in full sundry wise, and speak as reasonably and fair as well as to the pythoness did Samuel. And yet will some men say it was not he? I do not force of your divinity. But one thing warn I thee, I will not jape. Thou wilt algates wheat how we be shape. Thou shalt hear afterward, my brother dear, come where thee needeth not of me to leer, for thou shalt by thine own experience conna in a chair to read of this sentence. Better than Virgil while he was alive, what I have said, or Dante also, now let us ride blithe, for I will hold a company with thee, till it be so that thou forsake me. 
Nay, quoth this Sumpner, that shall ne'er be tied. I am a yeoman, that is known full wide. My trotha will I hold, as in this case, for thou thou wert the devil, Satanace. My trotha will I hold to thee, my brother, as I have sworn in each of us to other, for to be true brethren in this case, and both we go about in our purchase, take thou thy part, what that men will thee give, and I shall mine, thus may we both a-live. And if that any of us have more than other, let him be true, and part it with his brother. I grant her, quoth the devil, by my fay, and with that word they rode forth their way, and right at the entering of Towna's end, to which this Sumpner's shope him for to wend, they saw a cart that charged was with hay, which that a carter drove forth on his way. Deep was the way for which the cart stood. The carter smote and cried as he were wood, Hide, Scott! Hide, Brock! What spare ye for the stones? The fiend, quoth he, you fetch body and bones, as far forthly as ever ye were fold, so much a woe as I have with you thold. The devil have all horses and cart and hay, the Sompnor said, here shall we have a prey. And near the fiend he drew, as not knew where, full privily and round in his ear. Hearken, my brother, hearken by thy faith, hearest thou not how that the carter saith? Hent it anon, for he hath given it thee, both hay and cart, and eke his capels three. Nay, quoth the devil, God wot, never a deal, it is not his intent, trust thou me well. Ask him thyself, if thou not trowest me, or else stint a while, and thou shalt see. The carter thwacked his horses on the croup, and they began to draw in and to stoop. Hey it now, quoth he, there Jesus Christ you bless, and all his handiwork, both more and less. That was well twite, mine Owen Liart. I pray God save thy body, and Saint Loy. Now is my cart out of the slough, pardee. Lo, brother, quoth the fiend, what told I thee? Here may ye see, mine Owen dear brother. The churl spake one thing, but he thought another. Let us go forth about in our voyage, here win I nothing upon this carriage. When that they came somewhat out of the town, this Sumpnor to his brother gan to round. Brother, quoth he, here wands an old Rebecca that had almost as lief to lose her neck. As for to give a penny of her good, I will have twelve pence, though that she be wood, or I will summon her to our office, and yet, God wot, of her know I no vice. But for thou canst not, as in this country, winna thy cost, take here example of me. This Sumpnor clapped at the widow's gate. Come out, he said, thou old a very trait. I trow thou hast some friar or priest with thee. Who clappeth? said this wife. Benedicity. God save you, sir, what is your sweet a will? I have, quoth he, of summons here a bill. Up pain of cursing, look at that thou be, tomorrow before our archdeacon's knee, to answer to the court of certain things. Now, Lord, quoth she, Christ Jesus, King of kings, so wisely help me, as I not may. I have been sick, and that full many a day. I may not go so far, quoth she, nor ride, but I be dead, so pricketh it my side. May I not ask a libel, Sir Sompnor, and answer there, by my procurator, to such thing as men would oppose me? Yes, quoth this Sompnor, pay anon, let's see. Twelve pence to me, and I will thee acquit. I shall no profit have thereby but lit. My master hath the profit, and not I. Come off, and let me ride hastily. Give me twelve pence, I may no longer tarry. Twelve pence, quoth she. Now, Lady Saint Mary, so wisely help me out of care and sin, this wide world, though, that I should it win. No, have I not twelve pence within my hold? 
ye know full well that I am poor and old. Kithy your almas upon me, poor wretch. Nay then, quoth he, the foul a fiend me fetch. If I excuse thee, though thou shouldest be spilt. Alas, quoth she, God what, I have no guilt. Pay me, quoth he, or by the sweet Saint Anne, as I will bear away thy new a pan. For debt, uh, which thou owest me of old, when that thou madest thine husband cuckold, I paid at home for thy correction. Thou liest, quoth she, by my salvation. Never was I ere now widow or wife, summoned unto your court in all my life. Nor never I was, but of my body true, unto the devil rough and black of hue. Give I thy body, and my pan also. And when the devil heard her curse so, upon her knees he said in this manner, Now, Mabelie, mine Owen mother dear, is this your will in earnest that ye say? The devil, quoth she, so fetch him ere he day, and pan and all, but he will him repent. Nay, old stoat, that is not mine intent, quoth this sumpnor, for to repent o' me for anything that I have had of thee, I would I had thy smock and every cloth. Now, brother, quoth the devil, be not wroth. Thy body and this pan be mine by right, thy shalt with me to hella yet to-night, where thou shalt know in of our privity more than a master of divinity. And with that word the foul a fiend him hent, body and soul he with the devil went, whereas the sompnors have their heritage, and God that make it after his image. Mankind, save and guide us all and some, and let this sompnor a good man become. Lordings, I could have told you, quoth this frere, had I had leisure of the sompnor here. After the text of Christ and Paul and John, and of our other doctors, many a one. Such pain as that your heart is might agrise, albeit so that no tongue may devise. Though that I might a thousand winters tell the pains of Thilk, cursed house of hell. But for to keep us from that cursed place, wake we and pray we Jesus of his grace. So keep us from the tempter, Satan us. Hearken this word, beware as in this case. The lion sits in his await alway, to slay the innocent, if that he may. Dispose in I your heartus to withstand, the fiend that would you make thrall and bond. He may not tempt to you over your might, for Christ will be your champion and your knight. And pray that this our sompnor him repent of his misdeeds, ere that the fiend him hent. End of section 12. Section 13 of the Canterbury Tales and Other Poems. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer. The Sompner's Tale The Prologue The Sompner in his stirrups high he stood, Upon this fire his heart was so wood, That like an aspen leaf he quote for ire, Lordings, quoth he, but one thing I desire, I you beseech that of your courtesy, Since ye have heard this false friar lie, As suffer me, I may my tale it tell, this fire boasteth that he knoweth hell, and got it what, that is but little wonder, friars and fiends be but little asunder. For party ye have often time heard tell, how that a friar ravished was to hell, in spirit one is by a vision, and as an angel led him up and down, to show him all the painest that there were, in all the place saw he not a friar. Of other folk he saw enough in woe, Unto the angel spake the friar though. Now, sir, quoth he, Have friars such a grace That none of them shall come into this place? Yes, quoth the angel, many a million, And unto Satanus he led him down, 
and now hath sataneth said he a tail broader than of a carrick is the sail hold up thy tail thou sataneth quoth he show forth thine arse and let the friar see where is the nest of friars in this place and less than half a furlong way of space right so as bees swarming out of a hive out of the devil's arse there gan to drive a uh, twenty thousand friars on a route and throughout hell they swarmed all about and came again as fast as they may gone and in his arse they creeped every one he clapped his tail again and lay full still this friar when he looked had his fill upon the torments of that sorry place his spirit god restored of his grace into his body again and he awoke but natheless for fear yet he quoke so was the devil's arse eye in his mind that is his heritage of very kind god save you all save this cursed frere my prologue will i end in this manner the tale lordings there is in yorkshire as i guess a marshy country called holderness in which there went a limitor about to preach and eke to beg it is no doubt and so befell that on a day this frere had preached at a church in his manner and specially above everything excited he the people in his preaching to trentals and to give for goddess sake wherewith men might the holy houses make there as divine service is honored not there as it is wasted and devoured nor where it needeth not for to be given as to possessioners that may live in thank it be god in wealth and abundance trentals said he deliver from penance their friend of souls as well old as young yea when they be hastily ye sung not for to hold a priest jolly and gay he singeth not but one mass in a day. Deliver out, quoth he, anon the souls. Full hard it is, with flesh hook or with owls, to be a clod, or to burn or bake. Now speed you hastily for Christ's sake. And when this fire had said all his intent, with qui com patre forth his way he went. When folk and church had given him what them lest, he went his way, no longer would he rest. With scrip and tippet staff, ye tucked high, in every house he gan to pour and pry a pie, and begged meal and cheese or Ellis corn. His fellow had a staff tipped with horn, a pair of tables all of ivory, and a pointel ye polished fetishly, and wrote alway the names, as he stood, of all the folk that gave them any good askance that he would have for them pray give us a bushel wheat or malt or ray a goddess kitchel or a trip of cheese or else what you list we may not choose a goddess half penny or a mass penny or give us of your brawn if you have any a dagon of your blanket love dame our sister dear lo here i write your name bacon or beef or such thing as you find a sturdy harlot went them a behind that was their hostess man and bare a sack and what men gave them laid it on his back and when that he was out at door anon he planed away the names every one that he before had written in his tables he served them with knifles and with fables nay there thou liest thou sompnor quoth the frere peace quoth our host for Christ his mother dear, tell forth thy tale, and spare it not at all. So thrive I, quoth the Sompnor, so I shall. So long he went from house to house, till he came to a house where he was wont to be, refreshed more than in a hundred places. Sick lay the husbandman, who that the place is, bedrid upon a couch, a low he lay. Do seek, quoth he, O oh, Thomas, friend, good day, said this friar, all courteously and soft. Thomas, quoth he, God yielded you full oft. Have I upon this bench fared full well? Here have I eaten many a merry meal. 
and from the bench he drove away the cat, and laid it on his potent and his hat, and eke his scrip, and sat himself adown. His fellow was you walked into town, forth with his knave, into that hostelry, whereas he showed him that night to lie. O oh, dearer master, quoth this sick a man, how have you fared since that march began? I saw you not this fortnight and more. God wot, quoth he, labored have I full sore, and specially for thy salvation have I said many a precious orison, and for mine other friendes God them bless. I have this day been at your church at Mass, and said sermon after my simple wit, not all after the text of holy writ. For it is hard to you, as I suppose, and therefore will I teach you a the glows. Glosing is a full glorious thing certain, for letters slayeth, as we clerk is saying. There have I taught them to be charitable, and spent their good where it is reasonable. And there I saw our dame, where is she? Yonder I trow that in the yard she be, said of this man, and she will come anon. Hey, master, welcome be ye by St. John, said of this wife, how fare ye heartily. This friar riseth up full courteously, and her embraceth in his arm as narrow, and kisseth her sweet, and chirketh as a sparrow with his lippes. Dame, quoth he, right well, as he that is your servant ever deal, thank be God that gave your soul and life, yet saw I not this day so fair a wife in all the churcha, God so save me. Yea, God amend defaultest, sir, quoth she, all gates welcome be ye by my fay. Grand mercy, dame, that have I found all way, but of your great goodness, by your leave, I would pray you that ye not you grieve. I will with Thomas speak a little throw, these curates be so negligent and slow to grope tenderly a conscience. In shrift and preaching is my diligence, and study in Peter's wordes and in Paul's. I walk and fish a Christian men as souls to yield our Lord Jesus his proper rent. To spread his word is all of mine intent. Now by your faith, O dearest sir, quoth she, chide him right well for sainted charity. He is a angry as is of Pismire, though that we have all that we can desire. Though I him wry at night and make him warm, and over him lay my leg and eke mine arm, he groaneth as our boar that lies in sty. Other disport of him right non have I. I may not please him in no manner case. O Thomas, G.V.D., Thomas, Thomas, this maketh the fiend, this must be amended. Ire is a thing that high God hath defended, and thereof will I speak a word or two. Now, master, quoth the wife, ere that I go, what will ye dine? I will go thereabout. Now, dame, quoth he, je vous dis saint du, had I not of a capon but the liver, and of your white bread not but a shiver, and after that a roasted pig's head. But I would that for me no beast were dead. Then had I with your homely sufficience, I am a man of little sustenance. My spirit hath its fostering in the Bible. My body is a so ready and penable to wake that my stomach is destroyed. I pray you, dame, that ye not be annoyed, though I so friendly you my counsel show. By God I would have told it but to few. Now, sir, quoth she, but one word ere I go, my child is dead within these week as twa, soon after that you went out of this town. His death I saw by revelation, said this friar, at home in our door tour. I dare well say that less than half an hour mater his death, I saw him borna to bliss in mine vision, so God me wis. So did our sexton and our firmer heir, that have been true friars fifty year. They may now, God be thanked of his love, make their jubilee and walk above. And up I rose, and all our convent eke, 
with many a tear trailing on my cheek, without the noise or clattering of bells. Te Duem was our song and nothing else, save that to Christ I bade an orison, thanking him of my revelation. For, sir and dame, trust in me right well, our orisons be more effectual, and more we see of Christ's secret things, than borrow folk, although that they be kings. We live in poverty and in abstinence, and borrow folk in riches and dispense, of meat and drink, and in their foul delight. We have this world as lust, all in despite. Lazar and Devis lived diversely, and diverse guerdon had a they thereby. Whoso will pray, he must fast and be clean, and fat his soul and keep his body lean. We fare as saith the apostle, cloth and food suffice us, although they be not full good. The cleanness and the fasting of us friars maketh that Christ accepteth our prayers. Lo, Moses, forty days and forty night, fasted ere that the high God, full of might, spake with him in the mountain of Sinai. With empty womb of fasting many a day, received he the laws that was writ with God's finger, and Eli, well you wit, in Mount Horeb, ere he had any speech, with high a God, that is our livest leech. He fasted long, and was in contemplance. Aaron, that had the temple in governance, and eke the other priestes, every one, into the temple, when they should have gone, to pray for the people, and do service, they would have drinken in no manner wise, no drinka, which that might them drunken make. But there in abstinence pray and wake, lest that they died, take heed what I say, but they be sober, that for the people pray. Where that, I say, no more, but it sufficeth, our Lord Jesus, as holy writ deviseth. Give us example of fasting and prayers, therefore we mendicants, we seely frayers, be wedded to poverty and continence, to charity, humbleness, and abstinence, to persecution for righteousness, to weeping, misericordia, and to cleanness. And therefore may you see that our prayers, I speak of us, we mendicants, we frayers, be to the higher God more acceptable than yours, with your feast is at your table. From paradise first, if I shall not lie, was man outchased for his gluttony. And chaste was man in paradise certain, but hark now, Thomas, what I shall thee sayin'. I have no text of it, as I suppose, but I shall find it in a matter glows. That specially our sweet Lord Jesus spake this of friars when he said of thus, Blessed be they that poor in spirit be, and so forth all the gospel may ye see, whether it be like or our profession, or theirs that swim in possession. Fie on their pomp, and on their gluttony, and on their lewdness, I them defy. Methinkest they be like Jovinian, fat as a whale, and walking as a swan. All violent as bottle in the spence, their prayer is full of great reverence. When they for solace say the psalm of David, Lo, buff they say, cor meum, erect David. Who follow Christ's gospel and his lore, but we that humble be, and chaste and poor, workers of God's word, not auditors. Therefore write we as a hawk upon a soars, up springs into the air, write so prayers, of charitable and chaste busy frayers. Make their sours to God's ears too. Thomas, Thomas, so may I ride or go, and by that Lord that call his Saint Ive, Ne'er thou our brother, shouldest thou not thrive. In our chapter pray we day and night to Christ that he sent health and might, thy body for to wield her hastily. God wot, quoth he, nothing thereof feel I, so help me Christ, as I in few years have spended upon diverse manners frayers, full many a pound, yet fare I ne'er the bet. 
certain my good have I almost beset. Farewell my gold, for it is all ago. The friar answered, O Thomas, dost thou so? What needest thou diverse friars to seek? What needeth him that hath a perfect leech to seek in other leeches in the town? Your inconstance is your confusion. Hold ye then me, or else our convent, to pray for ye insufficient? Thomas, that jape is not worth a mite. Your malady is, for we have too light. Ah, give that convent half a quarter oats too little, and give that convent four and twenty groats, and give that friar a penny, and let him go. Nay, nay, Thomas, it may no thing be so. What is a farthing worth parted on twelve? Lo, each thing that is one in himself is more strong than when it is ye scattered. Thomas of me, thou shalt not be ye flattered. Thou wouldst have our labor all for naught. The high a God that all this world hath wrought, saith that the workman worthy is his hire. Thomas, not of your treasure I desire, as for myself, but that all our convent to pray for you is a so diligent and for to build Christ's own church. Thomas, if you will learn afore to work, of building up of churches, may you find, if it be good, in Thomas's life of ind. You lie here, full of anger and of ire, with which the devil sets your heart on fire, and chide here this holy innocent, your wife, that is so meek and patient. And therefore trow me, Thomas, if thee lest, to strive not with thy wife as for the best, and bear this word away now by thy faith, touching such thing low what the wise man saith. Within thy house be thou no lion, to thy subjects do none oppression, nor make thou thine acquaintance for to flee. And yet, Thomas, eftsoons charge I thee, beware from ire that in thy bosom sleeps, where from the serpent that so slyly creeps under the grass and stingeth subtly, beware, my son, and hearken patiently that twenty thousand men have lost their lives for striving with their lamans and their wives. Now since you have so holy and meek a wife, what needeth you, Thomas, to make strife? There is, you is, no serpent so cruel when men tread on his tail nor half so fell as woman is when she hath caught an ire. Very vengeance is then all her desire. Ire is a sin, one of the greatest seven, abominable to the God of heaven, and to himself it is destruction. This every lewd vicar and parson can say, how ire engenders homicide. Ire is in sooth the executor of pride. I could of ire you say so much a sorrow. My tale is should have last until tomorrow. And therefore pray I God both day and night, an Irish man, God send him little might. It is great harm and certes great pity to set an Irish man in high degree. While on there was an Irish protestate, as saith Senec, that during his estate, upon a day out rode Canitus Two, and as fortune would that it were so, the one of them came home, the other not. And on the knight before the judge is brought, that said of thus, Thou hast thy fellow slain, for which I doom thee to the death certain. And to another knighter commanded he, Go lead him to the death, I charge thee. And happened as they went by the way, toward the place where as he should die, the knighter came, which men weaned, had been dead, then thought to they it was the best to read, to lead them both unto the judge again. They said, uh, Lord, the knight hath not ye slain his fellow, here he standeth whole alive. Ye shall be dead, quoth he, so may I thrive, that is to say, both one and two and three. And to the first of knight, right thus spake he, I damned thee, thus must all gate be dead. And thou also must needest lose thine head, for thou the cause art why thy fellow dieth. And to the third canite, write thus he saith, Thou hast not done that I commanded thee, and thus he did do slay them all a three. 
Iris Combisus was eke drunk a loo, and a delighted him to be a shrew. And so befell a lord of his mimi, a loved virtuous morality, said on a day betwixt them two right thus, A lord is lost if he be vicious, an Iris man is like a frantic beast, in which there is of wisdom none a wrist. And drunkenness is eke a foul record of any man, and namely of a lord. There is full many an eye and many an ear, awaiting on a lord he knows not where. For God is love, drink more temperly, wine maketh man to lose wretchedly his mind, and eke his limbs every one. The reverse shall thou see, quoth he, anon, and prove it by thine own experience, that wine doth the folk no such offence. There is no wine, bereaveth me my might, of hand, nor foot, nor of mine iron sight, and for despite he drank much more a hundred part than he had done before, and right anon this cursed Irish wretch, this Canitus son let before him fetch, commanding him he should before him stand, and suddenly he took his bow in hand, and up the string he pulled to his ear, and with an arrow slew the child right there. Now whether I have a sicker hand or none, quoth he, is all my might and mine a gone? Hath wise bereaved me mine eye in sight? What should I tell the answer of the knight? His son was slain, there is no more to say. Beware, therefore, with lordes how ye play, Sing placebo, and I shall if I can, but if it be unto a poorer man, to a poor man men should his vices tell, but not to a lord, though he should go to hell. Lo, Iris Cyrus, thilk Persian, how he destroyed the river of Gizon, for that a horse of his was drowned therein, when that he went to Babylon to win. He made that the river was so small, that women might await it over all. Lo, what said he, that so well teacher can, be thou no fellow to an Irish man. Nor with no wood, man walk a by the way, lest thee repent, I will no farther say. Now Thomas, leave brother, leave thine ire, thou shalt me find as just as is as squire. Hold not the devil's knife, a eh, at thine heart, Thine anger doth thee all too sore smart, but shew to me all thy confession. Nay, quoth the sick man, by St. Simon, I have been shriven this day of my curate. I have him told all, holy mine estate. Needeth no more to speak of it, saith he, but if me list of mine humility. Give me then of thy good to make our cloister, quoth he, for many a mussel and many an oyster, when other men have been full well at ease, hath been our food, our cloister, for to breeze. And yet, God wot, aneath the fundament, perform it is, nor of our pavement, is not a tile yet within our wounds. By God we owe forty pound for stones. Now help, Thomas, for him that harrowed hell, for ellis must we our bookers sell. And if you lack our predication, then goes this world all to destruction. For whoso from this world would us bereave, so God may save Thomas by your leave. He would bereave out of this world the Son, for who can teach and work in as we come? And that is not of little time, quoth he, but since Elijah was and Elisi, have friars been that find eye of record, in charity ye thank be our Lord. Now Thomas helped for Saint of Charity, and down and on he set him on his knee. The sick man waxed well nigh wood for ire. He would that the fire had been a fire with his false dissemination. Such thing as is in my possession, quoth he, that may I give you and none other, to say me thus, how that I am your brother. Yea, certes, quoth this fire, yea, trust her well, I took our dame, the letter of our seal. Now well, quoth he, and somewhat shall I give unto your holy convent while I live, and in thine hand thou shalt it have anon, on this condition, and other none. 
that thou depart, it so, my dear our brother, that every fire have as much as other. This shalt thou swear on thy profession, without a fraud or cavillation. I swear, quoth the friar, upon my faith, and therewithal his hand in his he laid. Lo, here my faith, in me shall be no lack. Then put thine hand adown right by my back, said to this man, and grope well behind beneath my buttock, there thou shalt find a thing that I have hid in privity. Ah, thought this friar, that shall go with me. And down his hand he launched to the cliff, in hope for to find a there a gift. And when this sick a man felt his fire about his tail a groping there and here, amid his hand he let the fire a fart. There is no capel drawing in a cart that might have let a fart of such a sound. The fire up start as doth a wood lion. Ah, false churl, quoth he, for God is bones, thou hast thou in despite done for thy nuns. Thou shalt be this fart, if that I may. His meanie, which that heard of this affray, came leaping in and chased out the frere, and forth he went with a full angry cheer, and fetched his fellow there as lay his store. He looked as it were a wild a boar, and grounded with his teeth, so was he wroth. A sturdy pace down to the court he goeth, whereas they wand a man of great honor, to whom that he was always confessor. This worthy man was lord of that village. This fire came as he were in a rage, whereas this lord sat eating at his board. Anethas might the fire speak one word, till at the last he said, God you see. This lord gan look and said, Bendicite. What, fire John, what manner world is this? I see well that there something is amiss. You look as though the wood were full of thieves. Sit down anon and tell me what your grieve is, and it shall be amended if I may. I have, quoth he, had a despite today. God yield to you a down in your village that in this world is none so poor a page that would not have abomination of that I have received in your town. And yet it grieveth me nothing so sore as that the old churl with Locus whore blasphemed hath our holy convent eke. Now, master, quoth this lord, I you beseek. No, master, sir, quoth he, but servitor, though I have had in school of that honor, God liketh not that men us rabbi call, neither in market nor in your large hall. No force, quoth he, but tell me all your grief. Sir, quoth this friar, an odious mischief this day betide is to mine order and me. And so par consequence to each degree of holy churcha, God amended soon. Sir, quoth the Lord, you know what is to doon. Distemper you not, you be my confessor. You be the salt of the earth and the Savior. For God has love your patience now hold. Tell me your grief. And he anon him told, as ye have heard before, you know well what. The lady of the house, a stiller sat, till she had a heard o' what the friar said. Hey, goddess mother, quoth she, blissful maid, is there aught to Alice? Tell me faithfully. Madame, quoth he, how thinketh you thereby? How thinketh me, quoth she, so God me speed, I say a churl hath done a churlish deed. What should I say? God let him never thee. His sick ahead is full of vanity. I hold him in a manner frenesy. Madame, quoth he, by God I shall not lie, but I in otherwise may be a reek. I shall defame him over all there I speak. This false blasphemer that charged me to parta that will not departed be to every man alike with mischance. The Lord sat still as were in a trance, and in his heart he rolled up and down. How had this churl imagination to show such a problem to the friar? Never ere now heard I of such matter. I trow the devil put it in his mind. In all our metric shall there no man find before this day of such a question. 
who should make a demonstration that every man should have alike his part as of the sound and savor of a fart. O nice proud churl, I shrew his face, low sires, quoth the Lord, with heart of grace, who ever heard of such a thing ere now? To every man alike, tell me how. It is impossible, it may not be. Hey, nice churl, God let him never thee. The rumbling of a fart in every sound is but of air reverberation and ever wasteth light, and light away, there is no man can demean by my fay, if that it were departed equally. What, lo my churl, lo yet how shrewdly unto my confessor to-day he spake, I hold him certain a demoniac. Now eat your meat, and let the churl go play, let him go hang himself a devil way. Now stood the Lord Squire at the board, that carved his meat, and heard word by word, of all this thing, which that I have you said. My lord, quoth he, be ye not evil paid? I could a tell a for our gown a cloth, to you, sir Fryer, so that ye be not wrought, how that this fart should even deal it be, among your convent, if it like it thee. Tell, quoth the lord, and thou shalt have anon, a gown a cloth, by God and by St. John. My lord, quoth he, when that the weather is fair, without the wind or perturbing of air, let bring a cartwheel here into this hall, but look at that it have its spokes all. Twelve spokes hath a cartwheel commonly, and bring me then twelve friars, know you why? For thirteen is a convent, as I guess. Your confessor here, for his worthiness, shall perform up the number of his convent, then shall they kneel down by one ascent, and to each spoke his end in this manner. Full sad they lay his nose before a frere, your noble confessor there, God him save, shall hold his nose upright under the nave. Then shall this churl, with belly stiff and taut, as any tabor hither be ye brought, and set him on the wheel right of this cart, upon the knave, and make him let a fart. And ye shall see, on peril of my life, by very proof that is demonstrative, that equally the sound of it will wend, and eke the stink unto the spoke's end. Save that this worthy man, your confessor, because he is a man of great honor, shall have the first of fruit, as reason is. The noble usage of friars, yet it is. The worthy men of them shall first be served, and certainly he hath it well deserved. He hath today taught us so much a good, with preaching in the pulpit where he stood, that I may vouchsafe, I say for me, he had the first to smell of Fartus three. And so would all his breath and heartily, he beareth him so fair and holily. The Lord, the Lady, and each man save the frere, Said that Jenkins spake in this matter, as well as Euclid or as Ptolemy, touching the churl, they said that subtly, and high wit made him speaking as he spake. He is no fool, nor no demoniac, and Jenkins hath you won a new gown. My tale is done, we are almost at town. End of section 13, read by Bryce Cries, Ohio. Section 14 of the Canterbury Tales and Other Poems. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer. The Clerk's Tale, Prologue and Parts 1 through 3. The Prologue. Sir Clerk of Oxenford, our hostess said, You ride as still and coy as doth a maid That were new spoused, sitting at the board. This day I heard not of your tongue a word. I trow you study about some sophime. But Solomon saith, everything hath time. For God's sake, be of better cheer. It is no time for to study here. Tell us some merry tale by your fay. 
For what man that is entered in a play, he needest must unto that play assent. But preach a not, as fires do in Lent, to make us for our oldest sinners weep, nor that thy tailor make us not to sleep. Tell us some merry thing of adventures, your terms, your colors, and your figures. Keep them in store, till so be a indict, high style, as when that men to king is right. Speak us so plain at this time, I you pray, that we may understand uh, what you say. This worthy clerk benignedly answered, Host, quoth he, I am under your yurd. Ye you have of us now the governance, and therefore would I do you obeisance, as far as reason asketh, heartily. I will you tell a tale, which that I learned at Padova of a worthy clerk, as proved by his worders and his work. He is now dead and nailed in his chest. I pray to God to give his soul good rest. Francis Petrarch, the laureate poet, height of this clerk, whose rhetoric so sweet, illuminated all Italy of poetry, at Linian did of philosophy, or law, or other art particular, but death that will not suffer us dwell here, but as it were a twinkling of an eye, then both hath slain, and Allah we shall die. But forth the telling of this worthy man, that taught to me this tailor as I began. I say that first he with high style inditeth, ere he the body of his tale writeth. Our proem, in the which describeth he, Piedmont, and of Seleucus the country, and speaketh of the Penina, hill is high, that be the bounds of all West Lombardy, and of Mount Vesulus in special, whereas the Po out of a well of small taketh his first springing and his source, that eastward a increaseth in his course, to Meliaward, to Ferraro and Venice, the which a long thing were to devise. And truly, as to my judgment, methinketh it a thing impertinent, save that he would convey his matter. But this is a tale which that you shall hear. The Tailor, Pars Prima. There is, right at the west side of Italy, down at the root of Vesulis, the cold, a lusty plain abundant of Vitae, there many a town and tower thou mayest behold, that founded were in time of fathers old, and many another delectable sight, and Seleucus this noble country height. A Marquis Wilhelm Lord was of that land, as were his worthy elders him before, and obedient, a ready to his hand, were all his lieges, both the less and more. Thus in delight he lived, and had done yore, beloved and dread through favor of fortune, both of his lordes and of his commune. Therewith he was, to speak of lineage, the gentlest ye born of Lombardy, a fair person, and strong and young of age, and full of honor and of courtesy. Discreet enough his country for to gee, saving in some things that he was to blame. And Walter was this young lord's name. I blame him thus that he considered not, in time coming, what might him be tied, but on his present lust was all his thought, and for to hawk and hunt on every side. Well nigh all other cares let he slide. And eke he would, that was the worst of all, wed a no wife for aught that he might befall. Only that point his people bear so sore, that flock mill on a day to him they went, and one of them that wisest was of lore, or else that the Lord would best assent, that he should tell him what the people meant, or else could he well show such matter. He to the Marquis said, As ye shall hear. O noble Marquis, your humanity assureth us, and gives us hardiness, as oft as time is of necessity, that we to you may tell our heaviness. Accept the Lord, now of your gentleness, what we with piteous heart unto you plain and let your ears my voice not disdain. 
All have I not to do in this matter, more than another man hath in this place. Yet for as much as ye, my Lord so dear, have always showed me favor and grace, I dare the better ask of you a space of audience to show in our request, and ye, my Lord, to do right as you lest. For certes, Lord, so well us like you, and all your work, and ever have done, that we na could not ourselves devise how we might live in more felicity. Save one thing, Lord, if that your will it be, that for to be a wedded man you lest, then were your people in sovereign hearts rest. But we your neck under the blissful yoke of sovereignty and not of service, which that men call espousal or wedlock. And think, O Lord, among your thought is wise, how that our day is past in sundry wise. For though we sleep or wake or roam or ride, a fleeth time, it will no man abide. And though your greeny youth of flower as yet, in creepeth age, always as still as stone, and death menaceth every age, and smit in each estate, for there escapeth none. And also certain as we know each one, that we shall die, as uncertain we all be of that day when death shall on us fall. Accept then of us the true intent, that never yet refused your hest, and we will, Lord, if that you will assent, choose you a wife in short time at the lest, born of the gentlest and of the best of all this land, so that it ought to seem honor to God and you as we can deem. Deliver us out of all this busy dread, and take a wife for higher goddess' sake. For if it so befell, as God forbid, that through your death your lineage should slake, and that a strange successor should attake your heritage, O, woe were us on life. Wherefore we pray you hastily to wife. Their meek a prayer and their piteous cheer made the marquis for to have pity. Ye will, quoth he, mine own people dear, to that I ne'er e'er thought constrain of me. I me rejoice it of my liberty, that seldom time is found in marriage. Where I was free, I must be in servage. But nevertheless I see your true intent, and trust upon your wit, and have done a. Wherefore of my free will I will assent to wed me as soon as e'er I may. But whereas you have proffered me today to choose me a wife, I you release that choice, and pray you of that proffer cease. For God it wot that children often been, unlike their worthy elders than before, bounty comes all of God, not of the stream of which they be engendered and ye bore. I trust in God as bounty, and therefore my marriage and mine estate and rest, I him betake, he may do as him lest. Let me alone in choosing of my wife, that charge upon my back I will endure. But I you pray, and charge upon your life, that what wife that I take, you me assure to worship her, while that her life may dure. In word and work, both here and elsewhere, as she an emperor's daughter were. And furthermore, this thing ye swear, that ye against my choice shall never grudge nor strive, for since I shall forego my liberty, at your request as ever may I thrive, whereas mine heart is set, there will I live, and but you will assent in such manner, I pray you speak no more of this matter. With heartly will they sworn an assent, to all this thing, there said not one white nay, beseeching him of grace, ere that they went, that he would grant to them a certain day of his espousal, soon as e'er he may. For yet always the people somewhat dread, lest that the marquis would a no wife wed. He granted them a day, such as him lest, on which he would be wedded sickerly, and said he did all this at their request. And they with humble heart, full buxomly, kneeling upon their knees full reverently, him thanked all, and thus they have an end of their intent, and home again they wend. 
And hereupon he to his officers commanded for the feasta to purvey, and to his privy canites and squires such charge he gave as him list on them lay. And they to his commandment obey, and each of them doth all his diligence to do unto the feast all reverence. Par Secunda Not far from Thilka Palace, honorable, where as this Marquis Shope his marriage, there stood a thorpe of Sita delectable, in which the poorer folk of that village had their beastas and their harborage, and of their labor took their sustenance, after the earth gave them abundance. Among this poorer folk there dwelt a man, which that was holden poorest of them all. But high a god sometimes send a can, his grace unto a little ox's stall. Janicolum, men of that thorpe call him, a daughter had he, fair enough to sight, and Griseldus, this young a maiden, height. But for to speak of virtuous beauty, then was she one the fairest under sun, full poorly ye fostered up was she, no liquorous lust was in her heart ye run. Well ofter of the well than of the ton she drank, and for she would a virtue please, she knew well labor, but no idle ease. But though this maiden tender were of age, yet in the breast of her virginity there was enclosed a sad and ripe courage, and in great reverence and charity spirit, her older poorer father fostered she. A few sheep spinning on the field she kept, she would not be idle till she slept. And when she homeward came, she would bring wartas and other herbas times oft, the which she shred and seethed for her living, and made her bed full hard and nothing soft. And a she kept her father's life on loft, with every obeyance and diligence that child may do to father's reverence. Upon Griselda, this poor creature, full off in scythes, this marquis set his eye as he on hunting rode, par adventure, and when it fell that he might her espy, he not with wanton looking of folly, his iron cast on her, but in sad wise upon her cheer he would him oft advise. Commending in his heart her womanhead, and eke her virtue, passing any white, of so young age as well in cheer as deed. For though the people have no great insight in virtue, he considered full right her bounty, and disposed that he would wed only her, if ever wed he should. The day of wedding came, but no white can tell her what woman that it should a be. For which Marvale wondered many a man, and said a, when they were in privity, Will not our Lord yet leave his vanity? Will he not wed? Alas, alas, the while, why will he thus himself and us beguile? But nevertheless, this marquis had done make of gemmas set in gold and in azure, brooches and ringers for Griselda's sake, and of her clothing took he the measure of a maiden like unto her stature, and eke of other ornamentas all that unto such a wedding should have fall. The time of undern of the same day approached that this wedding should a be, and all the palace put was in array, both hall and chamber, each in its degree, houses of office stuffed with plenty. There mayest thou see of daintiest vitae that may be found as far as lasts Italy. This royal marquis, richly arrayed, lords and ladies in his company, the which unto the feasta were prayed, and of his retinue the bachelory, with many a sound of sundry melody, unto the village of the which I told, in this array the right way did they hold. Griseld of this, God wot, full innocent, that for her shapen was all this array. To fetch a water at a well is went, and home she came as soon as e'er she may. For well she had heard say that on that day the Marquis should a wed, and if she might, she fain would have seen somewhat of that sight. She thought, I will with other maidens stand, that be my fellows in our door, 
and see the Marchioness, and therefore will I fond to do at home, as soon as it may be, the labor which belongeth unto me. And then I may at leisure her behold, if she this way unto the castle hold. And as she would, over the threshold gone, the Marquis came and gan for her to call, and she set down her water-pot anon, beside the threshold in an ox's stall, and down upon her knee she gan to fall, and with sad countenance kneeled still, till she had heard what was the Lord's will. The thoughtful Marquis spake unto the maid full soberly, and said in this manner, Where is your father, Griseldis? he said. And she with reverence, in humble cheer, answered, Lord, he is already here. And in she went without a longer let, and to the Marquis she her father fet. He by the hand then took the poor man, and said of thus when he him had aside, Janicola, I neither may nor can, longer the pleasance of mine heart to hide. If that thou vouchsafe, whatso betide, thy daughter will I take, ere that I wend, as for my wife, unto her life's end. Thou lovest me, thou know I well certain, and art my faithful liegeman, ye bore. All that liketh me, I dare well sayin, it liketh thee, and specially therefore, tell me that point that I have said before, if that thou wilt unto this purpose draw, to take me as for thy son-in-law. This sudden case the man astonied so, that red he waxed, abashed, and all quaking, he stood on Ethus, said he word as mo, but only thus, Lord, quoth he, my willing is as ye will, nor against your liking, I will do no thing, mine own lord so dear. Write as you list, governor this matter. Then will I, quoth the Marquis softly, that in thy chamber I, and thou and she, have a collation. And knowest thou why? For I will ask her, if her will it be, to be my wife, and rule her after me. And all this shall be done in thy presence. I will not speak out of thine audience." And in the chamber, while they were about, the treaty, which ye shall hereafter hear, the people came into the house without, and wondered them in how honest manner, and tenderly she kept her father dear. But utterly Griseldis wonder might, for never erst ne she saw such a sight. No wonder is, though, that she be astoned, to see so great a guest come in that place. She never was to know such a guest as wound for which she looked with full pale face. But shortly forth this matter for to chase, these are the words that the Marquis said, to this benigna, very faithful maid. Griseld, he said, you shall well understand, it liketh to your father and to me, that I you wed, and eke it may so stand, as I suppose you will that it so be. But these demandes ask I first, quoth he, since that it shall be done in hasty wise, will ye assent, or else you advise? I say this, be ye ready with good heart to all my lust, and that I freely may, as me best thinketh, do you laugh or smart, and never ye to grudge night nor day. And eke when I say yea, ye say not nay, neither by word nor frowning countenance. Swear this, and here I swear our alliance. Wondering upon this word, quaking for dread, she said, uh, Lord, indigni and unworthy am I to this honor that ye me bead. But as ye will yourself, right so will I. And here I swear that never willingly, in word or thought, I will you disobey, for to be dead, though me were loath to die. This is enough. Griselda mine, quoth he, and forth he went with a full sober cheer, out at the door, and after then came she, and to the people he said in this manner, This is my wife, quoth he, that standeth here, honor her and love her, I you pray, whoso me loves, there is no more to say. 
and for that nothing of her old gear she should have bring into his house, he bade the women should despoil her right there, of which these ladies were nothing glad to handle her clothes wherein she was clad. But nevertheless this maiden bright of hue, from foot to head they clothed have all new. Her hairs have they combed that lay untressed full rudely, and with their fingers small a crown upon her head they have dressed, and set her full of nooches, great and small. Of her array, why should I make a tailor? Aneath the people her knew for her fairness, when she transmuted was in such riches. The marquis had her spousehood with a ring, brought for the same cause, and then her set upon a horse snow white, and well ambling, and to his palace, ere he longer let, with joyful people that her led and met, conveyed her, and thus the day they spend in revel till the sun gan descend. And shortly, forth this tale for to chase, I say that to this new a marchioness, God hath such favor sent her of his grace, that it ne seemed, not by likeliness, that she was born and fed in rudeness, as in a cot or in an ox's stall, but nourished in an emperor's hall. To every white she waxen is so dear and worshipful, that folk where she was born, that from her birth I knew her year by year, aneath is trowed they, but durst have sworn, that to Janicol, of whom I spake before, she was not daughter, for by conjecture them thought she was another creature. For though that ever virtuous was she, she was increased in such excellence of through is good, ye set in high bounty, and so discreet and fair of eloquence, so benign and so digna of reverence, and could as so the people's heart embrace, that each her loved that looked on her face. Not only of Seleucus in the town, published was the bounty of her name, but eke besides in many a region, if one said well, another said the same. So spread of here high bounty the fame, that men and women, young as well as old, went to Seleucus, her for to behold. Thus Walter lowly, nay, but royally, Wedded with fortunate honesty, in goddess peace lived full easily at home, and outward grace enough had he. And, for he saw that under low degree was honest virtue hid, the people him held a prudent man, and that is seen full seld. Not only this Griseldis, through her wit, couth all the feet of wifely homeliness, but eke, when that the case required it, the common prophet could as she redress. There nas discord, rancor, nor heaviness in all the land that she could not appease, and wisely bring them all in rest and ease. Though that her husband absent were or non, if gentlemen or other of that country were wroth, she would have bring of them at one, so wise and ripe word as had as she. And judgment of so great equity that she from heaven sent was, as men wend, people to save, and every wrong to amend. Not long a time after that this Griswold was wedded, she a daughter had ye born, all she had lever born a Canave child, glad was the Marquis and his folk therefore, for though a maiden child came all before, she may unto a Canave child attain, by likelihood, since she is not barren. Paris Tertia. There fell, as falleth many times mo, when that his child had sucked but a throw, this marquis in his heart a longed so, to tempt his wife her sadness for to know, that he might not out of his heart a throw, this marvelous desire his wife to assay. Needless, God wot, he thought her to affray. He had assayed her enough before, and found her ever good, what needed it her for to tempt, and always more and more. Though some men praise it for a subtle wit, but as for me, I say, evil it sit. 
to assay a wife when that it is no need, and put her in anguish and in dread, for which this marquis wrought in this manner. He came home at night alone there as she lay, with stern of face and with full troubled cheer, and said of thus, Griseld, quoth he, that day that I took you out of your poor array and put you in a state of high noblesse, ye have not forgotten it, as I guess. I say, Griseld, this present dignity, in which that I have put you, as I trow, maketh you not forgetful for to be, that I you took in poor estate full low, for any weal you must yourself and know. Take heed of every word that I you say, there is no white that hears it but we tway. You know yourself well how that you came here into this house, it is not long ago, and though to me you be right leaf and dear, unto my gentles ye be nothing so. They say to them it is great shame and woe, for to be subject and be in service to thee that art born of small lineage. And namely, since thy daughter was ye bore, these wordes have they spoken doubtless, but I desire, as I have done before, to live my life with them in rest and peace. I may not in this case be reckless, I must do with thy daughter for the best, not as I would, but as my gentles lest. And yet, God wot, this is full loath to me, but nevertheless, without the your weeting, I will not do, but this will I, quoth he, that ye to me assent to this thing, show now your patience in your working, that ye me height and swore in your village, the day that make it was our marriage. When she had heard all this, she not amieved, neither in word, in cheer, nor countenance, for, as it seemed, she was not aggrieved. She said, uh, Lord, all lies in your pleasance, my child and I, with hearty obeyance, be yours all, and ye may save or spill your own thing, work then after your will. There may no thing, so God my soul is save, like to you that may displease me. Nor I desire nothing for to have, nor dread of for to lose, save only ye. This will is in mine heart, and a shall be, no length of time, nor death may this deface, nor change my courage to another place. Glad was the Marquis for her answering, but yet he feigned as he were not so. All dreary was his cheer and his looking, when that he should out of the chamber go. Soon after this, a furlong way or two, he privily hath told all his intent, unto a man and to his wife him sent. A manor sergeant was this private man, the which he faithful often found in had. In thing as great, and eke such folk well can, do execution in thing as bad. The Lord knew well that he him loved and dread, and when the sergeant knew his lord's will, into the chamber stalked he full still. Madame, he said, you must forgive it me, though I do thing to which I am constrained. You be so wise that right well know ye, that lordes hestes may not be ye feigned. They may well be bewailed and complained, but men must needs unto their lust obey, and so will I, there is no more to say. This child I am commanded for to take, and spake no more, but out the child he hent, despiteously, and gan a cheer to make unpityingly, as though he would have slain it ere he went. Giseldus must all suffer and consent, and as a lamb she sat there meek and still, and let this cool sergeant do his will. Suspicious was the defame of this man, suspect his face, suspect his word also, suspect the time in which he this began. Alas, her daughter, that she loved so, she weaned he would have it slain right though. But nevertheless she neither wept nor psyched, conforming her to what the Marquis liked. But at the last to speak as she began, and meekly she unto the sergeant prayed, 
so as he was a worthy gentleman, that she might kiss her child ere that it died. And in her barm this little child she laid, with full sad face, and gan the child to bless, and lulled it, and after gan it kiss. And thus she said to her in benign a voice, Farewell, my child, I shall thee never see, but since I have thee marked with the cross, of that father ye blessed mayest thou be, that for us died upon a cross of tree, thy soul, my little child, I him betake, for this night thou shalt die, and for my sake. I trow that to a Norris in this case, it had been hard this Rutha for to see, well might a mother then have cried, alas, but nevertheless so sad steadfast was she, that she endured all adversity, and to the sergeant meekly she said, Have here again your little younger maid. Go now, quoth she, and do my lord's behest, and one thing I would pray you of your grace, but if my lord forbade you at the least, bury this little body in some place that neither beasts nor birdes it erase. But he no word would to that purpose say, but took the child and went upon his way. The sergeant came unto his lord again, and of Griselda's words and of her cheer, he told him point for point in short and plain and him presented with his daughter dear. Somewhat this lord had ruth in his manner, but nevertheless his purpose held he still, as lord is do when they will have their will, and bade the sergeant that he privily should of the child full softly wind and wrap, with all circumstances tenderly, and carried in a coffer or in lap, but upon pain his head off for to swap, that no man should a know of his intent, nor whence he came, nor whither that he went. But at Bologna to his sister dear, that at that time of Panique was countess, he should it take and show her this matter, beseeching her to do her business, this child to foster in all gentleness, and whose child it was he bade her hide from every white for aught that might be tied. The sergeant went and hath fulfilled this thing, but to the marquis now return a wee. For now went he full fast imagining, if by his wife's cheer he might to see, or by her worders apperceive, that she were changed, but he never could her find, but ever in one, alike, sad and kind. As glad, as humble, as busy in service, and eke in love as she was wont to be, was she to him in every manner wise, and of her daughter not a word spake she. No accident for no adversity was seen in her, nor e'er her daughter's name she named, or in earnest, or in game. End of section 14, read by Bryce Cries, Ohio. Section 15 of the Canterbury Tales and Other Poems. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer. The Clerk's Tale, Parts 4 through 6. Pars Corta. In this estate there passed before year, ere she with child a was, but as God wold, a knave child she bare by this Walter, full gracious and fair for to behold, and when that the folk it to his father told, not only he, but all his country, merry were for this child, and God they thank and hear he. When it was two year old, and from the breast departed of the nurse, on a day, this Marquis caught yet another lest, to tempt his wife yet further, if he may. O oh, needless was she tempted in as say, but wedded man, not canon, no measure, when that they find a patient creature. Wife, quoth the Marquis, ye have heard ere this, my people sickly bear our marriage, and namely, since my son ye born is, now is it worse than ever in all our age. 
The murmur slays mine heart and my courage, for to mine ears cometh a voice so smart that it well nigh destroyed hath mine heart. Now say they thus, When Walter is ye gone, then shall the blood of Janicol succeed, and be our Lord, for other have we none. Such word is, say my people, out of dread. Well, ought I of such murmur take heed, for certainly I dread all such sentence, though they not plainen in mine audience. I would a live in peace, if that I might, wherefore I am disposed utterly, as I his sister served air by night, right so think I to serve him privily. This warn I you, that ye not suddenly out of yourself, for no woe should outray, be patient, and thereof I you pray. I have, quoth she, said thus, and ever shall, I will no thing, nor nil no thing, certain, but as you list, not grieveth me at all, though that my daughter and my son be slain at your commandment, that is to say, and I have not had no part of children twain, but first sickness, and after woe and pain. Ye be my lord, do with your own thing, write as you list, and ask no read of me. For as I left at home all my clothing, when I came first to you, right so, quoth she, left I my will and all my liberty, and took your clothing, wherefore I you pray, do your pleasance, I will your lust obey. And certes, if I had a prescience, your will to know, ere ye your lust me told, I would it do without a negligence. But now I know your lust and what you wold, all your pleasance, firm and stable, I hold. For wist I that my death might do you ease, right gladly would I die in you to please. Death may not make no comparison unto your love. And when this Marquis say the constance of his wife, he cast a down his eye in two, and wondered how she may in patience suffer all this array. And forth he went with dreary continence, but to his heart it was full great pleasance. This ugly sergeant, in the same wise that he her daughter caught, right so hath he, or worse if men can any worse devise, Ye hent her son, that full was of beauty, and ever in one so patient was she, that she no cheera made of heaviness, but kissed her son, and after gan him bless. Save of this she prayed him, if that he might, her little son he would in earth a grave, his tender limbus delicate to sight, from fowls and from beasts for to save. But she none answer of him might to have, he went his way, as him nothing ne wrought, but to Bologna tenderly it brought. The Marquis wondered ever longer more upon her patience, and if that he not had a soothly known there before, that perfectly her children loved she, he would have weaned that of some subtlety and of malice, or for cruel courage, she had a suffered this with sad visage. But well he knew that, next himself, certain she loved her children best in every wise. But now of women would I ask a fain, if these assayers might it not suffice. What could a sturdy husband more devise, to prove her wifehood and her steadfastness, and he continuing ever in sturdiness? But there be folk of such condition, that when they have a certain purpose take, they cannot stint of their intention, but right as they were bound unto a stake, they will not of their first a purpose slake. Right so this Marquis fully hath purposed to tempt his wife as he was first disposed. He waited, if by word or countenance, that she to him was changed of courage, but never could he find a variance. She was a one in heart and in visage, and a the further that she was in age, the more true, if that it were possible, she was to him in love, and more penable. For which it seemed thus, that of them two there was but one will, for, as Walter lest, the same pleasance was her lust also. And God be thanked, all fell for the best, she showed well, 
for no worldly unrest, a wife as of herself, no thinga should will in effect, but as her husband would. The slander of Walter wondrous widespread, that of a cruel heart he wickedly, for he a poor woman wedded had, had murdered both his children privily. Such murmur was among them commonly. No wonder is, for to the people's ear there came no word but that they murdered were. For which, whereas his people there before had loved him well, the slander of his defame made them that they him hated therefore. To be a murderer is a hateful name. But nevertheless, for earnest or for game, he of his cool purpose would not stent. To tempt his wife was set all his intent. When that his daughter twelve year was of age, he to the court of Rome, in subtle wise, informed of his will, sent his message, commanding him such bullets to devise, as to his cruel purpose may suffice. How that the Pope, for his people's rest, bade him to wed another, if him lest. I say he bade they should a counterfeit, the Pope's bullis, making mention that he had leave his first a wife to leet, to stint a rancor and dissension, betwixt his people and him. Thus spake the bull, the which they have published at full. The rude people, as no wonder is, weened full well that it had been right so, but when these tidings came to Griseldis, I deem of that her heart was full of woe. But she, alike sad, forever mo disposed was, this humble creature, the adversity of fortune, all to endure. Abiding ever his lust and his pleasance, to whom that she was given, heart and all, as to her very worldly sufficience, but shortly of the story tell I shall, the Marquis written hath in special a letter in which he showed his intent, and secretly it to Bologna sent. To the Earl of Panico, which had a though wedded his sister, prayed he specially to bring a home again his children two, in honorable estate all openly, but one thing he him prayed utterly, that he to no white, though men would inquire, should a not tell whose children that they were. But say the maiden should ye wedded be unto the Marquis of Seleucia anon, and as this earl was prayed, so did he, for at day set he on his way is gone towards Seleucia, and Lourdes, many a one in rich array, this maiden for to guide, her younger brother riding her beside. Arrayed was toward her marriage, this fresher maiden, full of gemmes clear, her brother, which that seven year was of age, arrayed eke full fresh in his manner, and thus in great noblesse and with great cheer, toward Seleucus, shaping their journey, from day to day they rode upon their way. Pars Quinta Among all this, after his wick usage, the Marquis, yet his wife to tempt him more, to the uttermost proof of her courage, fully to have experience and lore, if that she were as steadfast as before, he on a day in open audience, full boisterously said her this sentence, Certus, Griseld, I had enough pleasance to have you to my wife for your goodness and for your truth and for your obeyance not for your lineage, nor for your riches. But now know I, in very soothfastness, that in great lordship, if I well advise, there is great servitude and sundry wise. I may not do as every plowman may. My people me constraineth for to take another wife, and crieth day by day, and eke the pope, rancor for to slake, consenteth it, that there I undertake. And truly this much I will you say, my new wife is coming by the way. Be strong of heart, and void anon her place, and thilk a dower that ye brought to me, take it again, I grant it of my grace. Return it to your father's house, quoth he, no man may always have prosperity, 
With even heart I read you to endure the stroke of fortune or of a venture. And she again answered in patience, My lord, quoth she, I know and knew alway how that betwixt a your magnificence and my poverty no white nor can nor may make comparison. It is no nay. I held me never digny in no manner to be your wife, nor yet your chamberer. And in this house where ye me lady maid, the high a God take I for my witness, and also wisely he my soul a glade, I never held me lady nor mistress, but humble servant to your worthiness, and ever shall, while that my life may dure, above in every worldly creature that ye so long of your benignity have holden me in honor and nobly, whereas I was not worthy for to be, that thank I God and you to whom I pray, for yield at you there is no more to say. Unto my father gladly will I wend, and with him dwell unto my life's end. Where I was fostered as a child full small, till I be dead my life there will I lead a widow clean in body, heart, and all, for since I gave to you my maidenhead, and am your true wife, it is no dread. God shield us such a lord as wife to take, another man to husband or to make. And of your new wife, God of his grace, so grant you weal and all prosperity, for I will gladly yield to her my place, in which that I was blissful want to be. For since it liketh you, my lord, quoth she, that Willem were in all mine heart is rest, that I shall go, I will go when you lest. But whereas ye may proffer such dower as I first brought, it is well in my mind, it was my wretched clothes, nothing fair, the which to me were hard now for to find. O good a God, how gentle and how kind, ye seen by your speech and by your visage, the day that maked was our marriage. But sooth is said, I'll gate I find it true, for in effect it proved as on me, love is not old as when that it is new. But certes, Lord, for no adversity, to die in this case it shall not be, that ere in word or work I shall repent, that I give you mine heart in whole intent. My Lord, you know that in my father's place you did me strip out of my poorer weed, and richly you clad me of your grace. To you brought I not Ellis out of dread, but faith and nakedness and maidenhead, and here again your clothing I restore, and eke your wedding ring for evermore. The remnant of your jewels ready be within your chamber, I dare safely say, and naked out of my father's house, quoth she, I came and naked I must turn again. All your pleasance would I follow fain. But yet I hope it not be your intent that smockless I out of your palace went. You could not do so dishonest a thing that thilk a womb in which your children lay should have before the people in my walking be seen all bare, and therefore I you pray let me not like a worm go by the way. Remember you, mine own lord so dear, I was your wife, though I unworthy were. Wherefore, in guerdon of my maidenhead, which that I brought and not again I bear, as vouchsafe to give me to my mead, but such a smock as I was wont to wear, that I therewith may wry the womb of her that was your wife, and here I take my leave of you, mine own lord, lest I you grieve. The smock, quoth he, that thou hast on thy back, let it be still, and bear it forth with thee. But well on Ethus, thilk a word he spake, but went his way for ruth and for pity. Before the folk herself a stripped she, and in her smock with foot and head all bare, toward her father's house forth is she fair. The folk her followed, weeping on her way, and fortune a they cursed as they gone, but she from weeping kept her eye and dry, nor in this time word a spoke she none. 
Her father, that this tiding heard anon, cursed the day and time that nature shope him to be a living creature. For, out of doubt, this old poorer man was ever in suspect of her marriage. Forever deemed he, since it first began, that when the Lord fulfilled had his courage, he would a think it were a disparage to his estate, so low for to alight, and void to her as soon as e'er he might. Against his daughter hastily went he, for he by noise of folk knew her coming, and with her old accord as it might be, he covered her, full sorrowfully weeping. But on her body might he it not bring, for rude was a cloth, and more of age, by day as fella, than at her marriage. Thus with her father for a certain space, dwelled this flower of wifely patience, that neither by her words nor by her face, before the folk, nor eke in their absence, ne showed she that her was done offence, nor of her high estate, no remembrance, ne had a she, as by her countenance. No wonder is, for in her great estate, her ghost was ever in plain humility, no tender mouth, no heart a delicate, no pomp, and no semblance of royalty, but full of patient benignity, discreet and prideless, a honorable, and to her husband ever meek and stable. Men speak of Job, and most verse humblest, as clerkus, when them lists, can well indict, namely of men, but as in soothfastness, though clerkus praise women but a light, there can no man in humblest him a quite, as women can, nor can be half so true as women be, but it be fall of new. Pars Sexta From Bologna is the Earl of Panicum, of which the fame upsprang to more and less, and to the people's ears, all and some, was known eke that a new marchioness he with him brought in such pomp and riches, that never was there seen with man as eye so noble array in all West Lombardy. The Marquis, which that shope and knew all this, ere that the Earl was come, sent his message for thilk poor Selly Griseldis, and she, with humble heart and glad visage, nor with no swelling thought in her courage, came at his hest, and on her knees her set, and reverently and wisely she him gret. Griseld, quoth he, my will is utterly, this maiden, that shall wed it be to me, receive it be to-morrow as royally as it possible in my house to be. And eke that every wight in his degree have his estate in sitting and service, and in high pleasance as I can devise. I have no women sufficient certain, the chambers to array in ordinance, after my lust, and therefore would I fain, that thine were all such manner governance. Thou knowest eke of old all my pleasance, though thine array be bad and ill besse, do thou thy devoir at the least away. Not only, Lord, that I am glad, quoth she, to do your lust, but I desire also you for to serve and please in my degree, without a fainting, and shall ever mow, nor ever for no weal, nor for no woe, ne shall the ghost within mine heart stent to love you best with all my true intent. And with that word she gan the house to dight, and tables for to set, and beds to make, and painted her to do all that she might, praying the chamberses for goddess' sake to hasten them, and fast to sweep and shake, and she the most serviceable of all, hath every chamber arrayed, and his hall. About the undern gan the earl alight, that with him brought these noble children tway, for which the people ran to see the sight of their array so richly besse, and then at erst among us them they say, that Walter was no fool, though that him lest, to change his wife, for it was for the best. For she is fairer as a demon all, than is Griseld, and more tender of age. 
and fairer fruit between them should have fall, and more pleasant, for her high lineage. Her brother eke so fair was a visage, that them to see the people hath caught pleasance, commanding now the Marquis's governance. O stormy people, unsad and ever untrue, and undiscreet and changing as a vain, delighting ever in rumor that is new. For like the moon, so waxy ye and wane, a full of clapping, dear enough a Jane. Your doom is false, your constance evil preveth, a full great fool is he that you believeth. Thus said a the sad folk in that city, when that the people gazed up and down, for they were glad, right for the novelty, to have a new lady of their town. No more of this now may I mention, but to Griseld again I will me dress, and tell her constancy and business. Full busy was Griseld in everything, that to the feasta was appurtenant, right not was she abashed of her clothing, though it were rude and some deal eke to rent. But with glad cheer unto the gate she went, with other folk to greet the marchioness, and after that did forth her business. With so glad cheer his guestess she received, and so cunningly each in his degree, that no default no man apperceived, but a they wandered what she might to be, that in so poor array was for to see, and could of such honor and reverence, and worthily they praise her prudence. In all this mina, while she not stent, this maid and eke her brother, to command with all her heart and full benign intent, so well that no man could her praise amend. But at the last, when that the Lord is wend, to sit a down to meet, he gan to call Griseld as she was busy in the hall. Griseld, quoth he, as it were in his play, how liketh thee my wife and her beauty? Right well, my lord, quoth she, for in good fay, a fairer saw I never none than she. I pray to God give you prosperity, and so I hope that he will to you send pleasance enough unto your life's end. One thing beseech I you, and warn also, that ye not prick her with no tormenting, this tender maiden, as ye have done me. For she is fostered in her nourishing more tenderly, and, to my supposing, she might a not adversity endure, as could a poor fostered creature. And when this Walter saw her patience, her glad a cheer, and no malice at all, and he so often had done her offense, and she a sad and constant as a wall, continuing ever her innocence o'er all, the sturdy marquis gan his heart to dress to rue upon her wifely steadfastness. This is enough, Griselda mine, quoth he, be now no more aghast, nor evil paid, I have thy faith and thy benignity, as well as ever woman was, assayed, in great estate and poorly arrayed. Now know I, dear wife, thy steadfastness, and her in arms he took and gan to kiss. And she for wonder took of it no keep, she heard a not what thing he to her said. She fared as she had start out of a sleep, till she out of her mazedness abrayed. Griseld, quoth he, by God that for us died, thou art my wife, none other I have, nor ever had, as God my soul is safe. This is thy daughter, which thou hast supposed to be my wife, that other faithfully shall be mine heir, as I have a disposed. Thou bear them of thy body truly, at Pologna kept I them privily. Take them again, for now mayest thou not say, that thou hast lorn none of thy children tway. And folk that otherwise have said of me, I warn them well, that I have done this deed for no malice, nor for no cruelty, but to assay in thee thy womanhead, and not to slay my children, God forbid, but for to keep them privily, and still, till I thy purpose knew, and all thy will. When she this heard, 
In swoon adown she falleth for piteous joy, and after her swooning she both her younger children to her calleth, and in her arms piteously weeping, embrace them, and tenderly kissing, full like a mother, with her salted tears, she bathed both their visage and their hairs. Oh, what a piteous thing it was to see, her swooning and her humble voice to hear. Grand mercy, Lord, God thank it you, quoth she, that you have saved me, my children dear. Now rack I never to be dead right here, since I stand in your love and in your grace, no force of death, nor when my spirit pace. O tender, O dear, O young children mine, your woeful mother weaned steadfastly, that cruel hounders or some foul vermin had eaten you, but God of his mercy and your benign father tenderly have done you keep, and in that same stound all suddenly she swept down to the ground, and in her swoon so sadly holdeth she her children twa, when she gan them embrace, that with great slight and great difficulty the children from her arm they can erase. O oh, many a tear on many a piteous face, down ran of them that stood a her beside, aneath about the her might they abide. Walter her gladdeth, and her sorrow slaketh, she riseth up unabashed from her trance, and every white her joy and feast maketh, till she had caught again her countenance. Walter her doth so faithfully pleasance, that it was dainty for to see the cheer betwixt them two, since they be met in fear. The ladies, when that there they time say, have taken her and into chamber gone, and stripped her out of her rude array, and in a cloth of gold that brightly shone, and with a crown of many a richest stone upon her head, they into a hall her brought, and there she was honored as her ought. Thus had this piteous day a blissful end, for every man and woman did his might this day in mirth and revel to dispend, till on the welkin shone the starest bright, for more solemn in every man of sight this feast was, and greater of costage than was the revel of her marriage. Full many a year in high prosperity lived these two in concord and in rest, and richly his daughter married he, unto a lord, one of the worthiest in all Italy, and then in peace and rest his wife's father in his court he kept, till that the soul out of his body crept. His son succeeded in his heritage, in rest and peace, after his father's day, and fortunate was eke in marriage, all he put not his wife in great assay. This world is not so strong, it is no nay, as it hath been in older times yore, and hearken what this author saith, therefore. This story is said not for that wives should follow Griselda in humility, for it were importable though they would, but for that every white in his degree should have be constant in adversity, as was Griselda, therefore Petrarch writeth this story, which with high style he indicteth. For since a woman was so patient unto a mortal man, well more we ought, receiving all in gree, that God has sent good will, for great skill is he proved that he wrought, but he tempteth no man that he hath brought, as saith St. James, if ye his epistle read, he proveth folk all day it is no dread, and suffereth us for our exercise, with sharpest scourges of adversity, full often to be beat in sundry wise, not for to know our will, for certes he, ere we were born, knew all our frailty, and for our best is all his governance, let us then live in virtuous sufferance. But one word, lordings, hearken, ere I go. It were full hard to find a nowadays, in all a town, Griselda's three or two. For if that they were put to such a says, the gold of them hath now so bad a lays with brass, that though the coin be fair at eye, it would a rather break in two than ply. For which here, for the wife's love of bath, 
whose life and all her sex may God maintain, in high mastery, and Ellis for its scath, I will, with lusty hearta, fresh and green, say you a song to gladden you, Irene, and let us stint of earnestful matter, hearken my song that saith in this manner. L'envoy of Chaucer. Griselda's dead, and eke her patience, and both at once are buried in a tale, for which I cry in open audience, no wedded man so hardy be to assail his wife's patience, in trust to find Griselda's, for in certain he shall fail. O noble wives, full of high prudence, let no humility your tongue is nail, nor let no clerk have cause or diligence to write of you a story of such marvail as of Griselda, patient and kind, lest Chicavache you swallow in your entrail. Follow echo that holdeth no silence, but ever answereth at the countertale. Be not bedaft for your innocence, but sharply take on you the governail. Imprint a well this lesson in your mind, for common profit, since it may avail. Ye archer wives stand a at defense, since ye be strong as is a great camel, nor suffer not that men do you offense, and slender wives, feeble in bat tail, be eager as a tiger, yawned in end, a clapping as a mill, I you can sail. Nor dread them not, nor do them reverence, for though thine husband armed be in mail, the arrows of thy crabbed eloquence shall pierce his breast, and eke his eventail in jealousy I read, eke thou him bind, and thou shalt make him couch as doth a coil. If thou be fair, where folk be in presence, show thou thy visage and thine apparel. If thou be foul, be free of thy dispense, to get thee friends a do thy travail. Be a of cheer as light as leaf on lind, and let him care and weep and ring and wail. End of section 15, read by Bryce Cries, Ohio. Section number 16 of The Canterbury Tales and Other Poems. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Victoria Quint. The Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer. The Merchant's Prologue and the Merchant's Tale. Part 1. The Prologue. Weeping and wailing, care and other sorrow, I have enough on even and on morrow, quoth the merchant, and so have other more that wedded be. I trow that it be so, for well he would that fareth so by me. I have a weef the worst that may be, for though the fiend to her he coupled wear, she would him overmatch, he dare well swear. Why should he you rehearse in special her high malice? She is a shrew at all. There is a long and large a difference, everything wicked, betwixt Griselda's great patience and of me wif the passing cruelty. Were he unbounden, also may he they, he would never eft come in the snare. We wedded men live in sorrow and care. I say it who so will, and he shall find, that he say sooth by St. Thomas of Ind, as for the more part I say not all, God shield that it should so befall. Ah, good sir host, I have you wedded be, this monoth's toe, and more not pardi. And yet he trow that he that all his life waithless hath been, though that men would him grieve, into the heart could in no manner tell so much sorrow as he you hear could tell in of my wife's cursedness. Now, quoth our host, merchant, so God you bless, since ye so much knowing of that art, full heartily I pray you tell us part. Gladly, quoth he, but of mine own soul, for so he heart, I tell a me no more. The Merchant's Tale 
We loom their was a dwelling in Lombardy, a worthy knecht that born was at Pavia, in which he lived in great prosperity. In forty years a wifless man was he, and followed I his bodily delict on women where as was his appetite, as do these fools that be seculars, and when that he was passed sixty years, were it for holiness or for dotage, I cannot say, but such a great courage had a this knight to be a wedded man, that day and night he did all that he can to espy where that he might wedded be, praying our Lord to grant him that he might once knowing of that blissful life that is betwixt a husband and his wife and for to live under that holy bond with which god first a man and woman bond no no their leaf said he is worth a bane for wedlock is so easy and so clean that in this world it is a paradise thus said this old knight that was so is and certainly as sooth as god is king to take a wife it is a glorious thing and namely, when a man is old and hoar, then is a wif the fruit of his trezor. Then should he take a wif, a younger wif and a fair, on which he make to engender him an heir, and laid his leaf in joy and in solace, whereas these bachelors singing, Alas! when that they find any adversity in love, which is but childish vanity, and truly it sets well to be so that bachelors have often pain and woe and brittle ground they build and brittleness they find when they win sickerness they live but as a bird or as a beast in liberty and under no rest whereas a wedded man in his estate liveth a life blissful and ordinate under the yoke of marriage he bound well may his heart and joy and bliss abound. For who can be so buxom as a wife, who is so true and eke so attentive, to keep him sick and whole as is his make? For well or woe she will him not forsake. She is not weary him to love and serve, though that he lie bedrid until he starve. And yet some clerkes say it is not so, of which he, Theophrast, is one of those. What force, thought Theophrast, lest for to lie, take no wif, quoth he, for husbandry, as for to spare in household they dispense, a true servant doth my diligence, thy good to keep, then doth thine own wif, for she will claim a half part all her leaf. And if that thou be sick, so God may save, thy very friends or a true knave will keep the bet than she that waiteth thee after thy good and hath done many a day this sentence and a hundred times worse writeth this man their god his bonus curse but take no keep of all such vanity defy thou frost and hearken to me a wife is good as gift verily in all other manner gift is hardly as hand as rent as pasture or commune or mebels all big gifts of fortune that passing as a shadow on the wall but dread thou not if plainly speak I shall a wee for last and in thine house endure well longer than they list par aventure mariage the grateful sacrament he which that hath no wife he hold him shunt he liveth helpless and all desolate I speak of folk and secular stats, and hearken why, I say not this for naught, that woman is for man is help he wrought. The hair god, when he had all a market, and saw him all alone a belly naked, god of his great goodness, said then, let us know, make a help unto this man, like to himself, and then he made him Eve. Here may ye say, and hereby may ye prove, that a wief as man is help in his comfort, his paradise terrestre and his disport. So buxom and so virtuous is she, they must a need as live in unity. One flesh they be, and one blood, as ye guess, with but one heart in weal and in distress. 
A wif, ah, St. Mary Bendixite, her make the man have any adversity that hath a wif? Certus, I cannot say, the bliss, the witch that is betwixt them twa, there may no tongue it tell, or hard to think. If he be poor, she helpeth him to shrink, she keeps his good, and resteth never a deal, ah, that her husband list, he liketh well. She saith not to one's nay, when he saith yea. Do this, saith he. Already, sir, saith she, O blissful order, wedlock precious, thou art so merry, and eke so virtuous, and so commanded and approved eke, that every man that holds him worth a leg, upon his bare knees looked all his leaf, to thank his God that him hath sent a weef. Or else pray to God him for to send a weef, to last unto his life is end, for then his leaf is set in sickerness, he may not be deserved as he guess. So that he work after his wife is red, then may he boldly bear up his head. They be so true, and therewithal so is, for which, if thou wilt work in as the wees, do always so as women will thee red. Lo, how that Jacob, as this clerk is red, be good counsel of his mother Rebecca, bound with the kid's skin about his neck, for which his father's benison he won. Lo, Judith, as the story teller can, by good counsel she god people kept, and slew him, Holofernes, while he slept. Lo, Abigail, by good counsel, how she served her husband Nabal, when that he should have been slain. And lo, Esther also, by counsel good delivered out of woe, the people of God and made him Mardok, a rassure enhanced for to be. There is nothing in grey superlative, as saith Senec, above a humble reef. Suffer the reef as strong as Cato bid. She shall command, and thou shalt suffer it. And yet she will obey of courtesy. A reef is caper of than husbandry. Well, may the sicker man be well and rape. There is, there is no reef the host to keep. I warn of thee, if wisely thou wilt wish. Love well thy wief, as Christ loveth his church. Thou lovest thyself, if thou lovest thy wife. No man hateth his flesh, but in his life he fostereth it, and therefore bid thee they. Cherish thy wief, or thou shalt never they. Husband and wief, what so men jerp a play, of worldly folk hold the sicker way, and jeer, they be so knit, there may no harm be tied. An amely, upon the wafer's side, for which this January, of whom he told, considered hath within his days old, the lusty leaf, the virtuous great, that is in marriage honey sweet, and for his friends upon a day he sent, to tell them the effect of his intent. With fast a sad his tale he hath them told. He said, uh, Friends, I am hoar and old, and almost, God would, on my pity's prink, upon my soul somewhat must he think, I have my body foolishly dispended. Blessed be God that it shall be amended, for he will be certain a wedded man, and that a nun in all the hast he can, and to some mad and fair and tender rage, I pray you, Shep, for my marriage. All suddenly, for he will not abide, and he will fond to his spay on me, said, to whom he may be wedded hastily. But for as much as ye be more than, ye shall rather such a thing espy than I, and where me best were to ally. But one thing he warn you, my friend is dear, I will none old reef have in no manner. She shall not pass a sixteen year certain, all the fish and young of flesh would ye have fain. Better, quoth he, a pike than a pickerel, and better than old beef is tender veal. He will know women thirty year of age, it is but bane straw and cred for age, and eke these all the widows good it would. They grown of so much craft on where is boat, so much broke a harm when they when that them lest, that with them should he never live in rest, for sundry schoolers make a suit of clerks, women of many schoolers half a clerk is. But certainly, a young thing men may guy, reeked as men may warm wax with hand as ply, 
Before I say you plainly in a close, you will no no do if have great for this cause. For if so, he had such mischance, that he and her could have no pleasance. Then should he laid me life in avu tree, and go straight to the devil when I die. Nor children should he none upon her get then, yet were me lover, hundes had me eaten. Then that me heritage should fall in stranger hands, and this he tell you all. I doubt do not ignore the cause away, men should wed, and father work no ye, there speaketh many a man of marriage, that knows no more of it than doth my page, for what causes a man should take a weef, if he ne may not live chest his leaf, take him a weef with great devotion, because of lawful procreation of children, to the honour of God above, and not only for paramour or love, and for they should lecherly eschew and yield their debt when that it is due, or for that each of them should help the other in mischief as a sister shall the brother, and live in chastity for holily, but Sarah's by your leave that am not ye, for God be thanked, I dare make a vaunt, I feel my limb is stark and sufficient, to do all that a man belongeth to, he wot myself best what he may do. Though I be hoar, I fair his doth a tree, the blossoms air, the fruit do waxen be. The blossomy tree is neither dry nor dead, I feel me now, here hoar put on my head. Min heart and all my limbs are as crane, as lower hoar through the air is for to sing. And since that ye have heard on mine intent, I pray you to me well, ye will descent. Diverse men diversely him told, of marriage many examples old. Some blamed it, some praised it, certain, but at the hast, shortly for to say, as all day falleth at altercation, betwixt friends in disputation, there fell a strife betwixt his brethren two, of which that one was called Placebo, just in a soothly cold was the other. Placebo said, O oh, January brother, for little need have ye, my lord, so dear, counsel to ask of any that is here. But that ye be so full of sapience, that you not liketh for your high prudence, to wave from the word of Solomon. This word said he unto us every one, where call a thing by counsel, thus said he, and then I shall thou not repent of thee. But though that Solomon spake such a word, mine own a dear brother and my lord, so wisely God me soul bring at rest, I hold your own counsel is the best. For, brother mine, take of me this motive, I have now been a court man all my leaf, and God it would, though I unworthy be, I have standen in for great degree, a brutal lords of full high estate, yet had I never with none of them debate, I never them contrary truly, I know well that my lord can more than he, but that he saith he hold it firm and stable, he say the same, or else a thing semblable, a full great fool is any counsellor that serveth any lord of hay on earth, that dare presume, or one is thinking it, that his counsel should pass his lord's wit. Nay, lord, as be no fools by my fay, ye have yourself should here to-day, so hasten us, so holily and well, that ye consent and confirm every day. Your word is all, and your opinion, by God, there is no man in all this tune, nor in Italy could better have he said. Christ holds him of this counsel well appaid, and truly it is a high courage of any man that stop in his an age to take a younger wife be my father's kin, your hat hangeth on a jolly pen. Do now in this matter rate as you lest, for finally I hold it for the best. Justinus, that I still sat and heard, right in this ways to Placebo answered, Now, brother mine, be patient, I pray, since ye have said and hearken what ye say. Senec, among his other words, ways, saith that a man oct him right well advise, to whom he gives his hand or his chattel, and since ye ought to advise me right well, to whom he give me good away from me, well more ye ought to advise me, pardy. To whom he give me body for alway, he warn you well it is no child's play. To take a wife without advisement, men must inquire, this is mine assent. 
whether she be wise or sober or drunkaloo, or prude or any other ways a shrew, a chidester or a wester of thy good, or rich or poor or else a man as wood. I bet so that no man find shall, none in this world that trotteth whole and all, no man nor best such as men can devise, but natheless it ought enough suffice with any wife, if so were that she had, more good of thoughts than her vice is bad. And all this asketh leisure to inquire, for God it wot ye have wept many a tear, for privily since ye have had a wife. Praise who so will a wedded man is leaf, certes, he find in it but cost and care, and observances of our blesses bear. And yet God wot my neighbour the boot, and namely of women many a hoot, say that he have the most steadfast wife, and eke the makest one that bear his leaf. But it no best where ringeth me my shoe, ye may for me recht as you like do, advise you, ye be a man of age, how that ye enter into marriage, and namely with a younger wife and a fair, by him that made water, fair, earth, air, the youngest man that is in all this root, is busy enough to bring in it a boot, to have his wife alone, trust to me, ye shall not place her fully year his tray, this is to say, to do her for plaisance, a wife asketh full many an observance, I pray you that ye be not evil appaid. Well, quoth this January, and hast thou said, straw for thy cynic and for thy proverbs, I count not a penny full of herbs, of school towns, we are men than thou, as thou hast heard, assented here right now, to my purpose. Placebo, what say ye? I say it is a cursed man, quoth he, that letteth matrimony secretly. And with that word they raise up suddenly, and be assented fully, that he should be wedded when him list, and where he would. He fantasy and curious business from day to day and in the sole impress of January about his marriage. Many a fair shape and many a fair visage that passed through his heart night by night, and who so took a mare polished bread and set it in a common market place, then should he say many a figure pace by his mare, and in the same ways gone January in his thought devise of maidens which that dwelt him beside. He wist not where that he might abide, for if that one had beauty in her face, another stood so in the papal's grace, for her sadness and her benignity, that of the papal quite as voice had she. And some are rich, and had a bad a name, but natheless betwixt earnest and game, he at the last appointed him on one, and at all others from his heart to gone, and chose her of his own authority, for love is blind all day, and may not say. And when that he was into belly brought, he portrayed in his heart and in his thought her fresh beauty and her age tender, her middle small, her arm is long and slender, her wee's governance, her gentleness, her womanly bearing, and her sadness. And when that he on her was condescended, he thought his choice might not be amended. For when that he himself concluded had, he thought each other manners which so bad, that impossible it were to reply. Against his choice, this was his fantasy. His friend is sent he to, and at his instance, and prayed them to do him that pleasance, that hastily they would unto him come. He would abridge their labour all in some, needed no more for them to go nor read. Placebo came, and ache his friend as soon, and at the first he bade them all a boon, that none of them no arguments would make against the purpose that he had to take, which purpose was pleasant to God, said he, and very grand of his prosperity. He said there was a maiden in the tune, which that of Beauty had great renown. All where it so she were of small degree, so faced him her youth and her beauty, which made, he said, he would have to his wife, to lead in ease and holiness his leaf and thanked God that he might have her all, that no wit with his bliss apart a shall, and prayed them to labour in this need, and sharp that he fell not to spade. For then, he said, his spirit was at ease. Then is, quoth he, nothing may made displays. 
So if one thing pricketh in my conscience, the which you will rehearse in your presence. I have, quoth he, heard said for your ago, there may no man have perfect blisses to this is to say, on earth an ache in heaven, for though he keep him from the sin of seven, an ache from every branch of silky tree, yet is there so perfect felicity, and so great ease and lust and marriage, that ever I am aghast, now in my knowledge, that he shall head now so marry a leaf, so delicate, without a war's grief, that he shall have me in heaven on earth here, for since that very heaven is brought so dear, the tribulation and great penance, how should you then, living in such pleasance, as all our wedded men do with their weaves, come to the bliss where Christ eternal on leave is? This is me dread, and ye, my brethren twe, as well me this question e you pray. Justinus, which that hated this folly, answered anon right in his japery, and for he would his long metal abridge, he would no authority allege. But said, Sir, so there be none obstacle ordered in this, God of his hay miracle, and of his mercy, may so far he watch, that ere ye have your rites of holy church, ye may repent of wedded man as leaf, in which ye say there is no woe nor strief, and erst God forbid, but if he sent a wedded man his grace him to repent, well often rather than a single man, and therefore, Sir, the best of ready can, despair you not, but have in your memory, peradventure, she may be your purgatory. She may be God's means and God's whip, and then your soul shall up to heaven skip, swifter than doth an arrow from a bow. I hope to God hereafter ye shall know that there is none so great felicity and marriage, nor ever more shall be, that you shall let of your salvation so that ye use, as skill is and reason, the lustres of your reef a temperly, and that ye please her not to amorously, and that ye keep your ache from other sin. Me tell is done, for me wit is but thin. Be not aghast hereof, my brother dear, but let us wade in out of this, my dear. The reef of bath, if ye have understood, of marriage, which ye have now in hand, declared hath full well in little space, Fare ye now well, God have you in his grace. And with this word, this Justin and his brother have taken their leave, and each of them of other. And when they saw that it must need as be, they rocked so by slate and ways treaty, that she, this maiden, which that may as hate, as hastily as ever that she met, shall wed it be until this January. Me trow it were too long you to tarry. If he told you of every script and bond by which she was forfeit his hand, or for to reckon of her rich array, but finally common is the day, that to the church of both be they went, for to receive the holy sacrament. Forth came the priest, with stole about his neck, and bade her be like Sarah and Rebecca, in wisdom and in truth of marriage, and said his orisons, as his usage, and crouched them, and prayed God should them bless, and made all sicker enough with holiness. Thus be they wedded with solemnity, and at the feast sat both he and she, with other worthy folk upon the dais, all full of joy, and bliss is the palace, and full of instruments, and of vitae, the most daintiest of all Italy. Before them stood such instruments of soon, that Orpheus, nor of Thebes, Amphion, they made never such a melody, and every course came in loud minstrelsy, that never Job trumpet for to hear, nor he, Theodamus, yet half so clear, at Thebes, when the city was in doubt, Bacchus the wind them skinked all about, and Venus laughed upon every weight, for January was become her knicked, and would a both assay his courage in liberty, and eke in marriage. And with her fair brand in her hand a boot, danced before the braid and all the root. And certainly, I dare richt well say this, Hymenius, that god of wedding is, so never his leaf so merry a wedded man. Hold thou thy peace, thou poet Marcian, that writest us that ilk wedding merry of her philology and her mercury. 
and of the song is that amuses so, too small is both thy pen and ache thy tongue, for to describe of this marriage, when tender youth hath wedded stooping age. There is such mirth that it may not be writ, as say it yourself, then may ye wit. If that ye lie or know in this matter, may us that sat with so benign a chair, here to behold it seemed fairy, Queen Esther never looked with such an eye on a sir, so make a look had she. He may you not devise all her beauty, but thus much of her beauty tell he may, that she was like the bricked morrow of May, fulfilled of all beauty and pleasance. This January is ravished in a trance, and every time he looked in her face, between his heart he gan her to menace. But he that naked in armies would her strain, harder than ever Paris did Helene, but natheless yet had he great pity, that thilke naked offend her must he, and thought, alas, O tender creature, now would God ye make to well endure, all my courage, it is so sharp and keen, I am aghast, ye shall it not sustain. But God forbid that ye did all my make. Now would God that it were waxen nicked, and that the nicked would last in ever more. I would that all this paper were he go, and finally he did all his labour, as he best make, save in his honour, to hasten them from the mate in subtle ways. The time came that reason was to raise, and after that men dance and drink a fast, and spaces all about the house they cast, and full of joy and bliss is every man. All but a squire, that haked Damian, who carved before the knicked full many a day, he was so ravished on this lady May, that for the very pain he was naked, almost he swelt and swooned where he stood, so sore had Venus hurt him with her brand, as that she bare her dancing in her hand, and to his bed he went him hastily, no more of him, as at this time speak he, but there he let him weep and often plain till fresh a may will rue upon his pain, O perilous fair that in the bedstraw breedeth, O foe familiar that his serveth bedeth, O servant traitor, O false, O homely hue, like to the otter and bosom shy and true, God shield us all from your acquaintance. End of section 16《セクション・ナンバー・セブンティーン・オブ・ザ・キャンタベリー・タイルズ・アンド・アザ・ポエムズ・ディス・イズ・ア・リバーボックス・レコーディング・アル・リバーボックス・レコーディングズ・アル・イン・ザ・パブリック・ドメイン・フォー・モー・インフォーメーション・オーティ・ヴォランティア・プリーズ・ヴィジット・リバーボックス・ドット・オーグ・レッド・バイ・ヴィクトリア・クイント・ザ・キャンタベリー・タイルズ・バイ・ジェフリー・チャーサー・ザ・マーチェンス・タイル・パート・ツー・オー・ジャンウェアリー・トランケン・イン・プレゼンス・オブ・マリアージ・シー・ハウ・ダイ・デミアン・Thine own square and thy borchen man intendeth for to do thee villainy. Good grant to thee thine home he for to spy. For in this world is no worse pestilence than homely foe all day in thy presence. Performed hath the soon his arc de yearn. No longer may the body of him sojourn on the horizon in that latitude. Nicked with his mantle that is dark and rude, gone overspread the hemisphere about, for which departed is this lusty root. From January, with thank on every seed, home to their houses lustily they read, whereas they do their things as them lest, and when they see their time, they go to rest. Soon after that, this hasty January will go to bed, he will no longer tarry. He drank a hippocras, a clara, and vernage, of spaces hot to increase his courage. And many a lectuary had he full fain, such as the cursed monk, Don Constantine, hath written in his book, De Quatu, to eat the more he would nothing eschew. And to his privy friend, was thus said he, for God is love, as soon as it may be, let void and all this house in courteous ways. And they have done right as he will devise, men drinking and the travers draw none, the bread is brought to bed as still a stone, and when the bed was with the priest he blessed, 
out of the chamber every week him dressed. In January hath fast in arms he taken, his fresh amay, his paradise he make. He lulled her, he kissed her full oft, with thicker bristles of his beard unsoft, like to the skin of hundfish sharp as brer. For he was shaven all new in his men air. He robed her upon her tender face, and said of us, Alas, I must trespass to you, my spouse, and you greatly offend, ere team come that he will down descend. But natheless consider this, quoth he, There is no workman whatsoe'er he be, that may both work a well and hastily. This will be done at leisure perfectly. It is no force how long that we play, in true wedlock coupled be we twae. And blessed be the yoke that we be in, and in our acts may there be no sin. A man may do no sinner with his wife, nor hurt himself with his own knife, for we have lived to play us be the law. Thus laboured he till that the day gan door, and then he took a soap in fine clara, and upright in his bed then sat he, and after that he sang full loud and clear, and kissed his wife, and made a wanton cheer. He was all coltish, full of raggery, and full of jargon as a flecked pea, the slackest skin about his neck shacked, while that he sang, so chanted he and cracked. But good wot would that may thought in her heart, when she him saw upsetting in his shirt, in his neat cap, with his neck elaine. She praised not his playing worth a beam. Then said he thus, My rest will he take. Now days come, he may no longer wake, and down he laid his head and slept till prim, and afterward, when that he saw his team, up rose January, but fresh of May held her chamber till the fourth day, as usages of weavers for the best, for every labour sometime must have rest, or else long he may not endure, this is to say, no leaf of creature, be it of fish or bird or beast or man, now will he speak of woeful Damian, that languisheth for love as ye shall hear. Therefore I spake to him in this manner. He say, O oh, silly Damian, alas, answer to this demand as in this case. How shalt thou to thy lady fresh me tell her thy woe? She will always say nay. Ek if thou speak, she will thy woe be free. Good be thine help, he can no better say. The sick a Damien and Venus fair, so burned that he dared for desire, for which he put his life in the aventure, no longer mecked he in this ways endure, but privily a penner gone he borrow, and in a letter wrote he all his sorrow, in manner of a complaint or halay, unto his fairer, fresher Lady May. And in a purse of silk hung on his shirt, he hath it put and laid it at his heart, the moon that at noon was thilk a day, the January had waded fresh a May, and ten of terror was into cancer gladed, so long had Mayus in her chamber abaded, as custom is unto this noble's all. A breed shall not eaten in the bar till days four or three days at the last, a passed be, then let her go to fest. The fourth a day complete from noon to noon, when that the heich a mass was he done. In hall sat as January and May, as fresh as is the bright of summer's day, and so befell how that this good man remembered him upon this Damien, and said, Saint Mary, how may this be, that Damien attendeth not to me? Is he aye sick, or how may this be tied? His squares, which that stood there beside, excused him because of his sickness, which letted him to do his business. No other cause make the make him tarry. That me forthinketh, quoth this January. He is a gentle square, by me truth, an easiness, if that he did, it were great harm in ruth. He is as wise, as discreet, and sacre, as any man he know of his degree. And they are too manly and eke serviceable, and for to be a thrifty man, great able. But after meat, as soon as ever he may, I will myself visit him, and ache me, to do him all the comfort that he can. 
and for that word him blessed every man, good of his bounty and his gentleness, a word so comforting and second as his queer, for it was a gentle deed. Tim, quoth this January, take good heed, at after met ye with your women all, when that ye be in chamber out of the soul, that all ye go to say this Damien, to him disport, he is a gentleman, and tell him that ye will him visit, have ye nothing but rested me a lead? And spare you fast, for he will abide me a little, to that ye sleep a fest by my side. And with that word he gan unto him call a square that was marshal of his hall, and told him certain things that he would. This fresh may hath straight her way hold, with all her women unto Damien. Doon by his bed aside sat she then, comforting him as godly as she may. This Damien, when at his team he say, in secret wees his purse and eke his bill, in which that he writ and had his will, hath put into her hand without a more, save that he say the wondrous deep and sore, and softly to her heart thus said he, Mercy, and that ye not discover me, for I am dead, if that this thing be kid. The purse hath she in her bosom hid, and went her way, ye get no more of me, but unto January he come she, that on his bed a seed sat full soft, he took her, and he kissed her full oft, and laid him down to sleep, and that alone. She fain at her, as that she must scone, there as ye know, that every wicked must need, and when she of this bell had taken heed, she rented all to clutes at the last, and in the privy soft her air cast. Who studieth now but fair of fresh of me? A down by old January she lay, that slept her till the cough had him awaked. Anon he prayed her strip her all a naked, he would of her, he said, have some pleasance, and said her clothes did him encumbrance. And she obeyed him, be her leaf or loth, but lest that precious folk be with me horse, how that he wrought he dared not to you tell, or whether she thought it paradise or hell. But there he let them working in their ways, till even song ring, and they must arise, whether it be destiny or aventure, whether it be influence or by nature, or constellation that in such a state the heaven stood at that time fortunate, as for to put a bill of Venus works, for all a thing hath team as say these clerks, to any woman for to get her love, he cannot say, but great a good above, that knoweth that none act is causeless, Hey, dame of all, for you will hold me peace. But sooth is this, how that this fresh man hath taken such impression that day, with pity on the sick of Damien, that from her heart she not drief can the remembrance for to do him is. Certain, thought she, whom that this thing displease his desire, I reckon not, for here I he am sure, to love him best of any creature, though he no more had it than his shirt. Lo, pity honeth soon and gentle heart, here may ye see how excellent franchise in women is when they them necho and vise. Some tyrant is, as there be many own, that hath a heart as hard as any stone, which would have let him stare in the place, well rather than have granted him her grace, and then rejoicing in her cruel pride, and reckon not to be a homicide, this gentle may, fulfilled of pity, Ricked of her hand the letter marked she, in which she granted him her very grass. There lacked naught, but only day and place, where that she marked unto his lust suffice. For it shall be ricked as he will devise. And when she saw her team upon the day, to visit this Damien went this May, and subtly this letter down she thrust under his pillow, ready to him lust. She took him by the hand and heard him twist, so secretly that no ricked of a twist, and bade him be all whole, and forth she went to January, when he for her sent. Up was Damien the next to all passed was his sickness and his sorrow. He combed him, he proined, he did all that unto his lady liked, and eke to January he went as low as ever did a dog for the bow. I is so pleasant unto every man, for craft is all who so the do it can. Every week does fan to speak him good, and firmly in his lady's grace he stood. Thus leave Damien about his need, and in my tale forth he will proceed. 
some clerk holds it that Felicity stands in delay, and therefore certain he this noble January with all his mate in honest ways as long as to his neat show for him to live for deliciously his hosing his array as honestly to his degree was macked as a king's among his order of his honest things he had a garden wallowed all with stone so fair a garden would he nowhere none for out of doubt I verily suppose that he that wrought the romance of the rose could not have it the beauty well devise, nor Priapus mixed not well suffice, though he be god of gardens for to tell the beauty of the garden and the well that stood under a laurel or his grain. Full often time he, Pluto, and his queen, Proserpina, and all the fairy, disported them and made a melody about that well and danced as men told this noble knight this january old such dainty had in it to walk and play pleasure that he would suffer no wicked to bear the key save he himself for of the small wicked he bare always of silver clicket with which one that him list he had unshit and when that he would pay his way for debt in summer season thither would he go and may his wife and no wicked but they two and things which that were not done in bed, he in the garden then performed and sped. And in this way as many a merry day lived as January and fresh a May. But worldly joy may not always endure to January, nor to no creature. O oh, sudden hap, O oh, thou fortune unstable, like to the scorpion so deceivable, that shalt rest with thy head when thou wilt sting, Thy tale is death, though thine even running. O brittle joy, O sweet, a poison quaint, O monster that so subtly canst paint Thy gift is under hue of steadfastness, That thou deceivest both, a more and less. Why hast thou January thus deceived, That hadst him for thy full friend received? And now thou hast bereft him both his eyne, For sorrow of which deserveth he to deign. Alas! This noble January fray, amid his lust and his prosperity, as waxing blind, and that all suddenly, he wapid and he wailed piteously, and there with all the fear of jealousy, lest that his wife should fall in some folly, so burnt his heart that he would fain, that some man of both him and her had slain, for neither after his death nor in his leaf, ne would he that she were no love nor wife, but ever live as we to in Claude's black, soul as a turtle that hath lost her neck. But at the last, after a month or twee, his sorrow gan a soyge, sooth to say, for when he wist it maked no other bay, he personally took his adversity, so would have doot he may not forgon, that he was jealous ever more than one, which jealousy was so outrageous that neither in hall nor in non other house nor in none other place never the more he would suffer her to read or go but if that he had hand on her alway for which full often wept a fresh may that love her damien so burningly that she must rather die in suddenly or else she must have him as her last she waited when her heart would breast Upon that other seed, Damien, becoming as the sorrow fullest man that ever was, for neither naked nor day he made to speak a word to fresh a may, as to his purpose of no such matter, but if the January must at her, that had a hand upon her eye for more, but natheless be rating to and fro, and privy seen as wist he what she meant, and she no echo the fain of his intent. O January, what maked it thee well, though thou maked see as far as she sell, for as good as it blind deceived to be, as be deceived when a man may say, Lo, Argus, which that had a hundred iron, for all that ever he could pour or cry in, yet he was blent, and God wot so be more, that we in a wisely that it not be so, pass over as an eyes I see no more, this fresh of me, of which he spake a yor, in warm wax hath imprinted the clicket the january bear of the small wicket of the key by which into his garden oft he went and damien that knew her all intent the clicket counterfeited privily 
there is no more to say but has to lay. Some wonder by this cricket shall be tied, but ye shall hear him if ye will abide. O noble Arvid, soth sayest thou, good wot, what slaked it is, if love be long and hot, that he'll not find it out in some men air. By pyramus and this be my men there, though they were kept full long and straight or hall, they be a courted rowney through a wall, where no wicked could have found out such a slaked. But now to purpose, ere the day is ached, we're past it of the month of July, fill that January caught so great a wheel, through egging of his reef for him to play in his garden, and no wicked but they twa. But in a morning to this May said he, Rise up, me reef, me love, me lady fray, the turtle's voice is heard, mine own sweet, the winter's gone with all his rain as wit, come forth now with thine ain columbine. Well, fairer be thy breast than any wain. The garden is enclosed all about. Come forth, me wait a spouse, for out of doubt thou hast me wounded in mine heart, O weef. No spot in thee was e'er in all thy leaf. Come forth, and let us take in our disport. I choose thee for my weef and my comfort. Such old lured words used he, on Damien a sane made she, that he should go before with his clicket. This Damien then hath opened the wicket, and in his start, and that in such manner, that no wicked might him either see or hear, and still he sat under a bush, unknown this January, as blind as is a stone, with mice in his hand, and no right more, into this fresher garden as he go, and clapped to the wicket suddenly. Now weef, quoth he, here's but thou and he, thou art the creature that he best love. For by that Lord that sits in heaven above, lever he had to dine on a kniff than the offend dear a true weef. For God's sake, I think how I did cheese, not for no covetous daughterless, but only for the love he had to thee. And though that he be old and may not say, bid me true, and he will tell you we. Certes, three things shall you win thereby. First, love of Christ, and to yourself honour. And all mine heritage, tune and tower, ye give it you, make charters as you list, there shall be done to morrow ere soon rest. So easily God me soul bring to bliss, ye pray you on this covenant me kiss. And though that ye be jealous, wait me not, ye be so deep imprinted in me thought, that when ye consider your purity and therewithal with all, the unlikely eld of me, ye may not, certes, though I should a day, Forbear to be out of your company, for very love. This is without a doubt. Now kiss me, weef, and let us roam about. This fresh me, when she this word is heard, benignly to January answered. But first and forward she began to weep. We have, quoth she, the soul for to keep, as well as ye, and also mine honour, and of my weefwood silk a tender floor, which that ye have assured in your hand. When that the priest to you my body bond, wherefore you will answer in this manner, with leave of you, mine own lord so dear, I pray to God that never dawn the day, the day in no staff as foul as women may. Fair I do unto my kin that shame, or else I impair so my name that I be false, and if I do that lack, do strip me and put me in a sack, and in the next river do me trench. I am a gentlewoman and no wench. Why speak ye thus? But men be erch and true, and women have reproof of you I knew. Ye know none other dalliance ye believe, but speak to us of untrust and reprieve. And with that word she saw where Damien sat in the bush, and cough she began, and with her finger sing she made, that Damien should claim a portray, the charge it was with fruit, and up he went, for verily he knew all her intent, and every saying that she could make better than January, her own maker. For in a letter she had told him all of this matter, how that he work a shall, and thus to leave him sitting in the perry. And January, a May, roaming full merry. Bright was the day, and blew the firmament, Phoebus of gold his streamers down had sent, to gladden every flower with his warmness. He was that time in Gemini, as he guess. But little from his declination of cancer chose exaltation, and so befell in that bright morning tide that in the garden on the farther side Pluto, that is the king of fairy, 
and many a lady in his company, following his wife, the Queen Proserpina, which that he ravished out of Ethna, or that she gathered flowers in the maid. And Claudia and you make the story read how in his grisly chariot he her fed. This king of Ferry adorn him set upon a bank of turfers fresh and green, and erect anon said he to his queen, My wif, quoth he, there may no wicked ne- say nay, experience so proves it every day, the treason which that woman doth to man, to an hundred thousand stories tell he can, notable of your own truth and prettiness, O Solomon, richest of all riches, fulfilled of serpents and worldly glory, for worthy be thy words of memory to every wit that wit and praise and can, thus praise to yet the bounty of man. Among a thousand men yet found he one, but of all women found he never none, thus said the king, that knew your wickedness. And Jesus, fairly as serhak as he guess, he spak of you but seldom reverence, a wild fear and corrupt pestilence, so full upon your bodies yet to nay. Ne say not this honour a book nicked, because alas that he is blind and old, his own man shall make him cuckold. Lo, where he sits, the lecher in the tray, now will he grant him of my majesty, unto this old a blind a worthy knick, that he shall have again his own seat, and that his way will do him villainy, then shall be known all her highly tree, both in reproof of her and other men. Yea, sir, quoth Proserpina, and will ye so? Now by my mother, sir, he solely swear that ye shall give her sufficient answer, and all a woman after for her sake, that though they be in any guilty taker, with fast abode they shall themselves excuse, and bear them down that would of them accuse. For lack of answer, none of them shall deign, all had ye seen a thing with both your eyes. Yet shall we visit it so hardily, and weep and swear and chide so totally, that ye shall be as lewd as be a geese. What recketh me of your authorities? I wot well that this Jew, the Solomon, found of us women fool as many one. But though that he found a no good woman, yet there hath found many another man, women full good and true and virtuous, witness on them that dwelt in Christ's house, with murder them they proved their constance. The Roman jests make remembrance of many a very true we also. But, sir, be not wroth, albeit so, though that he said he found no good woman, I pray you take the sentence of the man. He meant thus that in sarf and bounty is none but good, no, neither he nor she. He, for the very good that is but one, we make you so much of Solomon. What, though he made a temple, God is hus, what, though he were rich and glorious, so made he a temple of false gods. How make he do a thing that more for Buddha is? Pardy, as fair as ye his name and plaster, he was a lecher and an idolaster. And in his eld he very good forsook. And if that god had not, as saith the book, spared him for his father's sake, he should have lost his reign rather than he would. He set in not all of the villainy that he of women hurt, a butterfly, I am a woman, neither as must he speak, or else swell and tune me in heart a break. For since he said that we be jangle asses, as ever he me proke or hold me tresses, I shall no spare for no courtesy, to speak him harm, that so does villainy. Dame, quoth this Pluto, be no longer wroth, he give it up, but since he swore me an oath, that he would grant to him his sake again, may well trust stand that warn you certain, I am a king, it sets me not to lie. And I, quoth she, am queen of Ferry, her answer she shall have, e undertake. Let us no more words of it may, forsooth, he will no longer you contrary. Now let us turn again to January, that in the garden with his fair may, singeth well merrier than the poppy jay. You love you best, and shall another none, so long about the alleys as he gone till he was come to that ill capere, whereas this Damien sat full merry, on high, among the fresher levis green. This fresher may, that is so bright and sheen, can for to sigh, and said, Alas, my side! Now, sir, quoth she, for aught that may be tied, he must have of the pears that he see, or he must die so sore along with me, to eaten of the smaller pears green, 
Help for her love that is of heaven queen. I tell you well, a woman in my plate may have to foot so great an appetite that she may dine, but she of it have. Alas, quoth he, that he had here a knave that could climb. Alas, alas, quoth he, for I am blind. Yea, sir, no force, quoth she, but what he vouchersaith for God's sake, the pair he in your arms for to take, for well he wot that ye must trust in me, then would he climb a well enough, quoth she, so we me foot might set upon your back. Say artus, said he, therein shall be no lap, make to help you with mine heart is blood. He stooped down, and on his back she stood, and caught her by a twist, and up she goth. Ladies, I pray you that ye not be wroth, he cannot gloss, I am a rude man. And suddenly an old Miss Damien can pullin' up the smoke, and in he throng. And when that Pluto saw this crater wrong, to January he gave again his seat, and made him see as well as ever he met. And when he thus had caught his seat again, was never man of anything so fain, but on his wife his thought was ever more. Up to the tree he cast his eye into and saw how Damien his wife had dressed in such manner it may not be expressed. But if he were to speak on courtesy, and up he gave a roaring and a cry, as doth the mother when the child shall die. Out, help, alas, hero, he gan to cry. O oh, stronger, lady, stora, what dost thou? And she answered, Sir, what aileth you? Have passions and reason in your minds. I have you helped on both your ain blind. On peril of my soul I shall not lie, as may was taught to help you with your ain. Was nothing better for to make you see than struggle with a man upon a tree. Good would he did it in full good intent. Struggle, quoth he. Yea, or gate it, in it went. God give you both one shame is death to die in. He swivered they, he saw it with mine eyne, and airless be he hanged by the horse. Then is, quoth she, me medicine all false, for certainly, if that ye make to see, ye would not say these words unto me, ye have some glimpsing and no perfect sight. I see, quoth he, as well as ever he make, think and be good, with both mine eye and woe, and by my faith me thought he did thee so. Ye maze, ye maze, good sir, quoth she. This thing have ye, for ye have made you see, alas, quoth she, that ere ye was so gained. Now, dame, quoth he, let all pass out of mind. Come down, my life, and if I have missaid, God help me so as I am evil appeared. But, by my father's soul, I wind have seen how that this Damien had by the lane, and that thy smoke had lain upon his press. Yes, yeah, sir, quoth she, ye may win as ye list, but, sir, a man that wakes out of his sleep, please, he may not suddenly well take keep upon a thing, nor see it perfectly, till that he be adored verily. Read so a man that long hath blind thee be, he may not so suddenly so well he see. First when his sect is new come again, as he that hath a day or two is in. Till that your seat established be a whale, there may full many a sect to you beguile. Beware, I pray you, for by heaven's king, full many a man waineth to see a thing, and is as another than it seemeth, he which that misconceiveth of misdemeaneth. And with that word she leapt down from the tree. This January, who was glad but he, he kissed her and clipped her full oft, embraced and on her womb he stroked her full soft, and to his palace home he hath her led. Now, good amen, I pray you to be glad. Thus endeth here my tale of January. God bless us and his mother, Saint Mary. End of section number 17. Section 18 of The Canterbury Tales and Other Poems. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Joanna Michael Hoyt. The Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer. The Squire's Tale. The Prologue. Hey, God is mercy, said our host, though. Now such a wife, I pray God keep me fro. Lo, such slights and subtilities in women be. For I, as busy as bees, are they us silly men for to deceive. 
and from the sooth a will they ever weave, as this merchant's tale it proveth well. But, nevertheless, as true as any steel, I have a wife, though that she poor be, but of her tongue a labbing shrew is she, and yet she hath a heap of vices more. Thereof no force, let all such things go. But wit ye what? In counsel be it said, me rueth sore I am unto her tired. For an I should reckon every vice which that she hath, he wiss I were too nice. And cause why it should reported be and told her by some of this company. By whom it needeth not for to declare, since women con and utter such a fair. And eke my wit sufficeth not thereto to tell an all, wherefore my tale is due. Squire, come near, if it your will be, and say somewhat of love, for certes ye con thereon as much as any man. Nay, sir, quoth he, but such thing as I can with hearty will, for I will not rebel against your lust. A tale will I tell. Have me excused if I speak amiss. My will is good, and lo, my tale is this. The Tale Pars Prima At Sara, in the land of Tartary, there dwelt a king that wore aid Russi, through which there died many a doughty man. This noble king was called Cambuscan, which in his time was of so great renown that there was nowhere in no region so excellent a lord in all the thing. Him lacked not that longeth to a king, as of the sect of which that he was born. He kept his law to which he was he sworn, and thereto he was hardy, wise, and rich, and piteous, and just, always he lick, true of his word, benign and honourable, of his courage as any centre stable, young, fresh, and strong, in arms desirous as any bachelor of all his house. A fair person he was, and fortunate, and kept always so well his royal estate that there was nowhere such another man. This noble king, this Tartar Cambuscan, had two sons by Elfeta his wife, of which the eldest had Algarseth. The other was he called Cambalo. A daughter had this worthy king also, that youngest was, and had Canesi. But for to tell you all her beauty, it lies not in my tongue nor my conning. I dare not undertake so high a thing. Mine English eek is insufficient. It must be a retter excellent that Kuthis colors longing for that art, if you should her describe in any part. I am none such, I must speak as I can. And so befell, that when this Cambuscan had twenty winters borne his diadem, as he was wont from year to year, I deem, he let the feast of his nativity do cry throughout Sara his city, the last Idus of March after the year. Phoebus the sun full jolly was and clear, for he was nigh his exaltation in Marta's face, and in his mansion in Ares the choleric hot sign. Full lusty was the weather and benign, for which the fowls against the sun sheen, what for the season and the young green full loud sang their affections. Them seemed to have got protections against the sword of winter keen and cold. This Cambuscan, of which I have you told, in royal vesture sat upon his dais with diadem, full high in his palace, and held his feast so solemn and so rich, that in this world was there none it lick, of which if I should tell all the array, then would it occupy a summer's day, and eke it needeth not for to devise at every course the order of service. I will not tell them of their strange sows, nor of their swans, nor their heron sows. Eke in that land, as tell nights old, there is some meat that is full dainty hold that in this land men reck of it full small. But there is no man that may report in all. I will not tarry you, for it is prime, and for it is no fruit but loss of time. Unto my purpose I will have recourse. And so befell that, after the third course, while that this king sat thus in his noble, hearing his minstrels their thing is play before him at his board deliciously, in at the hall a door all suddenly there came a knight upon a steed of brass, and in his hand a broad mirror of glass. Upon his thumb he had of gold a ring, and by his side a naked sword hanging. And up he rode unto the high board. In all the hall was there not spoke a word for marvel of this knight. Him to behold full busily they waited, young and old. This strange knight that came thus suddenly, all armed, save his head, full richly, saluted king and queen and lord is all, by order as they sat in the hall, with so high reverence and observance, as well in speech as in his countenance, that Gawain with his old courtesy, though he were come again out of fairy, him could not amend with a word. And after this, before the high board, he with a manly voice said his message, after the form used in his language, without vice of syllable or letter, and for his tale should seem the better, accordant to his words was his cheer, 
as teacheth art of speech them that it leer. Albeit that I cannot sound his style, nor cannot climb over so high a style. Yet say I this, as to commune intent, thus much amounteth all that ever he meant. If it so be that I have it in mind, he said, The king of Araby and Ind, my liege lord, on this solemn day, saluteth you as he best can and may, and sendeth you in order of your feast by me, that am already at your hest, this steed of brass, that easily and well can in the space of one day natural, this is to say in four and twenty hours, whereso you list, in drought or else in showers, bear your body into every place to which your heart willeth for to pace, without whem of you through foul or fair. Or if you list to fly as high in air as doth an eagle when him list to soar, this same steed shall bear you evermore without harm, till ye be where you lest, though that ye sleepen on his back or rest. And turn again, with writhing of a pin he that had wrought, he could in many a gin. He waited in any a constellation ere he had done this operation, and knew full many a seal and many a bond. This mirror eke that I have in mine hand has such a might that men may in it see where there shall fall any adversity unto your realm, or to yourself also and openly who is your friend and foe. And over all this, if any lady bright hath set her heart on any manner white, if he be false, she shall his treason see, his new love, and all his subtlety, so openly that there shall nothing hide. Wherefore, against this lusty summer tide, this mirror, and this ring that ye may see, he hath sent to my lady Canacy, your excellent daughter that is here. The virtue of this ring, if ye will hear, is this, that if her list it for to wear upon her thumb, or in her purse it bear, there is no fowl that flieth under heaven that she shall not well understand his steven, and know his meaning openly and plain, and answer him in his language again. And every grass that groweth upon root she shall eke know to whom it will do boot, all be his wounds ne'er so deep and wide. This naked sword that hangeth by my side such virtue hath, that what man that it smite, Throughout his armour it will carve and bite were it as thick as is a branched oak. And what man is ye wounded with the stroke shall ne'er be whole, till that you list, of grace, to stroke him with the flat in thilke place where he is hurt. This is as much to say, ye must with the flat sword again stroke him upon the wound, and it will close. This is the very sooth without glows. It faileth not while it is in your hold. And when this knight had thus his tale told, he rode out of the hall, and down he light, his steed, which that shone as sun bright, stood in the court as still as any stone. The knight is to his chamber led anon, and it is unarmed, and to meet he set. These presents be full richly ye fet. This is to say the sword and the mirror, and borne anon into the high tower, with certain officers ordained therefore. And unto Canacy the ring is bore solemnly, where she sat at the table. But sickerly, without in any fable the horse of brass, that may not be removed, it stood as it were to the ground he glued. There may no man out of the place it drive, for no engine of windlass or polive, and cause why, for they can not the craft. And therefore in the place they have it laughed, till that the knight have taught them the manner to void him, as ye shall after hear. Great was the press that swarmed to and fro to Gowran on this horse that stood so, for it so high was, and so broad and long, so well proportioned for to be strong, right as it were a steed of Lombardy, therewith so hoarsely and so quick of eye, as it a gentle Poilius coarser were. For certes, from his tail unto his ear, nature nor art ne could him not amend, in no degree, as all the people wend. But evermore their most a wonder was how that it could go, and was of brass. It was of fairy, as the people seemed. Diverse folk diversely they deemed, as many heads, as many wit has been. They murmured as doth a swarm of bean, and made skills after their fantasies, rehearsing of the old poetries, and said that it was like the Pegasi, the horse that had wings for to flee, or else it was the Greekus horse Sinon that brought Troy to destruction, as men may in the old jests read. Mine heart, quoth one, is evermore in dread. I trow some men of armors be therein that shape of them this city for to win. It were right good that all such thing were no. Another rounded to his fellow low and said, He lies, for it is rather like an apparence made by some magic as jugglers play in at these feasts great. Of sundry doubts they jangle thus and treat, as lewd people deem commonly of things that be made more subtly than they can in their lewdness comprehend. They deem gladly to the badder end. 
and some of them wondered on the mirror that borne was up into the master tower how men might in it such a things see. Another answered and said it well might be naturally by compositions of angles and of sly reflections, and said that in Rome was such a one. They speak of Alhazen and Vitalon and Aristotle that wrote in their lives of quaint mirrors and of prospectives, as know they that have their books heard. And other folk have wondered on the sword that would pierce throughout everything, and fell in speech of Telephus the king, and of Achilles for his quaint spear, for he could with it both heel and deer, write in such wise as men may with the sword of which right now ye have yourselves heard. They spake of sundry hardening of metal, and spake of medicines therewithal, and how and when it should a hardened be, which is unknown algate unto me. Then spake they of Canacee's ring, and said in all that such a wondrous thing of craft of rings heard they never none, save that he, Moses, and King Solomon, had in a name of conning in such art. Thus said the people, and drew them apart. But natheless, some said that it was wonder to make of fern ashes glass, and yet is glass not like ashes of fern. But for they have ye known it so fern, therefore ceaseth their jangling and their wonder, as sore wonder some on cause of thunder, on ebb and flood, on gossamer and mist, and on all things till that the cause is wist. Lest jangle they, and demon, and devise, till that the king gan from his board arise. Phoebus had left the angle meridional, and yet ascending was the beast royal, the gentle lion with his aldrian, when that this tartar king, this cambuscan, rose from the board, there as he sat full high. Before him went the loud minstrelsy, till he came to his chamber of pyramids. There, as they sounded diverse instruments, that it was like a heaven for to hear, now danced lusty Venus's children dear. For in the fish their lady sat full, and looked on them with a friendly eye. This noble king is set upon his throne. This strange knight is fetched to him full sown, and on the dance he goes with canacy. Here is the revel and the jollity that is not able a dull man to devise. He must have known love and his service, and been a feastly man as fresh as may, that should you devise such a ray. Who could tell you the form of dances so uncouth, and so fresh a countenances, such subtle lookings and dissimulances for dread of jealous men's apperceivings. No man but Launcelot, and he is dead. Therefore I pass o'er all this lusty head. I say no more, but in this jolliness I leave them, till to supper men them dress. The steward bids the spices for to high and eke the wine and all this melody. The ushers and the squires be ye gone, the spices and the wine is come anon. They eat and drink, and when this hath an end, unto the temple, as reason was, they wend. The service done, they sup and all by day. What needeth you rehearse of their array? Each man wot well that at the king is feast is plenty to the most and to the least, and dainties more than be in my knowing. At after supper went this noble king to see the horse of brass, with all a rout of lordes and of ladies him about. Such wondering was there on this horse of brass that, since the great siege of Troy was, there as men wondered on a horse also, ne'er was there such a wondering as was though. But finally the king asked the knight the virtue of this courser and the might, and prayed him to tell his governance. The horse anon began to trip and dance, when that the knight laid hand upon his rein, and said, Sir, there is no more to sin, but when you list to ride in anywhere, ye must trill a pin stamps in his ear, which I shall tell you betwixt us two. Ye must name to him to what place also, or to what country that you list to ride, and when ye come where you list abide, bid him descend and trill another pin, for therein lies the effect of all the gin, and he will down descend and do your will, and in that place he will abide still, though all the world had the contrary swore, he shall not thence be thrown nor be bore. Or, if you list to bid him then is gone, trill this pin, and he will vanish anon out of the sight of every manner white, and come again, be it by day or night, when that you list to clip him again, in such a guise as I shall to you say in betwixt you and me and that full soon ride when ye list. There is no more to doon. Informed when the king was of the knight, and had conceived in his wit aright the manner and the form of all this thing, full glad and blithe this noble doughty king repaired to his revel as before. The bridle is into the tower borne, and kept among his jewels leaf and deer. The horse vanished I know not in what manner out of their sight, ye get no more of me. But thus I leave in lust and jollity this cambuscan his lord is feasting, until well nigh the day began to spring. 
par secunda. The Norris of digestion, the sleep, gan on them wink, and bade them take keep, that much mirth and labour will have rest. And with a gaping mouth he all them kissed, and said that it was time to lie down, for the blood was in his domination. Cherish the blood, nature's friend, quoth he. They thanked him gaping by two and three, and every white gan draw him to his rest. As sleep them bade, they took it for the best. Their dreams shall not now be told for me, full are their heads of fumosity, that caused dreams of which there is no charge. They slept, till that it was prime large, the most part, but it was canisy. She was full measurable, as women be, for of her father had she ta'en her leave to go to rest, soon after it was eve. Her list not appalled for to be, nor on the morrow unfeastly for to see, and slept her first asleep, and then awoke. For such a joy she in her heart took both of her quaint a ring and her mirror, that twenty times she changed her color, and in her sleep, right for the impression of her mirror, she had a vision. Wherefore, ere that the sun gan up glide, she called upon her mistress her beside, and said that her list for to rise. These old women, that be gladly wise as are her mistresses, answered anon, and said, Madame, whither will ye gone thus early, for the folk be all in rest? I will, quoth she, arise, for may lest no longer for to sleep, and walk about. Her mistresses called women a great rout, and up they rose, well a ten or twelve. Up rose fresh Canacy herself, as ruddy and bright as is the young sun that in the ram is four degrees he run. No higher was he when she ready was, and forth she walked easily apace, arrayed after the lusty season swoot, lightly for to play and walk on foot. Not but with five or six of her many, and in a trench forth in the park went she. The vapour which up from the earth glowed made the sun to seem ruddy and broad, but natheless it was so fair a sight that it made all their heart as for to light, what for the season and the morning, and for the fowls that she heard sing. For right anon she wist what they meant, right by their song, and knew all their intent. The knot, why that every tale is told, if it be tarried till the list be cold of them that have it hearkened after your, the savour passeth ever longer more, for fulsomeness of the prolixity. And by that same reason thinketh me I should unto the knot condescend, and mackin of her walking soon an end. Amid a tree for dry, as white as chalk, there sat a falcon o'er her head full high, that with a piteous voice so gan to cry, that all the wood resounded of her cry, and beat she had herself so piteously with both her wings, till the red blood ran end along the tree there as she stood, and ever in one always she cried and shright, and with her beak herself as she so pite, that there is no tiger nor cruel beast that dwelleth either in wood or in forest, but would have wept, if that he weep he could, for sorrow of her. She shrieked always so loud. For there was never yet no man alive, if that he could a falcon well describe, that heard of such another of fairness as well of plumage as of gentleness, of shape, of all that might he reckoned be. A falcon peregrine seemed she, of Fremdeland, and ever as she stood she swooned now and now for lack of blood, till well nigh is she fallen from the tree. This fair king's daughter, Canacy, that on her finger bare the quaint ring, through which she understood well everything that any fowl may in his leaden sin, and could him answer in his leaden again, hath understood what this falcon said, and well nigh for the ruth almost she died, and to the tree she went full hastily, and on this falcon looked piteously, and held her lap abroad, for well she wist the falcon must have fallen from the twist when that she swooned next for lack of blood. A long while to wait her she stood, till at the last she spake in this manner unto the hawk, as ye shall after hear. What is the cause, if it be for to tell, that ye be in this furial pain of hell? quoth Canacy unto this hawk above. Is this for sorrow of death? or loss of love, for as I trow these be the causes too that cause most a gentle heart woe. Of other harm it needeth not to speak, for ye yourself upon yourself are reek, which proveth well that either ire or dread must be occasion of your cruel deed, since that I see none other wight you chase. For love of God, as do yourself a grace, or what may be your help? For west nor east I never saw ere now no bird nor beast that fared with himself so piteously. Ye slay me with your sorrow, verily, I have of you so great compassion. For God's love come from the tree adown, and, as I am a king's daughter true, 
if that I verily the causes knew of your disease, if it lay in my might, I would amend it, ere that it were night. So wisely help me the great God of kind. And herbs shall I right enough find to heal with your hurts hastily. Then shrieked this falcon yet more piteously than ever she did, and fell to ground anon, and lay a swoon, as dead as lies a stone, till Canacy had in her lap her take. Unto that time she gan of swoon awake, and after that she out of swoon abrayed, right in her hawk as a lead, and thus she said, That pity runneth soon in gentle heart, feeling his similitude in pain as smart is proved every day as men may see, as well by work as by authority. For gentle heart accatheth gentleness, I see well that ye have on my distress compassion, my fair canacy, of very womanly benignity that nature in your principles hath set, but for no hope for to fare the bet, but for to obey unto your heart free, and for to make others aware by me, as by the whelp chastised is the lion. Write for that cause and that conclusion, while that I have a leisure and a space, mine harm I will confess and ere I pace. And ever while the one her sorrow told, the other wept as she to water wold, till that the falcon bade her to be still. And with a sigh right thus she said her till. Ere I was spread, alas, that ilk a day, and fostered in a rock of marble grey so tenderly, that nothing ailed me. I wist not what was adversity, till I could flee full high under the sky. Then dwelled a tercel at me fast by, that seemed a well of all gentleness. All were he full of treason and falseness, it was so rapid under humble cheer, and under hue of truth, in such manier under pleasance, and under busy pain, that no white weaned that he could feign, so deep in grain he dyed his colours. Right as a serpent hides him under flowers, till he may see his time for to bite, right so this god of love's hypocrite did so his ceremonies and obeisances, and kept in semblance all his observances, that sounded unto gentleness of love. As on a tomb is all the fair above, and under is the corpse, which that he wet, such was this hypocrite both cold and hot. And in this wise he served his intent, that, save the fiend, none wist what he meant, till he so long had weeped and complained, and many a year his service to me feigned, till that mine heart, too piteous and too nice, all innocent of his crowned malice, for fear of his death as thought of me, upon his oaths and his surety, granted him love, on this condition, that evermore mine honour and renown were saved, both privy and apparent. This is to say that, after his desert, I gave him all my heart and all my thought. God wot, and he that other way is not, and took his heart in change of mine for a. But sooth is said, gone since many a day, a true wight and a thief think not one. And when he saw the thing so far he gone, that I had granted him fully my love in such a wise as I have said above, and given him my true heart as free as he swore that he gave his heart to me. And on this tiger, full of doubleness, fell on his knees with so great humbleness, with so high reverence, as by his cheer so like a gentle lover and manier, so ravished as it seemed for the joy that never Jason nor Paris of Troy, Jason, certes, nor ever other man since Lamech was that Alder first began to love too as right folk before nor ever since the first a man was born could no man by twenty thousand counterfeit the sophimes of his art, where doubleness of feigning should approach, nor worthy were to unbuckle his galosh, nor could so thank a wight as he did me. His manner was a heaven for to see to any woman where she ne'er so wise. So painted he and kempt at point of eyes, as well his word is as his countenance. And I so loved him for his obeisance and for the truth I deemed in his heart, that if so were that anything him smart, all were it ne'er so light, and I had wist, methought I felt death at my heart twist. And shortly so far forth this thing is went, that my will was his will as instrument. That is to say, my will obeyed his will in all the thing, as far as reason fill, keeping the boundes of my worship ever, and never had I thing so lief, or lever, as him, God wot, nor never shall no more. This lasted longer than a year or two that I supposed of him naught but good. But finally thus at the last it stood, that fortune would that he must twin out of that place which that I was in. Where me was woe it is no question, I cannot make of it description. For one thing dare I tell boldly, I know what is the pain of death thereby. Such harm I felt, for he might not by leave. So on a day of me he took his leave, 
so sorrowful eke that I weened verily that he had felt as much a harm as I, when that I heard him speak, and saw his hue. But natheless I thought he was so true, and eke that he repair or should again within a little while, sooth to sane. And reason would eke that he must go, for his honour, as often happeneth so, that I made virtue of necessity, and took it well, since that it must be. As I best might, I hid from him my sorrow, and took him by the hand, St. John to borrow, and said him thus, Lo, I am yours all, be such as I have been to you, and shall. <laughs> what he answered it needs not to rehearse. Who can say better than he? Who can do worse? When he had all well said, then had he done. Therefore behoveth him a full long spoon that shall eat with a fiend, thus heard I say. So at the last he must have forth his way, and forth he flew, till he came where him lest. When it came him to purpose for to rest, I trow that he had Zilka text in mind, that all the thing repairing to his kind gladdeth himself, thus say men as I guess. Men love of proper kind new fangleness as bird is due, that men in cages feed, for though thou night and day take of them heed, and strew their cage fair and soft as silk, and give them sugar, honey, bread, and milk, yet right anon as that his door is up, he with his feet will spurn adown his cup, and to the wood he will, and worm is eat. So new a fangle be they of their meat, and love novelties of proper kind. No gentleness of blood may them bind. So fared this Tercelet, alas, the day. Though he were gentle-born, and fresh, and gay, and goodly for to see, and humble, and free, he saw upon a time a kite flee, and suddenly he loved this kite so that all his love is clean from me go, and hath his troth falsed in this wise. Thus hath the kite my love in her service, and I am lorn without a remedy. And with that word this falcon gan to cry, and swooned eft in Canisee's barm. Great was the sorrow for that hawkish harm that Canisee and all her women made. They wist not how they might the falcon glad, but Canisee home bare her in her lap, and softly in plasters gan her wrap, there as she with her beak had hurt herself. Now cannot Canisee but herbas delve out of the ground, and make salves new of herbas precious and fine of hue, to heal with this hawk. From day to night she did her business, and all her might, and by her bed's head she made a mew, and covered it with velut's blue, in sign of truth that is in woman seen. And all without the mew is painted green, in which were painted all these false fowls, as be these tidifies, turslets, and owls, and pies, on them for to cry and chide, right for despite were painted them beside. Thus leave I can see her hawk keeping. I will no more as now speak of her ring, till it come eft to purpose, for to say how that this falcon got her love again repented, as the story telleth us, by mediation of Cambalus, that king's son, of which that I you told. But henceforth I will my process hold, to speak of adventures, and of battiles that yet was never heard so great marvellous. First I will tell you of Cambuscan, that in his time many a city won, and after will I speak of Algarsife, how he won Theodora to his wife, for whom full oft in great peril he was, and had he been holpen by the horse of brass. And after will I speak of Camballo, that fought in Listus with the brethren too for Canacy, ere that he might her win. And where I left, I will again begin. End of section 18。section 19 of the Canterbury Tales and Other Poems This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer. The Franklin's Tale. The Prologue. In faith, squire, thou hast thee well acquit, and gently I praise a well thy wit, quoth the Franklin. Considering thy youth, so feelingly thou speak'st, sir, I allow thee as to my doom, there is none that is here of eloquence that shall be thy peer, if that thou live. God give thee good a chance, and in virtue send thee continuance, for of thy speaking I have great dainty. I have a son, and by the Trinity it were me liever than twenty pound worth land, though it right now were fallen in my hand, he were a man of such discretion as that ye be, fie on possession. But if a man be virtuous withal, I have my son a snivet, and yet shall, for he to virtue listeth not to intend, but for to play at dice and to dispend, 
and lose all that he hath is his usage and he had liever talk with a page than to commune with any gentle wight there he may learn gentilis aright straw for your gentilessa quoth our host what francolin pardi sir well thou wost that each of you must tellen at the least a tale or two or break a his behest that know i well sir quoth the francolin i pray you have me not in disdain though i to this man speak a word or two tell on thy tale without a word is mo gladly sir host quoth he i will obey unto your will now hearken what i say i will you not contrary in no wise as far as that my witness may suffice i pray to god that it may please you then wot i well that it is good eno these old gentle bretons in their days of divers aventures made lays rhymed in in their first breton tongue which lays with their instruments they sung or ellis read them for their pleasance and one of them have i in remembrance which i shall say with good will as i can but sirs because i am a borel man at my beginning first i you beseech have me excused of my rude speech i learned never rhetoric certain thing that i speak it must be bare and plain i slept never on the mount of parnasso nor learned marcus tullius cicero colorous know i none without a dread but such colours as grow in in the mead or ella such as men die with or paint colours of rhetoric be to me quaint my spirit feeleth not of such matter but if you list my tale is shall ye hear the tale in armoric that called is Bretagne, there was a knight that loved and did his pain to serve a lady in his best wise and many a labour many a great emprise he for his lady wrought ere she were won for she was one the fairest under sun and eke thereto come of so high kindred that well unneeds durst this knight for dread tell her his woe his pain and his distress but at the last she for his worthiness and namely for his meek obeisance hath such a pity caught of his penance that privily she fell of his accord to take him for her husband and her lord of such lordship as men have or their wives and for to lead the more in bliss their lives of his free will he swore her as a knight that never in all his life he day nor night should take upon himself no mastery against her will nor kithe her jealousy but her obey and follow her will in all as any lover to his lady shall save that the name of sovereignty that would he have for shame of his degree she thanked him and with full great humblest she said sir since of your gentleness ye proffer me to have so large a reign ne would a god never betwixt us twain as in my guilt were either war or strife sir i will be your humble true wife have here my troth till that my heart abreast thus be they both in quiet and in rest for one thing sires safely dare i say that friends ever each other must obey if they will long a hold in company love will not be constrained by mastery when mastery comes the god of love anon beateth his wings and farewell he is gone love is a thing as any spirit free women of kind desire liberty and not to be constrained as a thrall and so do men if soothly i say shall look who that is most patient in love he is at his advantage all above patience is a high virtue certain for it vanquisheth as these clerkes sayn things that rigour never should attain for every word men may not chide or plain learn it to suffer or so may i go ye shall it learn whether ye will or no for in this world certain no wight there is that he not doth or saith sometimes amiss 
fire or sickness or constellation, wine, woe, or changing of complexion, causeth full oft to do amiss or speaken, on every wrong a man may not be reeken. After the time must be temperance to every wight that can of governance, and therefore hath this worthy, wise and knight, to live in ease, sufferance her behight. And she to him full wisly gan to swear, that never should there be default in her. Here may men see a humble wife accord, thus hath she ta'en her servant and her lord, servant in love and lord in marriage. Then was he both in lordship and servage? Servage? Nay, but in lordship all above, since he had both his lady and his love his lady certus and his wife also the which that law of love accordeth to and when he was in this prosperity home with his wife he went to his country not far from penmark where his dwelling was and there he lived in bliss and in solace who could it tell but he had wedded be the joy the ease and the prosperity that is betwixt a husband and his wife a year and more lasted this blissful life till that this knight of whom i spake thus that of carod was called arviragus shop him to go and dwell a year or twain in england that called was eke britain to seek in arms worship and honour for all his lust he set in such labour and dwelled there two years the book saith thus now will i stint of this arviragus and speak i will of dorigen his wife that loved her husband as her heart is life for his absent weepeth she and psyketh as do these noble wives when them liketh she mourneth waketh waileth fasteth plaineth desire of his presence her so distraineth that all this wide world she set it not her friends which that knew her heavy thought comfort her in all that ever they may they preach her they tell her night and day that causeless she slays herself alas and every comfort possible in this case they do to her with all their business and all to make her leave her heaviness by process as ye know in every one men be so long graven in a stone till some figure therein imprinted be so long have they comforted her till she received half by hope and by reason the imprinting of their consolation through which her great a sorrow gan assuage she may not always durin in such rage and eke arviragus in all this care hath sent his letters home of his welfare and that he will come hastily again or else had this sorrow her hearty slain her friends saw her sorrow gin to slake and prayed her on knees for god's sake to come and roman in their company a way to drive her dark fantasy and finally she granted that request for well she saw that it was for the best now stood her castle fast by the sea and often with her friend as walked she her to disport upon the bank on high there as many a ship and barge sigh sailing their courses where them list to go but then was that a parcel of her woe for to herself full oft alas said she is there no ship of so many as i see will bring a home my lord then were my heart all warished of this bitter pain smart another time would she sit and think and cast her eye in downward from the brink but when she saw the grisly raucous flake for very fear so would her heart quake that on her feet she might not her sustain then would she sit a down upon the green and piteously into the sea behold and say right thus with careful psychus cold eternal god that through thy purveyance leadest this world by certain governance in idle as men say ye nothing make 
but lord these grisly fiendly raucous blake that seem rather a foul confusion of work than any fair creation of such a perfect wise a god and stable why have ye wrought this work unreasonable for by this work north south or west or east there is not fostered man nor bird nor beast it doth no good to my wit but annoyeth see ye not lord how mankind it destroyeth a hundred thousand bodies of mankind have raucous slain all be they not in mind which mankind is so fair part of thy work thou madest it like to thine owen mark then seemed it ye had a great charity toward mankind but how then may it be that ye such meanest make it to destroy which meanest do no good but ever annoy i wot well clerkus will say as them lest by arguments that all is for the best although i can the causes not enow but thilk a god that made the wind to blow as keep my lord this is my conclusion to clerks leave i all disputation but would to god that all these raucous blake were sunken into hella for his sake these raucous slay my heart for the fear thus would she say with many a piteous tear her friends saw that it was no disport to roam by the sea but discomfort and showed them for to play somewhere else they lead her by rivers and by wells and eke in other places delectables they dancen and they play at chess and tables so on a day right in the morning tide unto a garden that was there beside in which that they had made their ordinance of victual and of other purveyance they go and play them all the long a day and this was on the sixth morrow of may which may had painted with his soft showers this garden full of leaves and of flowers and craft of man's hand so curiously arrayed had this garden truly that never was there garden of such price but if it were the very paradise the odour of flowers and the fresh sight would have maked any heart light that e'er was born but if too great sickness or too great sorrow held it in distress so full it was of beauty and pleasance and after dinner they began to dance and sing also save dorigen alone who made alway her complaint and her moan for she saw not him on the dance ago that was her husband and her love also but natheless she must a time abide and with good hope let her sorrow slide upon this dance among other men danced a squire before dorigen that fresher was and jollier of array as to my doom than is the month of may he sang and danced passing any man that is or was since that the world began therewith he was if men should him describe one of the best of faring men alive young strong and virtuous and rich and wise and well beloved and holden in great price and shortly if the sooth i tell a shall unweeting of this dorigen at all this lusty squire servant to venus which that e called was aurelius had loved her best of any creature two year and more as was his aventure but never durst he tell her his grievance without a cup he drank all his penance he was despaired nothing durst he say save in his song as somewhat would he ray his woe as in a general complaining he said he loved and was beloved nothing of such a matter made he many lays songs complaints roundels virelays how that he durst not his sorrow tell but languished as doth a fury in hell and die he must he said as did echo for narcissus that durst not tell her woe in other manner than ye hear me say he durst not to her his woe bewray 
save that peradventure sometimes at dances where young a folk keep their observances it may well be he looked on her face in such a wise as man that asketh grace but nothing wist she of his intent natheless it happened ere they thenis went because that he was her neighbour and was a man of worship and honour and she had known him of time yore they fell in speech and forth a more and more unto his purpose drew aurelius and when he saw his time he said thus madam quoth he by god that this world made so that i wist it might your heart a glad i would that day that your arviragus went over sea that i aurelius had gone where i should never come again for well i wot my service is in vain my guerdon is but bursting of mine heart madam rue upon my pain is smart for with a word ye may me slay or save here at your feet god would that i were grave i have now no leisure more to say have mercy sweet or you will do me day she gan to look upon aurelius is this your will quoth she and say ye thus ne'er erst quoth she i wist to what he meant but now aurelius i know your intent by thilke god that gave me soul and life never shall i be an untrue wife in word nor work as far as i have wit i will be his to whom that i am knit take this for final answer as of me but after that in play thus said she aurelius quoth she by high god above yet will i grant to you to be your love since i you see so piteously complain look at what day that indolong bretain ye remove all the rockes stone by stone that they not let a ship nor boat to gone i say when ye have made this coast so clean of rockes that there is no stone seen then will i love you best of any man have here my troth in all that ever i can for well i wot that it shall ne'er be tied let such folly out of your heart aglide what dainty should a man have in his life for to go love another man's wife that hath her body when that ever him liketh aurelius full often sore psyketh is there none other grace in you quoth he no by that lord quoth she that maked me woe was aurelius when that he this heard and with a sorrowful heart he thus answered madam quoth he this were an impossible then must i die of sudden death horrible and with that word he turned him anon then came her other friends many a one and in the alleys roamed up and down and nothing wist of this conclusion but suddenly began to revel new till that the brightest sun had lost his hue for the horizon had reft the sun his light this is as much to say as it was night and home they go in mirth and in solace save only wretched aurelius alas he to his house is gone with sorrowful heart he said he may not from his death a start him seemed that he felt his heart a cold up to the heaven his hand is gan he hold and on his knees bare he set him down and in his raving said his horizon for very woe out of his wit he brayed he wist not what he spake of but thus he said with piteous heart his plaint hath he begun unto the gods and first unto the sun he said apollo god and governor of every plant herb tree and flower that givest after thy declination to each of them his time and his season as thine herbero changeth low and high lord phoebus cast thy merciable eye on wretched aurelius which that am but lorn lo lord my lady hath my death thee sworn without a guilt but thy benignity upon my deadly heart have some pity for well i wot lord phoebus if you lest ye may me help save my lady best 
now vouchsafe that i may you devise how that i may be hope and in what wise your blissful sister lucina the sheen that of the sea is chief goddess and queen though neptunus have deity in the sea yet empress above him is she ye know well lord that right as her desire is to be quicked and lighted of your fire for which she followeth you full busily right so the sea desireth naturally to follow her as she that is goddess both in the sea and rivers more and less wherefore lord phoebus this is my request do this miracle or do mine heart breast that flow next at this opposition which in the sign shall be of the lion as pray her so great a flood to bring that five fathom at least it overspring the highest rock in armoric retain and let this flood endure years twain then certes to my lady may i say hold your hest the rockas be away lord phoebus this miracle do for me pray her she go no faster course than ye i say this pray your sister that she go no faster course than ye these years too then shall she be even at full all way and spring flood last both night and day and but she vouchsafe in such manier to grant to me my sovereign lady dear pray her to sink every rock adown into her own darker region under the ground where pluto dwelleth in or never more shall i my lady win thy temple in delphos will i barefoot seek lord phoebus see the tears on my cheek and on my pain have some compassion and with that word in sorrow he fell down and long a time he lay forth in a trance his brother which that knew of his penance up caught him and to bed he hath him brought despaired in this torment and this thought let i this woeful creature lie choose he for me where he will live or die arviragus with health and great honour as he that was of chivalry the flower is come home and other worthy men o oh, blissful art thou now thou dorigen thou hast thy lusty husband in thine arms the fresh knight the worthy man of arms that loveth thee as his own heart as life nothing list him to be imaginative if any white had spoke while he was out to her of love he had of that no doubt he not intended to know such matter but danced jousted and made a merry cheer and thus in joy and bliss i let them dwell and of the sick aurelius will i tell in languor and in torment furious two year and more lay wretched aurelius ere any foot on earth he might gone nor comfort in this time had he none save of his brother which that was a clerk he knew of all this woe and all this work for to none other creature certain of this matter he durst no word assain under his breast he bare it more secree than e'er did pamphilus for gallity his breast was whole without a fortusin but in his heart a was the arrow keen and well ye know that of a surseigneur in surgery it perilous the cure but men may touch the arrow or come thereby his brother wept and wailed privily till at the last him fell in remembrance that while he was at orleans in france as young a clerkess that be liquorous to read in artists that be curious seeken in every hawk and every hern particular sciences for to learn he him remembered that upon a day at orleans in study a book he say of magic natural which his fellow that was that time a bachelor of law all were he there to learn another craft had privily upon his desk he laughed which book spake much of operations touching the eight and twenty mansions that long to the moon and such folly as in our days is not worth a fly 
for holy church's faith in our belief us suffereth none illusion to grieve and when this book was in his remembrance anon for joy his heart began to dance and to himself he said a privily my brother shall be warished hastily for i am sicker that there be sciences by which men make diverse appearances such as these subtle tregetures play for oft at feasts have i well heard say that tregetures within a hall a large have made come in a water and a barge and in the hall a rowan up and down sometimes hath seemed come a grim lion and sometimes flowers spring as in a mead sometimes a vine and grape is white and red sometimes a castle all of lime and stone and when them like it voided it anon thus seemed it to every man's sight now then conclude i thus if that i might at orleans some old fellow find that hath these moon's mansions in mind or other magic natural above he should well make my brother have his love for with an appearance a clerk may make to man his sight that all the rockes blake of bretagne were voided every one and shippers by the brink a come and gone and in such form endure a day or two then were my brother warished of his woe then must she needest hold it her behest or else he shall shame her at the least why should i make a longer tale of this unto his brother's bed he come and is and such comfort he gave him for to gone to orleans that he upstart anon and on his way forthward then is he fair in hope for to be lissed of his care when they were come almost to that city but if it were a two furlong or three a young clerk roaming by himself they met which that in latin thriftily them gret and after that he said a wondrous thing i know quoth he the cause of your coming odd ere they farther any foot went he told them all that was in their intent the breton clerk him asked of fellows the which he had a known in old dawes and he answered him that they dead were for which he wept full often many a tear down off his horse aurelius light anon and forth with this magician is begone home to his house and made him well at ease then lacked no vitel that might them please so well arrayed a house as there was one aurelius in his life saw never none he showed him ere they went to sapir forestes parkes full of wild deer there saw he hartas with their hornes high the greatest that were ever seen with eye he saw of them an hundred slain with hounds and some with arrows bleed of bitter wounds he saw when voided were the wild deer these falconers upon a fair rivere that with their hawkers have the herons slain then saw he nightes joisting in a plain and after this he did him such pleasance that he him showed his lady on a dance in which himself a danced as him thought and when this master that this magic wrought saw it was time he clapped his hand as to and farewell all the revel is he go and yet removed they never out of the house while they saw all the sight is marvellous but in his study where his book is be they sat as still and no wight but they three to him this master called his squire and said him thus may we go to supper almost an hour it is i undertake since i you bade our supper for to make when that these worthy men went with me into my study where my books be sir quoth the squire when it liketh you it is all ready though ye will write now go we then sup quoth he as for the best these amorous folk some time must have rest at after supper fell they in treaty what sum should this master's guerdon be to remove all the rockas of bretagne and eke from gironde to the mouth of seine he made it strange and swore so god him save less than a thousand pound he would not have 
nor gladly for that sum he would not gone aurelius with blissful heart anon answered thus fie on a thousand pound this wide world which that men say is round i would it give if i were lord of it this bargain is full driven for we be knit ye shall be paid truly by my troth but look for no negligence or sloth ye tarry us here no longer than to-morrow nay quoth the clerk have here my faith to borrow to bed is gone aurelius when him lest and well nigh all that night he had his rest what for his labour and his hope of bliss his woeful heart of penance had a list upon the morrow when that it was day unto bretain they took the right away aurelius and this magician beside and be descended where they would abide and this was as the book as me remember the cold frosty season of december phoebus waxed old and hewed like latin that in his hot declination shone as the burned gold with streamus bright but now in capricorn adown he light where as he shone full pale i dare well sane the bitter frosts with the sleet and rain destroyed have the green in every yard janus sits by the fire with double beard and drinketh of his bugle horn the wine before him stands the brawn of tusked swine and noel crieth every lusty man aurelius in all that ever he can did to his master cheer and reverence and prayed him to do his diligence to bring him out of his painous smart or with a sword that he would slit his heart this subtle clerk such ruth had on this man that night and day he sped him that he can to wait a time of his conclusion this is to say to make illusion by such an appearance of jugglery i know no term as of astrology that she and every white should ween and say that of bretain the rockas were away or else they were sunken underground so at the last he hath a time found to make his japes and his wretchedness of such a superstitious cursedness his tables tolatane is forth he brought full well corrected that there lacked naught neither his collect nor his expanse years neither his rutes nor his other gears as be his centres and his arguments and his proportional convenience for his equations in everything and by his eight spheres in his working he knew full well how far alnoth was shoved from the head of that fixed aries above that in the ninth sphere considered is full subtly he calculed all this when he had found his first dimension he knew the remnant by proportion and knew the rising of his moon well and in whose face and term and every deal and knew full well the moon's mansion accordant to his operation and knew also his other observances for such illusions and such mischances as heathen folk used in vilka days for which no longer made he delays but through his magic for a day or tway it seemed all the rockas were away aurelius which yet despair it is where he shall have his love or fare amiss awaited night and day on this miracle and when he knew that there was none obstacle that voided were these rockas every one down at his master's feet he fell anon and said i woeful wretch aurelius thank you my lord and lady mine venus that me have holpen from my cares cold and to the temple his way forth hath he hold where as he knew he should his lady see and when he saw his time anon right he with dreadful heart and with full humble cheer saluteth hath his sovereign lady dear my rightful lady quoth this woeful man whom i most dread and love as i best can and loathest were of all this world displease were it not that i for you have such disease that i must die here at your foot anon not would i tell how me is woebegone 
but certes either must i die or plain ye slay me guiltless for very pain but of my death though that ye have no ruth advise you ere that ye break your truth repent you for thilk god above ere ye me slay because that i you love for madam well ye wot what ye have height not that i challenge anything of right of you my sovereign lady but of grace but in a garden yond in such a place ye wot right well what ye be height me and in mine hand your troth plighted ye to love me best god wot ye said so albeit that i unworthy am thereto madam i speak it for the honour of you more than to save my hardest life right now i have done so as ye commanded me and if ye vouchsafe it ye may go see do as you list have your behest in mind for quick or dead right there ye shall me find in you has all to do me live or day but well i wot the rockas be away he took his leave and she astonished stood in all her face was not one drop of blood she never weened to have come in such a trap alas quoth she that ever this should hap for weened i ne'er by possibility that such a monster or marvel may be it is against the process of nature and home she went a sorrowful creature for very fear unneeds may she go she weeped wailed all a day or two and swooned that it ruth was to see but why it was to no wight told she for out of town was gone arviragus but to herself she spake and said thus with face pale and full sorrowful cheer in her complaint as ye shall after hear alas quoth she on thee fortune i plain that unware hast me rapid in thy chain from which to scape wot i no succour save only death or else dishonour one of these two behoveth me to choose but natheless yet had i liever lose my life than of my body have his shame or know myself a false or lose my name and with my death i may be quit i wis hath there not many a noble wife ere this and many a maiden slain herself alas rather than with her body do trespass yes certes lo these stories bear witness when thirty tyrants full of cursedness had slain phidon in athens at the feast they commanded his daughters to arrest and bring them before them in despite all naked to fulfil their foul delight and in their father's blood they made them dance upon the pavement god give them mischance for which these woeful maidens full of dread rather than they would lose their maiden head they privily be start into a well and drowned themselves as the bookes tell they of messene let inquire and seek of lacedaemon fifty maidens eke on which they would do their lechery but there was none of all that company that was not slain and with a glad intent chose rather for to die than to assent to be oppressed of her maiden head why should i then to die and be in dread lo eke the tyrant aristocles that loved a maiden hight stymphalides when that her father slain was on a night unto diana's temple went she right and hent the image in her hand is too from which image she woulda never go no wight her hand is might off it a race till she was slain right in the self a place now since that maidens had a such despite to be defouled with man's foul delight well ought a wife rather herself to slee than be defouled as it thinketh me what shall i say of hasdrubala's wife that at carthage bereft herself of life for when she saw the romans win the town she took her children all and skipped adown into the fire and rather chose to die than any roman did her villainy hath not lucretia slain herself alas at rome when that she oppressed was of tarquin 
for her thought it was a shame to live when she had lost her name the seven maidens of milesy also have slain themselves for very dread and woe rather than folk of gaul them should oppress more than a thousand stories as i guess could i now tell as touching this matir when abradate was slain his wife so dear herself a slew and let her blood to glide in abradate's wound as deep and wide and said my body at the least away there shall no white defoul if that i may why should i more examples hereof sain since that so many have themselves slain well rather than they would defoul it be i will conclude that it is bet for me to slay myself than be defouled thus i will be true unto arviragus or ellis slay myself in some manier as did demotiana's daughter dear because she would not defoul it be o oh, cedasus it is full great pity to read a how thy daughters died alas that slew themselves for such a manner cast as great a pity was it or well more the theban maiden that for nicanor herself a slew right for such manner woe another theban maiden did write so for one of macedon had her oppressed she with her death her maiden head redressed what shall i say of niceratus wife that for such case bereft herself her life how true was eke to alcibiades his love that for to die in rather cheese than for to suffer his body unburied be lo what a wife was alceste quoth she what saith homer of good penelope all greece knoweth of her chastity pardi of laedamia is written thus that when at troy was slain protesilus no longer would she live after his day the same of noble portia tell i may without a brutus could she not live to whom she did all whole her heart to give the perfect wifehood of artemisy honoured is throughout all barbary o to the queen thy wifely chastity to all the wives may a mirror be thus plained dorigen a day or tway purposing ever that she would a day but natheless upon the third a night home came arviragus the worthy knight and asked her why that she wept so sore and she again weepen ever longer more alas quoth she that ever i was born thus have i said quoth she thus have i sworn and told him all as ye have heard before it needeth not rehearse it you no more this husband with glad cheer in friendly wise answered and said as i shall you devise is there aught ellis dorigen but this nay nay quoth she god help me so as whiz this is too much and it were god as will yea wife quoth he let sleep what is still it may be well parventure yet to-day ye shall your troth hold up by my fay for god so wisly have mercy on me i had well liever sticked for to be for very love which i to you have but if ye shall your trotha keep and save truth is the highest thing that man may keep but with that word he burst anon to weep and said i you forbid on pain of death that never while you lasteth life or breath to no wight tell ye this misaventure as i may best i will my woe endure nor make no countenance of heaviness that folk of you may deem a harm or guess and forth he called a squire and a maid go forth anon with dorigen he said and bring her to such a place anon they take their leave and on their way they gone but they not wist a why she thither went he would to no wight tell his intent this squire which that hight aurelius on dorigen that was so amorous of aventure happened her to meet amid the town right in the quickest street as she was bound to go the way forthright toward the garden there as she had height and he was to the garden ward also for well he spied when she would go out of her house to any manner place but thus they met 
of aventure or grace and he saluted her with glad intent and asked of her whitherward she went and she answered half as she were mad unto the garden as my husband bade my troth for to hold alas alas aurelius gan to wonder on this case and in his heart had great compassion of her and of her lamentation and of arbiragus the worthy knight that bade her hold all that she had a height so loath him was his wife should break her truth and in his heart he caught of it great ruth considering the best on every side that from his lust yet were him lever abide than do so high a churlish wretchedness against franchise and all the gentleness for which in few words he said thus madam say to your lord arviragus that since i see the great gentleness of him and eke i see well your distress that him were lever have shame and that were ruth then ye to me should break thus your truth i had well lever a to suffer woe than to depart the love betwixt you two i you release madam into your hand quit every surement and every bond that ye have made to me as here beforn since thilke time that ye were born have here my truth i shall you ne'er reprieve of no behest and here i take my leave as of the truest and the best wife that ever yet i knew in all my life but every wife beware of her behest on dorigen remember at the least thus can a squire do a gentle deed as well as can a knight without a dread she thanked him upon her knees bare and home unto her husband is she fair and told him all as ye have heard a said and trust me he was so well apaid that it were impossible me to write why should i longer of this case indite arviragus and dorigen his wife in sovereign bliss led forth their life ne'er after was there anger them between he cherished her as though she were a queen and she was to him true for evermore of these two folk ye get of me no more aurelius that his cost had all forlorn cursed the time that ever he was born alas quoth he alas that i be height of pured gold a thousand pound of weight to this philosopher how shall i do i see no more but that i am fordue mine heritage must i need a sell and be a beggar here i will not dwell and shame in all my kindred in this place but i of him may get a better grace but natheless i will of him essay at certain days year by year to pay and thank him of his great courtesy my troth will i keep i will not he with heart a-sore he went unto his coffer and brought a gold unto this philosopher the value of five hundred pound i guess and him beseeched of his gentleness to grant him days of the remnant and said master i dare well make a vaunt i failed never of my truth as yet for sickerly my debt as shall be quit towards you how so that ere i fare to go a-begging in my kirtle bare but would ye vouchsafe upon surety two year or three for to respite me then were i well for ellis must i sell mine heritage there is no more to tell this philosopher soberly answered and said thus when he these words heard have i not holden covenant to thee yes certes well and truly quoth he hast thou not had thy lady as thee liked no no quoth he and sorrowfully psyched what was the cause tell me if thou can aurelius his tale anon began and told him all as ye have heard before it needeth not to you rehearse it more he said arviragus of gentleness had liever die in sorrow and distress than that his wife were of her troth false the sorrow of dorigen he told him else how loath her was to be a wicked wife and that she liever had lost that day her life and that her troth she swore through innocence 
she ne'er erst had heard speak of apparence that made me have of her so great pity and write as freely as he sent her to me as freely sent i her to him again this is all and some there is no more to sane the philosopher answered leave a brother ever each of you did gently to the other thou art a squire and he is a knight but god forbid it for his blissful might but if a clerk could do a gentle deed as well as any of you it is no dread sir i release thee thy thousand pound as thou right now were crept out of the ground nor ever ere now hadst known me for sir i will not take a penny of thee for all my craft nor not for my travail thou hast e paid well for my vitail it is enough and farewell have good day and took his horse and forth he went his way lordings this question would i ask now which was the most free as thinketh you now tell me ere that ye farther wend i can no more my tale is at an end end of section nineteen section twenty of the canterbury tales and other poems this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by beeswax candle the canterbury tales by geoffrey chaucer the doctor's tale the prologue yea let that pass quoth our host as now sir doctor of physic i pray you tell us a tale of some honest matter it shall be done if that ye will it hear said this doctor and his tale gan anon now good men quoth he hearken every one there was as telleth titus livius a knight that called was virginius fulfilled of honour and worthiness and strong of friends and of great riches this knight one daughter had by his wife no children had he more in all his life fair was this maid an excellent beauty above and every white that man may see for nature had with sovereign diligence he formed her in so great excellence as though she would say lo i nature thus can i form and paint a creature when me that list who can me counterfeit pygmalion not though he i forge and beat or grave or paint for I dare well say, Apelles Zoexis should work in vain, either to grave or paint or forge or beat, if they presume me to counterfeit. For he that is the former principal hath made me his vicar general, to form and paint in earthly creatures, right as me list, and all things in my cure is, under the moon that may wane and wax, and form my work right nothing will I ax, my lord and I be full of one accord. I made her too the worship of my lord. So do I all mine other creatures, what colour that they have, or what figures. Thus it seemed me that nature would say. This maiden was of the age twelve year and tway, in which that nature had such delight. For right as she can paint a lily white, and red a rose right with such painture, she painted had this noble creature, ere she was born upon her limbs free, whereas by right such colours should be. And Phoebus died, had her tresses great, like to the streams of his burned heat. And if that excellent was her beauty, a thousandfold more virtuous was she. And her there lacked no condition that is to praise as by discretion. As well in ghost as body chaste was she, for which she flowered in virginity, with all humility and abstinence, with all temperance and patience, with measure eke of bearing and array. Discreet she was in answering all way. Though she were as wise as Pallas, dare I say, in, her facond eke for womanly and plain. No counterfeited terms had to she, to seem a wise, but after her degree she spake, and all her words more or less, sounding in virtue and in gentleness. Shamefast she was in maiden's shamefastness, constant in heart and ever in business, to drive her out of idle sluggardly, 
Bacchus had of her mouth right no mastery, for wine and sloth do Venus increase, as men and fire will cast in oil in Greece, and of her own virtue unconstrained, she had herself full often sickly feigned, that she would have flee the company, where likely was to treat and of folly, as it is at feasts, at revels, and at dances, that be occasions of dalliances. Such things as make children for to be, too soon are ripe and bold as men may see, which is full perilous and hath been of yore, for all too soon may she learn a law of boldness when that she is a wife. And ye mistresses in your older life, that lord's daughter have in governance, take not in my words displeasance, think ye that ye be set in governings of lord's daughter only for two things, either for ye have kept your honesty, or else ye have fallen in frailty, and know her well enough the older dance, and have forsaken fully such mischance for evermore. Therefore, for Christ's sake, to teach them virtue, look not that she slake. A thief of venison that hath forlaughed his licorousness and all his old craft, can keep a forest best of any man. Now keep them well, for if ye will, ye can. Look well that ye into no advice assent, lest ye be damned for your wick intent. For whoso doth a traitor is certain, and take keep of that I shall you say, of all a treason, sovereign pestilence, is when a white betrayeth innocence. Ye fathers and ye mothers eke also, though ye have children, be it one or more, yours is the charge of all their surveillance, while that they be under your governance. Beware that by example of your living, or by your negligence and chastising, that they not perish, for I dare well say, that if they do, ye shall it dear obey. Under a shepherd soft and negligent, the wolf hath many a sheep and lamb to rent. Suffice this example now is here, for I must turn again to my mattery. This maid, of which I tell my tale express, she kept herself, her needing no mistress. For in her living maidens might read, as in a book, every good word and deed, that longeth to a maiden virtuous, she was so prudent and so bounteous, for which the fames outsprang on every side, both of her beauty and her bounty wide, that through the land they praised her each one, that loved virtue save envy alone, that sorry is of another man's weal, and glad is of his sorrow and unheal. The doctor maketh this description. This maiden on a day went in the town, toward a temple with her mother dear, as is of younger maidens the manary. Now there was then a justice in that town, that governor was of that region, and so befell this judge his iron cast upon this maid, advising her full fast. As she came forth by where this judge stood, anon his heart a changed and his mood, so was he caught with beauty of this maid, and to himself full privily he said, this maiden shall be mine, for any man. And on the fiend, and to his heart to ran, man may do and taught him suddenly, that he by slight this maiden to his purpose win the might. For certes, by no force, nor by no meed, him thought he was not able for to speed. For she was strong of friends, and eke she confirmed was in such sovereign bounty, that well he wist he might her never win. As for to make her with her body sin, for which, with great deliberation, he sent after a clerk was in the town, the which he knew for subtle and for bold, this judge unto this clerk his tale told, in secret wise, and made him to assure he should tell it to no creature, and if he did, he should lose his head, and when assented was this cursed red. Glad was the judge, and made him greater cheer and gave him gifts precious and dear, when shapen was all their conspiracy, from point to point, how that his lechery performed should be full subtly, as you shall hear it after openly. Home went this clerk that hight to Claudius, this false judge that hight to Appius. So was his name, for it is no fable, but known for a story or thing notable. The sentence of its sooth is out of doubt, this false judge went now fast about, to hasten his delight all that he may. And so befell, soon after on a day, this false judge, as telleth us the story, as he was wont, sat in his consistory. 
and gave his dooms upon sundry cases. His false clerk came forth a full great pace, and said, Lord, if that it be your will, as do me right upon this piteous bill, in which I plain upon Virginius, that if he will say it is not thus, I will it prove and find a good witness, that sooth is what my biller will express. The judge answered, Of this in his absence I may not give definitive sentence. Let do him call, and I will gladly hear. Thou shalt have all a right, and no wrong here. Virginius came to wait the judge's bill, and right anon was read this cursed bill. The sentence of it was, as ye shall hear, To you, my lord, Sir Appius, so clear, showeth your poor servant Claudius, how that a knight called Virginius, against the law, against all equity, holdeth express against the will of me, my servant, which is that my thrall by right, which from my house was stolen on a night, while that she was full young. I will it prove, by witness, Lord, so that it you not grieve. She is his daughter not, what so he say. Wherefore to you, my lord, the judge, I pray, yield me my thrall, if that, that be your will. Though this was all the sentence of the bill, Virginius gan upon the clerk behold, but hastily ere he his tale told, and would have it proved, as should a knight, and eke by witnessing of many a wight, all that was false that said his adversary, this cursed judge would no longer tarry, nor hear a word more of Virginius, but gave his judgment and said to thus, I deem anon this clerk his servant have, thou shalt no longer in thy house her save. Go, bring her forth and put her in our ward, the clerk shall have his thrall, thus I award. And then this worthy knight Virginius, through sentence of this justice Appius, must by force his dear daughter give, unto the judge a lechery to live. He went him home and sat him in his hall, and let anon his dear daughter call. With a face dead as ashes cold, upon her humble face he gan behold, with father's pity sticking through his heart, or would he from his purpose not convert. Daughter, quoth he, Virginia by name, there be two ways, either death or shame, that thou must suffer, alas that I was bore, for never thou deservest wherefore to die in with a sword or with a knife, O dear daughter, ender of my life, whom I have fostered up with such pleasance, that thou wert never out of my remembrance. O daughter, which thou art my last a woe, and in this life my last a joy also, O gem of chastity in patience, take thou thy death, for this is my sentence. For love and not for hate thou must be dead, my piteous hand must smite an off thine head, Alas, that ever Appius thee saw. Thus hath he falsely judged thee to-day. And told her all the case, as ye before have heard, It needeth not to tell her more. O oh, mercy, dear father, quoth the maid, And with that word she both her arms laid About his neck, as she was wont to do. The tears burst out of her iron too, And said, O oh, good a father, shall I die? Is there no grace? Is there no remedy? No, sir, tis dear a daughter mine, quoth he. Then give me leisure, father mine, quoth she, my death for to complain a little space. For pardy, Jephthah gave his daughter grace, for to complain, ere he her slew, alas. And God at what, nothing was her trespass. But for she ran her father first to see, to welcome with him with great solemnity. And with that word she fell a-swoon anon, And after when her swooning was he gone, She rose up, and unto her father said, Blessed be God that I shall die a maid, Give me my death ere that I have shame, Do with your child your will in God's name. With that word she prayed him full oft, That with his sword he would smite her soft, And with that word a-swoon again she fell, Her father with full sorrowful heart and fell, her head off smote, and by the top it hent, And to the judge he went it to present, As he sat yet in doom and consistory. And when the judge it saw, as saith the story, He bade to take him and to hang him fast, But right anon a thousand people in thrust, 
to save the night for ruth and for pity. For known was the false iniquity the people anon had suspect in this thing. By manner of the clerks a challenging, thus it was by the assent of Appius. They wist well that he was lecherous, for which unto this Appius they gone, and cast him in a prison right anon. Whereas he slew himself, and Claudius, that servant was unto this Appius, was doomed for to hang upon a tree, for that Virginius of his pity so prayed for him that he was exiled, and El assert had he been beguiled, the remnant were hanged, more or less, that were consenting to this cursedness. Here men may see how God hath his merit. Beware, for ma no man knows how God will smite, to no degree, nor in which manner wise, the worm of conscience may agrise, of wicked life, though it so privy be, that no man knows thereof save God and he. For be he lured man, or Ella's leered, he knows not how soon he shall be afeared. Therefore I read you this counsel take, forsake sin, ere sin ye forsake. End of section 20「This is a Arro, quoth they, be nihilus and be blood, this was a cursed thief for false justice, as shameful death as e'er to can devise, come to these judges and their advocates, I'll go to this silly maid is slain, alas, alas, too dare a bochche her beote, wherefore I say that all die man may say that gift is of fortune and of mature, because of death to many a creature. Her beauty was her death, it dar well sign, alas, so piteously as she was slain. Of both the giftes that is spake of new, men have full often more arm than prue. But truly, mean own master dear, this was a piteous tale afore to her, for natheless, pass o'er, tis no force. He pray to God to save thee gentle course, and eke thine urinals, and thee jordans, thine hypocras, and eke thee galleans, and every boist full of the lectuary. God bless them, and our lady, Saint Mary. So may he say, thou art a proper man, in like a prelate, be Saint Ronian. Said he not well? Can he not speak in term? But well you ought thou dost me an air to erm that ye have almost caught the cardiacle. Be corpus domini, but ye have triacle, or else a draught of moist and corny ale, or but ye air a non a merry tale, me an air tis brost for pity of this maid. Thou, Bellamy, thou pardoner, he sighed, tell us some mirth of Jarpus reached anon. It shall be done, quoth he, be Saint Ronion. But first, quoth he, ere at this all a stack, he will both drink and beaten on a cock. But reached anon, the gentles gone to cree, Nay, let him tell us of no ribaldry, tell us some moral thing, that we may lair some wit, and then a will we gladly hear. He grant he wish, quoth he, but he must think upon some honest thing, will that he drink. Lordings, quoth he, in church, one he preach, he pine me to han an o'tine speech. And the ring it out as round as go the bell, for eke no I'll be rota that he tell. Me theme is always on and ever was, radix malorum est cupiditas. First he pronounce whence that he come, and then me bullish shoe he all and some, o legis lore sail on me patent, that shoe first. Me body to warrant that no man be so hardy priest nor clerk may to disturb of Christ's holy work. And after that, then tell forth me talis. 
Capulus of Pope, a son of Cardinales, of Patriarchs, and of Bishops he shew, and in Latin I speak a word of foe, to savour with me predication, and for to stir men to devotion. Then show he forth me long a crystal stone, as he crammed fall of Clutus and of Bonus, where they be, and when they each on, then have he in Latun a shoulder bone, which that was of an holy Jewish shape. Good men, say ye, talk of me war this cape, if that this bone be washed in any well, if coo or calf or shape or oxus swell, that any warm of it or warm is stung, talk water of that well and wash his tongue, and it is all anon, and father more of pockets and of scab, and every sore shall every shape behold, that of this well drinketh a draught, take cape of that he tell. If that the good man, that the bestus oweth, will every wake ere that the cock him croweth fasting, he drinken of this well a drocht, as tilko ole Jew or elders tacht, his bestus and his store shall multiply. And sirs, also it aileth jealousy, for though a man be fallen in jealous rage, let mark with this water his portage, and never shall he more his wif mistrust. Doch he the soch of her default to wist, all had she taken priestess, two or three. It is a mitine ache that ye may say, he that his hand will put in this matine, he shall have multiplying of his grind, when he hath sown be it weight or oats, so that he offer pounds or ellis groats, and men and women, on thing warn ye yo, if any wich be in this church you know, that hath done seen ye roible, so that he dar not for shame of it is shriven be, or any woman be she young or old, that hath him mar or husband cock a wold, such folk shall have no poor nor no grass to offer to me relics in this place. And whoso findeth him out of such blame, he will come up and offer in God's name, and he assoil him be the authority which that be bully granted was to me. Be this God, have he won a year be year an hundred marks since he was pardoner. He stand like a clerk in me pulpit, and when the lewd papal don is set, he preaches so as he have heard before, and tell him a hundred japes more. Then piney me to stretch forth me neck and haste and waste upon the papely back as doth a dove sitting on a barn. Me andes in me tongue go so yearn that it is joy to see me busyness of avarice and of such coarseness is all me preaching, for to mark them fray, to give their pants, and namely unto me, for mean and taunt is not bored for to win, and nothing for correction of sin. He reckon never when that they be buried, though that their soulless go a black buried, for certes many a predication cometh of team of evil intention, some for pleasance of folk, and flattery to be advanced be hypocrisy, and some for vain glory, and some for at, for when he dare not overwise debate, then will he sting him with me tongue smart in preaching, so that he shall not start to be defamed falsely, if that he hath trespassed to me brethren or to me. For though he tell not his proper name, men shall well know that it is the same be signals in be all circumstances. Thus, quitty folk that do us displeasances, to spit out me venom under who of holiness, to say my holy and true. But shortly men and taunt he will devise, he preach of nothing but of covetous. Therefore me them is yet and ever was, radix malorum est cupiditas. Thus can he preach against the sum of vis which that he us and that is avarice. But doch myself be guilty in that sin, Yet can he mock an over folk to twin from avarice, and sore of him repent. But that is not be principal intent. He preach nothing but for covetous. Of this matter it ought inox suffice. Then tell he them examples many a own of old stories, long a team a gone for lewd papal love, talus old. Such things can they well report and old. What? 
Troy, that will is in my preach and win a gold and silver for a teach, that he will live in poverty willfully? Nay, nay, he fucked it never truly. For he will preach and beg in sundry lands, he will do no labour with mean hands, nor make a baskets for to live there be, because he will not beg an idly, he will none of the apostles counterfeit, he will have money, wool, and chaise, and weight, all were it given of the poorest page or of the poorest widow in a village. Also her children starve for famine. Nay, I will drink the liquor of the vine and have a jolly wench in every tune. But hearken it, lordings, in conclusion, your leaking is that ye shall tell a tale, nor have ye drunk a drocht of corny ale. Be God, I hope ye shall you tell a thing that shall be raised on bane at your leaking, for though myself be a full, vicious man, a moral tale yet e you tell can, which I am wont to preach for to win. No, hold your pace, me tal e will begin. In Flanders, William was a company of younger folks that haunted folly as riot, hazard, stoos and taverns, whereas with lutes, harpies and guitars, they dance and ply at these both die and nicht, and ate also, and drink over their meat, through which they do the devil's sacrifice, within the devil's temple in corsed wees, be superfluity abominable. Their office be so great and so damnable that it is grisly for to hear em swear, or blissful lordes body they to tear. Them folk the Jews rent him not enough, and each of them had other sin a loch, and rest anon in coma tombesteris, fetus and small, and younger fruitesteris, singers with harpies, bodies, wifarers, which be the very devil's officers, to kindle and blow the fear of lechery that is annexed unto gluttony. The holy writ talk ye to me witness that luxury is in wean and drunkenness. Lo, ho that drunken lot unkindly lie by his daughter's two unwittingly. So drunk he was, and knew not what he rocked. Herodotus, who so well the story sought when he of wean or a plate was at his face, reached at his own table gave his haste to sly the Baptist John full guiltless. Seneca saith a good word doubtless. He sight he can no difference of fiend betwixt a man that is out of his mind and a man which that is drunk you. But that wardness he fallen in a shrew persevereth longer than drunkenness. Oh, gluttony full of all coarseness, O oh, cause first of our confusion, original of our damnation, till Christ had bought us with his blood again. Look, Oh, dare shortly for to sign, a bot was first this cursed villainy. Corrupt was all this world for gluttony. Adam, our father, and his wife also from paradise to labour and to woe were driven for that vis, it is no dread. For will that Adam fasted as he read, he was in paradise. And one that he ate of the fruit defounded on a tree, anon he was outcast to woe and pine. O oh, gluttony, on thee will ochtos plain. O oh, wisdom on whom many maladies follow, of excess and of gluttonies, he would be the more miserable of his diet, sitting at his table. Alas, the shorter throat, the tender mouth, mark that east and west and north and south, in earth, in air, in water, men do swing to get a gluttony, dainty mate and drink. Of this matter, O oh, Paul, well canst thou treat, mate unto warm, and warm ache unto mate, shall go destroy a both, as Paul is saith. Alas, a fool thing is it, be me faith aside this word, and fooler is the dead, when man so drinketh of the wheat and raid, that of his throat he marketh his privy, through quilk and corsed superfluity. The apostle saith, weeping full piteously, there walk many of which you told have ye. I say it now, weeping with piteous voice, 
that there be enemies of Christus Christ, of which the end is death. Warm is their God. Oh, warm, oh, belly, stinking is the cod, full filled of dung and of corruption, and either end of the fools the soon, how great labour and cost is there to fiend. There's caucus, all they stamp and strine and greened and torn substance into accident to fulfil all the liquorous talent. Out of the hardest bonus knocker thy the marrow, for they cast a nocht away that may go through the gullet soft and swart of specery and laves of bark and rot shall be as soused he mark it be delete, to mark him of a newer appetite. But certes, e that out of such delices is dead, we that he liveth in those vices. A lecherous thing is ween, and drunkenness is full of striving and of wretchedness. O oh, drunken man, disfigured is the face, sore is the breath, full art thou to embrace, and through the drunken nose soneth a son, as through those sidest I, some soon, some soon, and yet God wot, some son drank never ween, to fall us as it were a sticked swine, the tongue is lost, and all the honest cure for drunkenness is very sepulture of manus wit, and his discretion in whom that drink of domination, it can no counsel keep, it is no dread. Na keep ye from the wheat and from the red, and namely from the wheat wean of lep that is to sell in fish straight and in shape. This wean of spine crepeth subtly, and other weans grew a fast to be of which there reason such fumosity that when a man hath drunk and drunk to stray, and waneth that a bear home in shape, he is in spine, reached at the tune of lep. Not at Rochelle, nor at Bordeaux tune, and then I will a sigh, some soon, some soon. But Erkin Lordix, un word you pray that all the sovereign actors dare sigh of victories in the Old Testament, through very God that is omnipotent, were done in abstinence and in prayer. Look in the Bible, and there you might lair. Look, Attila. The great conqueror did in his sleep with sham and dishonour, bleeding eye at his nose in drunkenness, a captain said I live in soberness, and o'er all this advise you richt well what was commanded unto Lemuel, not Samuel, but Lemuel, sigh ye, read the Bible and find it expressly of wing giving to them that of justice. No more of this, for it may well suffice. And no that ye have spoke of gluttony, no will ye you defend the azardry. Azard is very mother of lessings and of deceit and corsed forswearings, blaspheme of Christ, manslochter, and wast also of chattel and of team, and furthermore it is reprave and contrar of honour for to be held a common azardur. And ever the eager he is of a start, the more he is old and desolate. If that a prince whose hazardry and all a governance in policy he is, is by common opinion he hold the less in reputation. Chilon, that was a wise ambassador, was sent to Corinth with full great honour from Lacedaemon to mark alliance, and when he come, it happened him, bechance, that all the greatest that were of that land he plying at Azad he them fand. For which, as soon as that it mich to be, he stole him home again to his country and side of there. He will not lose me now, nor will he talk on me so great defama, you to a lee unto no other doors. Send some other wise ambassadors. For be me troth, may wear lever thee than he should you to other doors ali. For ye that be so glorious in honours shall not ali you to no other doors, as be me will, nor as be me treaty. This wise philosopher thus sighed he, Look eke who to the king Demetrius, the king of Parthus, as the book saith us, sent him a pyre of dice of gold in scorn, 
For he had used hazard there before, for which he held his glory and renown at no value or reputation. Loris may find an overman reply, honest enough to drive the die away. Nu will he speak of authors, false and great, a word or two, as all the book is straight. Great swearing is a thing abominable, and false swearing is more reprovable. The eco god forbade swearing at all. Witness on Matthew, but in special of swearing, saith the holy Jeremy. Thou shalt swear so thin authors in Natalie, and swear in dome and ache in ritwishness. In eagle swearing is a coarseness. Behold and say, there in the first table of Eco Godis est this honorable, or that the second best of him is this, Talk not me nam in idle or amiss. No, rather a forbiddeth such swearing than homicide or many a cursed thing. He said that as be ordered thus it standeth, this knoweth he that his estes understandeth. Or that the second est of God is that, and furthermore, he will they tell all plot that Vangian shall not part from his oath, that of his oath is, is outrageous. Be God is precious earth, and be as nihilous, and be the blood of Christ that is in highless. Seven is me chance, and thine is sink and tray. Be God is armis, if thou falsely this dagger shall fruch out thine hair to go. This fruit comes of the bitched bone is two, for swearing, ear, falseness and homicide now for the love of christ that for us did leave your oaths both great and small but sirs no will he ail you forth me tal these reators fere of which he tell long erst and prima rang of any bell were set them in a tavern for to drink and as they sat they heard a bell a clink before a corpse was carried to the grave then one of them gan call to his knave, Go back, quoth he, and ask readily what corpse is this that path of air forth be, and look that thou report his name well. Sir, quoth the boy, it needeth near the dale. It was me told e ye come ere two oars. He was pardy, an old fellow of yours. And suddenly he was a slain to nicht, for drunk as he sat on his bench upricht. There come a privy thief, men clap a death, that in this country all the papal slife, and with his spear he smote his earth in two, and went his way with all to war this more. He hath a thousand slime this pestilence, and master, ere you come in his presence, may think it that it were full necessary for to be war of such an adversary. Be ready for to mate him evermore. Thus talk to me, me dame, he say no more. Be Saint Mary, said the taverner, the chill say sooth, for he hath slain this year and sore a meal within a great village, both man and woman, shield and ind and page. He threw his abatation be there to be advised great wisdom it were, ere that he did a man a dishonour. Ye goddess armis, quoth this reator, is it such peril with him for to mate? He shall him sake be still and ache be straight. He mak a vow be goddess din your bones. Erkin fellows, we three be all honest, yet each of us hold up his hand to other, and each of us become the other's brother, and we will slay this false traitor death. He shall be slain, e that so many slays, be goddess dignity, ere it be nicht. Together after these three their troth of plish to leave in thee each of em for the other, and though he were his own sworn brother, and up they start all drunken in this raj, and forth they go toward the vast village of which the taverner had spoke before, and many a grisly oath have they sworn, and Christ this blessed body they to rent, death shall be dead if that way my meant. When they had gone not fully off a meal, richt as they would have trodden o'er a steel, an old man and a poor with them met. This old man full makely them great, and sighed thus, No, lordings, God you say. The prudest of these reatoris fray answered again, What, 
Chur with sorry grass, we are to all for rapid savdi fas. We live to so long in so great age. This old man gan look on his visage and side of us, for that he cannot find a man. Look that he walked unto end neither in city nor in no village go that would a change his youth for mina age. And therefore must he have minage still as long a team as it is God's will. And death, alas, he will not have me leaf. Thus walk he like a restless kaitif, and on the ground which is me mother's got, he knock with me staff early and late, and sigh to her, Leave, mother, let me in. Lo, how we one flesh and blood and skin, alas, when shall me bonus be at rest? Mother, will you ye ward to change me chest that in me chamber long it must be, yea, for an iry clot trap in me? But yet to me she will not do that grass for which full pall and whelk it is me fast. But, sirs, to you it is no courtesy to speak unto an old man villainy, but a trespass in word or else in deed. In all ye writ, ye may yourself as read. Against an old man or upon his head, ye shall arise. Therefore you read, ne do unto an old man no harm no, no more than ye would a man did yo, in as if that ye may so long abid. And God bear with you, whether ye go or read, he must go thither as he have to go. Nay, old churl, be God, thou shalt not so, sighed this other as a door anon. Thou partest not so lichly be St. John. Thou sparkest rich now of that traitor death that in this country all our friend is slyeth. Have ere me troth, as thou art his speed, tell where he is, or thou shalt it a be. Be God and be the holy sacrament for softly, thou art one of his son to sly us younger folk, thou false thief. Now, sirs, quoth he, if it be your so lift to find a death, turn up this crooked way, for in that grove he left him be me fi under a tree, and there he will abide, nor for your boast a will him nothing heed. Say ye that oak? Reef there ye shall him find. God save you that bought again, man kind, and you amend. The sight this old man, and every of these reatorus ran till they come to the tray, and there they found a florins fiend, of gold he coined round well nick a seven bushels, as them sfaucht. No longer as then after death they sought, but each of them so glad was of the sicht, for that the florins were so fire and brief, that doon they sat them by the precious ore. The youngest of them spake the first to word. Brethren, quoth he, ta cape what he shall say. Me wit is great, both that he bore and ply. This treasure hath fortune unto us given in mirth and jollity or leaf to live in. And lichtly as it comes, so will we spend. Ay, God is precious dignity, who when to die that way should have so fire a grass. But mich this gold a carried from this place home to me house, or else unto yours, for well ye wot that all this gold is ours. Then were we in hic felicite, but truly be die it may not be. Men would decide that we were thieve strong, and for our own treasure do us hong. This treasure must a carried be benished, as weasley and as sleely as it mished, Wherefore he read that could among us all we draw, and let say where the cut will fall, and he that hath the cut with hair to bleeth shall run into the tune, and that full swift, and bring us bread and wean full privily, and two of us shall keep us suitably this treasure well, and if he will not tarry when it is nicht, we will this treasure carry be on a sant, where us le think is best. Then one of them the cut brocht in his fist and bade them draw, and look where it would fall. And it fell on the youngest of them all, and forth to all the tune he went anon. And also soon as that he was he gone, the one of them spoke thus unto the other. Thou knowest well that thou art me sworn brother, the prophet will he tell thee richt anon. 
Thou knowest well that our fellow is gone, and heir is gold, and that full great plenty that shall depart in he among us three. But nevertheless, if he could chop it so that it departed were among us two, had he not done a friendless turn to thee? The other answered, He not hoped that might be. He knows well that the gold is with us twy. What shall we do? What shall we to him sigh? Shall it be counsel, said the first to shrew, and he shall tell to thee in word is fool what we shall do, and bring it well aboot. He grant, quoth the other, out of doubt that be me troth he will then not be wry. No, quoth the first, thou know wellst we be twy, and two of us shall stronger be than one. Look, when that air set, thou rest an on a rees, as look the wallest with him ply, and he shall reeve him through the cedars twy, whilst that thou strugglest with him, as in gam, and with thee dagger look thou do the sum, and then shall all this gold departed be, me dear a friend, betwixt the day. Then we may both or lost us all fulfil, and ply a dis reach that our own will. And thus accorded ben this shoes twy, to slain the thriller, as ye had heard me sigh. The youngest, which that went to the tune, full oft in her he rolled up and down, the beauty of this Florence new in bricht. O oh, Lord, quoth he, if so were that he must have all this treasure to myself alone, there is no man that lives under the throne of God that should have so merry as he. And at the last, the fiend or enemy put in his thought that he should poison be with which he mished to sly his fellows twe for we the fiend found him in such living that he had leave to sorrow him to bring for this was utterly his full intent to sly them both and never to repent and forth he went no longer would he tarry into the tune to an apothecary and prayed him that he woo him would a sell some poison that he mished his rat to squell and eke there was a polecat in his all that, as he sighed, his eppens had his slaw, and fine he would him reek, if that he mished a vermin that destroyed him be nicht. The pothecary answered, Thou shalt have a thing as wishly God me soul a salve. In all this world there is no creator that ate or drank half of this confector, not but the mountains of a corn of weight, that he shall not his leaf anon for late, Yea, stare we shall, and that in less a wheel than thou wilt go a pass nocht but a meal. This poison is so strong and violent. This cursed man hath in his hand he hent this poison in a box, and swiftly ran into the next strait unto a man and borrowed of him larger bottles three. And in the two the poison powered eh. The third he kept a clean for his own drink, for all the nicht he shop him for to swink in carrying off the gold out of that place. And when this reator, with sorry grass, had filled with wean his greater bottles three, to his fellows again or a pirate, what needeth it thereof to sermon more? For rest as they had cast his death before, rest so they have him slain, and that anon. And when that this was done, to spark the on. No, let us sit and drink and mock us merry, and afterward we will his body bury. And with that word, it happened him parcast to tack the bottle where the poison was, and drank and gave his fellow drink also, for which anon they starved both the two. But certes, he supposed that Avicen wrote never in no canon nor no fen more wondrous seenness of empoisoning than had these wretches to ere their ending. Thus ended by these homicides too, and eke the false empoisoner also. O oh, cursed sin, full of all cursedness! O oh, traitress homicide! O oh, wickedness! O oh, gluttony! Luxury and hazardry, thou blasphemer of Christ with villainy, and authors great of usage and of preed. Alas, mankind, who might it pity that to the Creator, which that they rocked, and with his precious hair to blood they bought, 
Thou art so false and so unkind, alas! No good men could forgive you your trespass, and war you from the scene of avarice. In only pardon, my you all worry, so that ye offer nobles or sterlings, or any silver brooches, spoons, or rings. Boy your head under this holy bull, come up, ye weaves, and offer of your will. Your namus ye enter in me rolling on, into the bliss of heaven shall ye gone. Eh, you a soil be mean, eh, poor, ye yeah, that will offer as clean and eke as clear as ye were born. And lo, seers, do ye preach, and ye so Christ that is ur saulus late, so grant to you his pardon to receive, for that is best, a eh, will you not deceive. But, seers, onward forgot he in me tal. He have relics and pardon in me mile, as fire as any man in England, which were may given be the Pope's and, if any of you will of devotion offer and have me absolution, come forth anon and clear a doon, and make me receive me pardon, or else that pardon as ye went and anew, O oh, Elis tak pardon as ye wind are new and fresh at every tunis end, so that ye offer always new and new, noblest or pumps, which that be good and true. Tis an anur to every that is air that ye have a sufficient pardon air to soil ye in country as ye read, for aventures which that my be teed. Par aventur, they might fall on or two down of his horse and break his neck in two. Look, what a surety is it to y'all that ye am in your fellowship ye fall, that my assoil ye both more and less, when not a soul shall from the body pass. Ye greater that our oster shall begin, for he is most enveloped in sin. Come forth, sir Ost, and offer first in on, and thou shalt kiss the relics every on ye for a groat, on buckling on the purse. Nay, nay, quoth he, then have ye Christus course. Let be, quoth he, it shall not be so thitch, for what a smack may kiss thee old breach and swear it were a relic of a saint, look it were with the fundament de pint. But be the cross which that saint Ellen found, a woody had the coilons in me and instead of relics or of sanctuary. They cut them off, he will they help them carry. They shall be shrined in an august toward. The pardoner and swear not on word so rough he was, no warder would he sigh. No, quoth our host, he will no longer ply with thee, nor with none other angry man. But reached anon, the worthy knicht began, one that he saw that all the paper loch. No more of this, for it is rich enough, Sir Pardoner, be merry and glad of cheer. And ye, Sir Ost, that be to me so dear, I pray you that ye kiss the Pardoner, and Pardoner, I pray thee, draw thee near, and as we did, let us loch and ply. Anon they kissed, and rode forth fire away. End of section 21. Section 22 of the Canterbury Tales and Other Poems. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer. The Shipman's Tale. The Prologue. Our host upon his stirrup stood anon, and said a, Good men, hearken every one. This was a thrifty tale for the nuns. Sir Parish Priest, quoth he, for God is bones, tell us a tale, as was thy forward yore. I see well that ye learned man in lore can much a good by God's dignity. The parson him answered, Ben de Cite, 
What ails the man so sinfully to swear? Our host answered, O Jankin, be ye there? Now, good men, quoth our host, hearken to me. I smell a lollard in the wind, quoth he. Abide for God is dignity passion, for we shall have our predication. This lollard here will preachin us somewhat. Nay, by my father's soul, that shall he not, said the shipman. Here shall he not preach. He shall no gospel glows, hear nor teach. We all believe in the great God, quoth he. He would a sow us some difficulty, or spring a cockle in our clean a corn, and therefore, host, I warn of thee before, my jolly body shall a tale a tell, and I shall clink a you so merry a bell, that I shall waken all this company. But it shall not be of philosophy, nor of physic, nor termus quaint of law. There is but little Latin in my maw. The Tela A merchant whilom dwelled at St. Denise, that richer was, for which men held him wise, a wife he had of excellent beauty, and companionable and revelous was she, which is a thing that causeth more dispense than worth is all the cheer and reverence that men then do at feasts and at dances. Such salutations and countenances passen as doth the shadow on the wall. Put woe is him that pay a must for all. The seely husband, all gate he must pay. He must us clothe and he must us array, all for his own worship richly. In which array we dance jollily. And if that he may not peradventure, or ellis list not such dispense endure, but thinketh it is wasted and ye lost, then must another pay a for our cost, or lend us gold, and that is perilous. This noble merchant held a noble house, for which he had all day so great repair, for his largesse and for his wife was fair, that wonder is, but hearken to my tailor. Among us all these guests great and smaller, there was a monk, a fair man and a bold, I trow a thirty winter he was old, that ever in one was drawing to that place. This young a monk, that was so fair a face, Acquainted was so with this good a man, since that their first knowledge began, that in his house as familiar was he as it is possible any friend to be. And for as much all as this good a man, and eke this monk of which that I began, were both the two ye born in one village, the monk him claimed as for cousinage. And he again him said not once nay, but was as glad thereof as foul of day. For to his heart it was a great pleasance, thus be they knit with etern alliance, and each of them gan other to assure of brotherhood while that their life made yure. Free was Dan John, and namely of dispense, as in that house, and full of diligence, to do pleasance, and also great costage, he not forgot to give the least a page in all that house, but, after their degree, he gave the Lord and sithen his meany, when that he came some manner honest thing, for which they were as glad of his coming, as foul is fain when that the sun upriseth. No more of this as now, for it sufficeth. But so befell this merchant on a day, shope him to make ready his array, toward the town of Bruja, for to fare, to buy there a portion of ware, for which he hath the pair sent anon, a messenger, and prayed hath Dan John, that he should come to St. Dennis, and play with him and with his wife a day or tway, ere he to Bruja went in Allah wise. This noble monk, of which I you devise, had of his abbot, as him list license, because he was a man of high prudence, and eke an officer out for to ride, to see their granges and their barn is wide. And unto St. Dennis he came anon, who was so welcome as my lord Dan John, our dear cousin full of courtesy. With him he brought a job of Malavesi, and eke another full of fine vernage. 
and volatile as A was his usage. And thus I let them eat and drink and play, this merchant and this monk, a day or tway. The third a day the merchant up ariseth, and on his needest sadly him adviseth. And up into his counter-house went he, to reckon with himself as well may be, of thilk a year how that a with him stood, and how that he dispended bad his good, and if that he increased were or none. His bookas and his baggas many a one he laid before him on his counting board, full richer was his treasure and his hoard, for which full fast his counter door he shut, and eke he would that no man should him let of his accountus for the mean a time, and thus he sat till it was passed prime. Dan John was risen in the morn also, and in the garden walked to and fro, and had his thingas said full courteously. The good wife came walking full privily into the garden where he walked soft, and him saluted as she had done oft. A maiden child came in her company, which as her list she might govern and gee, for yet under the yarda was the maid. O oh, dear a cousin mine, Dan John, she said, what aileth you so wrath for to arise? Niece, quoth he, it ought enough suffice, five hours for to sleep upon a night. But it were for an old appalled wight, as be these wedded men that lie and dare, as in a forma sits a weary hare, all of straught, with houndes great and small. But, dear niece, why be ye so pale? I trow, certes, that our good a man hath you so labored since this night began that you were need to rest a hastily. And with that word he laughed a full merrily, and of his own thought he waxed all red. This fair wife gan for to shake her head, and said a thus, Yea, God wot all, quoth she, Nay, cousin mine, it stands not so with me. For by that God that gave me soul and life, in all the realm of France is there no wife that less a lust hath to that sorry play. For I may sing alas and well away that I was born, but to no wight, quoth she. Dare I not tell how that it stands with me, wherefore I think out of this land to wend, or else of myself to make an end, so full am I of dread and eke of care. This monk began upon this wife to stare, and said, Alas, my niece, God forbid that ye for any sorrow or any dread fordo yourself, but tell me your grief, peradventure I may in your mischief counsel or help, and therefore tell me all your annoy, for it shall be secret. For on my portos here I make an oath, that never in my life, for lief nor loath, Ne shall I of no counsel you be ray. The same again to you, quoth she, I say, By God and by this portos I you swear, Though men me wouldn't all in pieces tear, Ne shall I never for to go to hell, Be ray one word of thing that ye me tell. For no cousinage nor alliance, But verily for love and affiance. Thus be they sworn, and thereupon they kissed, and each of them told other what them list. Cousin, quoth she, if that I had a space, as I have none, and namely in this place, then would I tell a legend of my life, what I have suffered since I was a wife with mine husband, all be he your cousin. Nay, quoth this monk, by God and St. Martin, he is no more cousin unto me, then is the leaf that hangeth on the tree. I call him so by St. Denis of France to have the more cause of acquaintance of you, which I have loved specially above in all women sickerly. This swear I you on my profession, tell me your grief, lest that he come adown, and hasten you, and go away anon. My dear love, quoth she, O oh my Dan John, Full leaf were me this counsel for to hide, but out it must I may no more abide. 
My husband is to me the worst of man that ever was since that the world began. But since I am a wife, it sits not me to tell a no white of our privity, neither in bed nor in none other place. God shield, I should a tell it for his grace. A wife shall not say of her husband, but all honor, as I can understand. Save unto you, thus much I tell a shall. As help me God, he is not worth at all, in no degree, the value of a fly. But yet me grieveth most his niggardy, and well you wot that women naturally desire a thing of six as well as I. They would have that their husbands should have be hardy and wise and rich and thereto free, and buxom to his wife and fresh in bed. But by that ilk lord that for us bled, for his honor myself for to array. On Sunday next I must a needest pay a hundred francs, or else I am lorn. Yet were me lever than I were unborn, then me were done slander or villainy. And if mine husband eke might it espy, I were but lost, and therefore I you pray, lend me this sum, or else must I die. Dan John, I say, lend me these hundred francs. Pardy, I will not fail of you my thanks, if that you list to do that I you pray. For at a certain day I will you pay, and do to you what pleasance and service that I may do, right as you list devise. And but I do, God take on me vengeance, as foul as e'er had galleon of France. This gentle monk answered in this manner. Now truly, mine Owen lady dear, I have, quoth he, on you so great a ruth, that I you swear and plight to you my truth, that when your husband is to Flanders fair, I will deliver you out of this care, for I will bring a you a hundred francs. And with that word he caught her by the flanks, and her embraced hard and kissed her oft. Go now your way, quoth he, all still and soft, and let us dine as soon as that ye may, for by my cylinder tis prime of day. Go now and be as true as I shall be. Now, Ellis, God forbid, sir, quoth she, and for she went as jolly as a pie, and bade the cookers that they should them high, so that men might a dine and that anon. Up to her husband is his wife gone, and canocked at his contour boldly. Qui es la? quoth he. Peter, it am I, quoth she. What, sir, how long a will you fast? How long a time will you reckon and cast your summes, and your bookas, and your things? The devil have part of all such reckonings. You have enough party of goddess sond. Come down today and let your bagus stand. Ne be ye not ashamed that Dan John shall fasting all this day elanga gone? What let us hear a mass and go we dine? Wife, quoth this man, little canst thou divine the curious business that we have. For of us chapmen also God me save, and by that Lord that cleeped is Saint Ive, scarcely among us twenty, ten shall thrive continually, lasting unto our age. We may well make cheer and good visage, and drive forth the world as it may be, and keep in our estate in privity, till we be dead, or else that we play a pilgrimage, or go out of the way. And therefore have I great necessity upon this quaint world to advise me, for evermore must we stand in dread of hap and fortune in our chapman head. To Flanders will I go tomorrow at day, and come again as soon as e'er I may, for which, my dear a wife, I thee beseek, as be to every white buxom and meek, and for to keep our good be curious, and honestly govern well our house. Thou hast enough in every manner wise, that to a thrifty household may suffice, thee lacketh none array, nor no vitail, of silver in thy purse thou shalt not fail. And with that word his contour door he shut, and down he went, no longer would he let, 
and hastily a mass was there said, and speedily the tables were laid, and to the dinner fast they them sped, and richly the smonk the chapman fed. And after dinner Dan John soberly this chapman took apart, and privily he said him thus, Cousin, it standeth so, that I see to Bruja ye will go. God and St. Austin speedy you and guide. I pray you, cousin, wisely that you ride, govern you also of your diet, a temperly and namely in this heat. Betwixt us two needeth no strange fare. Farewell, cousin, God shield you from care. If anything there be, by day or night, if it lie in my power and my might, that ye me will command in any wise, it shall be done right as you will devise. But one thing ere you go, if it may be, I would a pray you for to lend to me a hundred francas for a week or twy, for certain beasts that I must buy to store with the place that is ours. God help me so, I would that it were yours. I shall not fail as surely of my day, not for a thousand francs a mile away. But let this thing be secret, I you pray, for yet tonight these beasts must I buy. And fare now well, mine Owen cousin dear, grand mercy of your cost and of your cheer. This noble merchant, gentilly anon, answered and said, O cousin mine, Dan John, now sickerly this is a small request. My gold is yours, when that it you lest, and not only my gold, but my chauffeur. Take what you list, God shield it that you spare. But one thing is, you know it well enow, of Chapman, that their money is their plow. We may creance while we have a name, but goldless for it to be, it is no game. Pay it again when it lies in your ease, after my might full fain would I you please. These hundred francas said he forth anon, and privily he took them to Dan John. No white in all this world wist of this loan, saving the merchant and Dan John alone. They drink and speak and roam a while and play, till that Dan John rode unto his abbey. The morrow came, and forth this merchant rideth, to Flanders' word, his princess well him guideth. Till he came unto Bruja merrily, now went this merchant fast and busily about his need, and by it and creanced. He neither played at the dice nor danced, but as a merchant, shortly for to tell, he led his life, and there I let him dwell. The Sunday next the merchant was ye gone, to St. Dennis ye come in his Dan John, with crown and beard all fresh and newly shave, in all the house was not so little a knave, nor no white, Ellis that was not full fain, for that my lord Dan John was come again. And shortly to the point right for to gone, the fair wife accorded with Dan John, that for these hundred francs he should all night have her in his armes bolt upright. And this accord performed was indeed. In mirth all night a busy life they lead, till it was day that Dan John went his way, and bade the meanie farewell, have a good day. For none of them, nor no white in the town, had of Dan John right no suspicion, and forth he rode home to his abbey, or where him list, no more of him, I say. The merchant, when that ended, was the fair, to St. Dennis he gan for to repair, and with his wife he made feast and cheer, and told to her that Chaffair was so dear, that needest must he make a chevesance, for he was bound in a recognizance to pay a twenty thousand shields anon, for which this merchant is to Paris gone, to borrow of certain friends that he had, a certain francs, and some with him he lad. And when that he was come into the town, and great cherie and great affection, unto Dan John he went to first to play not far to borrow of him no money, but for to wheat and see of his welfare, and for to tell a him of his chauffeur, as friends do when that they meet in fair. Dan John him made feast and merry cheer, and he him told again full specially 
how he had well ye bought and graciously, thank be God, all whole his merchandise, save that he must, in all manner wise, make a chevesance as for his best, and then he should a be in joy and rest. Then John answered, Certes, I am fain that ye in health become born again, and if that I were rich, as have I bliss, of twenty thousand shields should ye not miss. For ye so kindly the other day lent me gold, and as I can and may, I thank a you by God and by St. James. But nevertheless, I took unto our dame, your wife at home, the same gold again. Upon your bench she wot it well, certain, by certain tokens that I can her tell. Now by your leave I may no longer dwell. Our abbot will out of this town anon, and in his company I must gone. Greet well our dame, mine own niece sweet, and farewell, dear cousin, till we meet. This merchant, which that was full bare and wise, creanced hath and paid eke in Paris to certain Lombards ready in their hond the sum of gold and got of them his bond. And home he went, merry as a popinjay, for well he knew he stood in such array that need as must he win in that voyage a thousand francs above all his costage. His wife full ready met him at the gate, as she was wont of old usage all gate. And all that night in Mirtha they beset, for he was rich and clearly out of debt. When it was day the merchant gan embrace, his wife all knew, and kissed her in her face, and up he went and make it full tough. No more, quoth she, by God ye have enough. And wantonly again with him she played, till at the last this merchant to her said, by God, quoth he, I am a little wroth with you, my wife, although it be me loth. And what you why? By God, as that I guess, that ye have made a manner strangeness betwixt me and my cousin Dan John. You should have warned me, ere I had gone, that he you had a hundred francs paid by ready token. He had him evil a paid, for that I to him spake of chevesance, he seemed so as by his countenance. But nevertheless, by God of heaven, King, I thought to not to ask him of no thing. I pray thee, wife, do thou no more so. Tell me alway, ere that I from thee go, if any debtor hath in mine absence, ye payed thee, lest through thy negligence I might him ask a thing that he hath paid. This wife was not afeard nor afraid, but boldly she said, and that anon, Mary, I defy that false monk Dan John. I keep not of his tokens, never a deal. He took me certain gold, I wot it well. What? Evil thedom of his monk's snout. For, got it wot, I weened without a doubt that he had given it me because of you to do therewith mine honor and my prow. For cousinage and eke for belly cheer that he hath had full often here. But since I see I stand in such disjoint, I will answer you shortly to the point. You have more slack of debtors than am I, for I will pay you well and readily from day to day, and if so be I fail, I am your wife, scored upon my tail. And I shall pay as soon as ever I may, for by my troth I have on mine array, and not in waste bestowed at every deal. And for I have bestowed it so well, for your honor, for God's sake, I say, as be not wroth, but let us laugh and play. You shall my jolly body have to wed, by God I will not pay you but in bed. Forgive it me, mine Owen spouse dear, turn hitherward and make better cheer. The merchant saw none other remedy, as for to chide, it were but a folly, since that the thing might not amended be. Now, wife, he said, and I forgive it thee, but by thy life be no more so large. Keep better my good, this give I thee in charge. Thus endeth now my tailor, and God us send, tailing enough until our life is end. End of section 22, read by Bryce Cries, Ohio.
Section 23 of the Canterbury Tales and Other Poems. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Cat Sadler. The Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer. The Prioress's Tale. The Prologue. Well said by Corpus Domini, quoth our host. Now long mayest thou sail by the coast, thou gentle master, gentle mariner. God give the monk a thousand last quadir. Aha, fellows, beware of such a jape. The monk put in the man's hood an ape, and in his wife's eke by St. Austin. Draw no monkeys more into your inn. But now pass over, and let us seek about, who shall now tell first of all this rout another tale. And with that word he said, as courteously as it had been a maid, my lady prioress, by your leave, so that I wist I should you not grieve, I would deem that ye tell should a tale next, if so were that ye would. Now will ye vouchsafe, my lady dear, gladly, quoth she, and said as ye shall hear. O Lord, our Lord, thy name how marvellous is in this large world is spread, quoth she. For not only thy laud precious praise performed is by men of high degree, but by the mouth of children thy bounty performed is, for on the breast sucking sometimes show they thy herring. Wherefore in laud, as I best can or may, of thee and of the white lily flower, which that thee bear, and is a maid alway, to tell a story I will do my labor, not that I may increase her honor, for she herself is honor and root of bounty next her son and soul's boot. O mother maid, O maid and mother free, O bush unburnt burning in Moses' sight That ravished down from the deity, Through thy humbleness the ghost that in thee light Of whose virtue when he thine heart light, Conceived was the father's sapience, Help me to tell it to thy reverence. Lady, thy bounty, thy magnificence, Thy virtue and thy great humility, There may no tongue express in no science, for sometimes, lady, ere men pray to thee, thou goest before of thy benignity, and get us the light through thy prayer, to guide in us unto thine son so dear. My cunning is so weak, O blissful queen, for to declare thy great worthiness, that I may not sustain the weight of it sustain. But as a child of twelve month old or less, I can unthess any word express. Right so fair I, and therefore I, you pray, guide my song that I shall of you say. There was in Asia, in a great city, amongst Christian folk, a Jewry, sustained by a lord of that country, for foul usher and lucre of villainy, hateful to Christ and to his company. And through the street men might ride and wend, for it was free and open at each end. A little school of Christian folk there stood, down at the farther end, in which there were children in heap become of Christian blood, that learned in that school year by year such manner doctrine as men used there. This is to say, to sing in and read, as small children do in their childhood. Among these children was a widow's son, a little clergyman, seven year of age, that day by day to scale was his one, and eke also where so he saw the image of Christ's mother. He had in usage, as him was taught, to kneel adown and say Ave Maria as he went by the way. Thus had this widow her little son he taught, our blissful lady, Christ's mother dear, to worship I, and he forgot it not. For Sally child will always soon leer, but I, when I remember on this matter, St. Nicholas stands ever in my presence, for he so young to Christ did reverence. This little child his little book learning, as he sat in school at his premier, he Alma Redemptorus heard sing, as children learned their antiphonier. And as he durst, he drew him near and near, and hearkened I the words and the note, till he the first verse knew all by rote. Not wist he what this Latin was to say, for he so young and tender was of age. But on a day his fellow gone he pray, to expound him this song in his language, or tell him why this song was in usage. This prayed he to construe and declare, for oftentime upon his knees bare. His fellow, which that elder was than he, answered him thus, This song I have heard say was made of our blissful lady free, her to salute and eke her to pray to be our help and succor when we day. I can no more expound in this matter. I learn song, I know, but small grammar. 
"'And is this song ye made in reverence of Christ's mother?' said this innocent. "'Now certes I will to do my diligence to con it all, ere Christmas be went, "'though that I for my primer shall be shent, and shall be beaten thrice in an hour, "'I will con it, our lady, to honour. "'His fellow taught him homeward privily from day to day, till he could it by rote, "'and then he sang it well and boldly from word to word according with the note.' Twice in a day it passed through his throat, to schoolward and homeward when he went, on Christ's mother was set all his intent. As I have said, throughout the Jewry this little child, as he came to and fro, full merrily then would he sing and cry, O Alma Redemptoris Evamo! The sweetness hath his heart pierced so of Christ's mother, that to her to pray he cannot stint of singing by the way. Our first foe, the serpent Santinus, that hath in Jew's heart his wasp nest, upswelled and said, O Hebrew people, alas! Is this to you a thing that is honest, that such a boy shall waken as him lest, in your despite and sing of such sentence which is against your law's reverence? From thenceforth the Jews have conspired this innocent out of the world to chase. A homicide thereto have they hired, that in an alley had a privy place. And as the child gan forth by four to pace, this cursed Jew him hent and held him fast, and cut his throat and in a pit him cast. I say that in a wardrobe he him threw, whereas the Jews purged their entrail, O cursed folk, or Herodotus all knew. What may your evil intent you avail? Murder will out, certain it will not fail. And namely where the honour of God shall spread, the blood out crieth on your cursed deed. O martyr sounded to virginity, now mayest thou sing and follow ever in one the white lamb celestial, quoth she, of which the great evangelist St. John in Patmos wrote, which saith that they that gone before this lamb and sing a song all knew that never fleshly woman they ne knew. This poor widow waited all that night for her little child, but came he not, for which as soon as it was day's light with face pale in dread and busy thought, she hath at school and elsewhere him sought, till finally she gan so far a spy that he was last seen in the drury. With mother's pity in her breast and clothes she went, as she were half out of her mind, to every place where she hath supposed, by likelihood her little child to find, and ever on Christ's mother meek and kind she cried, and at the last thus she wrought among the cursed Jews she him sought. She frained and she prayed piteously to every Jew that dwelled in that place, to tell her if her child went thereby. They said nay, but Jesus, of his grace, gave in her thought within a little space, that in the place after her son she cried, where he was cast into a pit beside. O great God that performest thy laud by mouth of innocence, lo, hear thy might! This gem of chastity, this emerald, an Eek of martyrdom the ruby bright, where he with throaty a cavern lay upright. He Alma Redemptoris gan to sing, so loud that all the place began to ring. Christian folk, that through the street went, in came, for to wonder on this thing, and hastily they for the provost sent. He came anon without tarrying, and harried Christ, that is of heaven king, and eke his mother honour of mankind, and after that the Jews let he bind. Therefore with horses wild he did them draw, and after that he hung them by the law. The child, with piteous lamentation, was taken up singing his song away, and with honour and great procession they carry him unto the next abbey. His mother swooning by the bier lay, and thus might the people that were there this new Rachel bring from his bier. Upon his bier lay this innocent, before the altar while the mass is last, and, after that, the abbot with his convent have sped them for to bury him full fast. And when the holy water on him cast, yet spake this child when sprinkled was the water, and sang, O Alma Redemptoris Mater. This abbot, which that was a holy man, as monks be, or else ought to be, this young child to conjure he began. This abbot, which was a holy man, as monks be, or else ought to be, this young child to conjure he began, and said, O dear child, I halls thee, in virtue of the Holy Trinity, tell me what is thy cause for to sing, since that thy throat is cut to my seeming. My throat is cut unto my neck-bone, said this child, and, as by way of kind, I should have died, yea, long time agone. But Jesus Christ, as ye in books find, 
will that his glory last and be in mind and for the worship of his mother dear yet i may sing o alma loud and clear this well of mercy christ's mother sweet i loved away after my cunning and when i my life should forlet to me she came and bade me for to sing this anthem verily in my dying as ye have heard and when that i had sung me thought she laid a grain upon my tongue wherefore i sing and sing i must certain in honour of that blissful maiden free till from my tongue oft taken is the grain and after that thus said she to me my little child then will i fetch thee when that the grain is from thy tongue take be not aghast i will thee not forsake this holy monk this abbot him mean i his tongue out caught and took away the grain and he gave up the ghost full softly and when this abbot had this wonder seen his salt tears trickled down as rain and groff he fell all flat upon the ground and still he lay as he had been abound the convent lay eke on the pavement weeping and harrying christ's mother dear and after that they rose and forth they went and took away this martyr from his bier and in a tomb of marble stones clear enclosed they his little body sweet where he is now god lean us for to meet o young hugh of lincoln slain also with cursed jews as it is notable for it is but a little while ago pray eke for us we sinful folk unstable that of his mercy god so merciable on us his great mercy multiply for reverence of his mother mary end of section twenty three Section 24 of the Canterbury Tales and Other Poems. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer. Chaucer's Tale of Sir Topas. The Prologue. When said was this miracle, every man as sober was, that wonder was to see, till that our host to Japan he began, and then at erst he looked upon me, and said of thus, What man art thou? quoth he. Thou lookest as thou wouldest find an hare, for ever on the ground I see thee stare. Approach anear, and look up merrily. Now where you, sirs, and let this man have place. He in the waist is shapen as well as I, this were a puppet in an arm to embrace, for any woman small and fair of face. He seemeth elvish by his countenance, for unto no white doth he dalliance. Say now somewhat, since other folk have said, tell us a tale of mirth, and that anon. Hosta, quoth I, be not evil apaid, for other tales certes can I none, but of a rhyme I learned your agone. Yea, that is good, quoth he. Now shall we hear some dainty thing, methinketh, by thy cheer. The tailor. The first fit. Listen, lordings, in good intent, and I will tell you verament of mirth and of solace. All of a knight was fair and gent in battle and in tournament. His name was Sir Topas. Ye born he was in far country, in Flanders, all beyond the sea at poppering in the place. His father was a man full free, and lord he was of that country, as it was God's grace. Sir Topas was a doughty swain, white was his face as pandemain, his lip is red as rose, his rhoda is like scarlet in grain, and I tell you in good certain he had a seemly nose. His hair, his beard, was like saffron, that to his girdle reached a down, his shoes of corduroy, a bruja were his hosen brown, his robe was of cyclatoon that cost him many a jane. He could a hunt at the wild deer and ride on hawking for revere, with grey goshawk on hand. There too he was a good archer. Of wrestling was there none his peer where any ram should stand. Full many a maiden bright in bower, they mourned for him par amar, when them were better sleep. But he was chaste and no leecher, and sweet as is the bramble flower that beareth the red heap. 
And so it fell upon a day, forsooth as I you tell him a, Sir Topas would outride. He worth upon his steed a gray, and in his hand a lancegay, a long sword by his side. He pricked through a fair forest, wherein is many a wild a beast, yea, both a buck and hare, and as he pricked north and east, I tell it you, him had almost betid a sorry care. There sprang herbis great and small, the licorice and the setawall, and many a clove gilofre, and nutmeg to put in ale, whether it be moist or stale, or for to lay in coffer. The bird a sang, it is no nay, the spearhawk and the popinjay, that joy it was to hear. The throstle cock made eke his lay, the wood a dove upon the spray, she sang full loud and clear. Sir Topas fell in love longing, all when he heard the throstle sing, and pricked as he were wood. His fairest steed and his pricking were mad, so sweated that men might him ring, his sides were all blood. Sir Topas eke so weary was, for pricking on the softer grass, so fierce was his courage, that down he laid him in that place, to make his steed some solace, and give him good forage. Ah, St. Mary Bendicite, what aileth Thilka love at me, to bind of me so sore? Me dreamed all this night, pardy, an elf queen shall my lemon be, and sleep under my gore. An elf queen will I love you, is, for in this world no woman is, worthy to be my make in town. All other women I forsake, and to an elf queen I me take, by dale and eke by down. Into his saddle he clomen on, and prick it over stile and stone, an elf queen for to spy, till he so long had ridden and gone, that he found in our privy wan, the country of fairy so wild. For in that country was there none, that to him durst ride or gone, neither wife nor child. Till that there came a great giant, his name was Sir Oliphant, a perilous man of deed. He said a child by Termagant, but if thou prick out of mine haunt, anon I slay thy steed with mace. Here is the queen of fairy, with harp and pipe and symphony, dwelling in this place. The child said, Also may I thee, tomorrow will I meet a thee, when I have mine armor, and yet I hope, par ma fay, that thou shalt with this lancegay, abeyant in full sore, thy maw shall I pierce, if I may, ere it be fully prime of day, for here thou shalt be slaw. Sir Topas drew her back full fast, this giant at him stone is cast, out of a fell staff sling. But fair escape child Topas, and all it was through God's grace, and through his fair bearing. Yet listen, lordings, to my tailor, merrier than the nightingale, for now I will you round, how Sir Topas, with Sidus Smala, pricking over hill and dale, is come again to town. His merry men commanded he to make him both game and glee, for needes must he fight with a giant with head as three, for paramour and jollity of one that shone full bright. Do come, he said, uh, any minstrales, any jesters for to tell a tales, anon in mine arming, of romances that be royals, of popes and of cardinals, and eke of love longing. They fetched him first a sweet a wine, and mead eke in a masoline, and royal spicery of maple wood, of gingerbread that was full fine, and licorice and eke cumin with sugar that is tree. He did annexed his white leer of cloth of lake fine and clear, a breech and eke a shirt, and next his shirt a hackaton, and over that a habergion for piercing of his heart. And over that a fine hauberk was all you wrought of Jewish work, full strong it was of plate, and over that his coat armor, as white as is the lily flower, in which he would debate. His shield was all of gold so red, and therein was a boar's head, a charbuckle beside, and there he swore on ale and bread, 
how that the giant should be dead, betide what so betide. His jambos were of curbrily, his swordless sheath of ivory, his helm of latoon bright, his saddle was of rule, his bridle as the sun is shown, or as the moonlight. His spear was of fine cypress, that bodeth war and nothing peace, the head full sharp your ground. His steed was all dapple gray, it went an amble in the way, full softly and round in land. Lo, Lord is mine, here is a fit, if you will any more of it, to tell it will I fand. The second fit. Now hold your mouth for charity, both a knight and lady free, and hearken to my spell, of battle and of chivalry, of ladies love and drury, anon I will you tell. Men speak of romances of price, of horn child and of ipotis, of Bevis and Sir Guy, of Sir Lebeau and Flindemore, but Sir Topas he bears the flower of royal chivalry. His good steed he all bestrode, and forth upon his way he glowed as sparkle out of brand. Upon his crest he bare a tower, and therein sticked a lily flower, God shield his course from shand. And, for he was a knight entress, he would a sleepin in none house, but liggin in his hood. His bright a helm was his wanger, and by him baited his distrair of herbus fine and good. Himself drank water of the well, as did the knight Sir Percival, so worthy under weed. Till on a day, end of section 24, read by Bride's Cries, Ohio. Section 25 of the Canterbury Tales and Other Poems. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer. Chaucer's Tale of Melibius. The Prologue. No more of this, for God is dignity, quoth our hosta, for thou makest me so weary of thy very lewdness, that all so wisly God my soul bless, mine ears ache for thy drafty speech. Now such a rhyme the devil I beteach, this may well be rhyme doggerel, quoth he. Why so, quoth I? Why wilt thou let to me more of my tailor than any other man, since that it is the best rhyme that I can? By God, quoth he, for plainly at one word, thy drafty rhyming is not worth a turd. Thou dost not ellis but to spendest time. Sir, at one word thou shalt no longer rhyme. Let's see whether thou canst tell an aught in jest, or tell in prose somewhat, at the least, narrative, in which there be some mirth or some doctrine. Gladly, quoth I, by God as sweet to pine, I will you tell a little thing in prose that ought to like you, as I suppose, or else certes you be too dangerous. It is a moral tale of virtuous, albeit told sometimes in sundry wise by sundry folk, as I shall you devise. As thus you ought that every evangelist that telleth us the pain of Jesus Christ, he saith not all thing as his fellow doth, but nevertheless their sentence is all soth, and all accordin' as in their sentence, all be there in their telling difference. For some of them say more, and some say less, when they his piteous passion express. I mean of Mark and Matthew, Luke and John, but doubtless their sentence is all one. Therefore, lordings all, I you beseech, if that you think I vary in my speech, as thus, though I tell us some deal more of proverbs that ye have heard before, comprehended in this little treatise here, to enforce with the effect of my matter, as though I not the same word as say, as you have heard, yet to you all I pray, blame me not, for as in my sentence shall ye nowhere find it no difference from the sentence of Thilka treatise late. 
after the which this merry tale I write, and therefore hearken to what I shall say, and let me tell in all my tale, I pray. The Tale A young man called Melibius, mighty and rich, begat upon his wife, that called was Prudence, a daughter which that called was Sophia. Upon a day befell, that he for his disport went into the fields him to play. His wife and eke his daughter hath he left within his house, of which the doors were fast shut. Three of his old foes have it espied, and set ladders to the walls of his house, and by the windows be entered, and beaten his wife, and wounded his daughter, with five mortal wounds in five sundry places, that is to say, in her feet, in her hands, in her ears, in her nose, and in her mouth, and left her for dead, and went away. When Melibius returned was into his house, and saw all this mischief, he, like a man mad, rending his clothes, gan weep and cry. Prudence his wife, as far forth as she durst, besought him of his weeping for to stint. But not forthy, he gan to weep and cry ever longer the more. This noble wife Prudence remembered her upon the sentence of Ovid, in his book that called is the remedy of love, where he saith, He is a fool that disturbeth the mother to weep in the death of her child, till she have wept her fill, as for a certain time, and then shall a man do his diligence with amiable words her to recomfort, and pray her ever weeping for to stint. For which reason this noble wife Prudence suffered her husband for to weep and cry, as for a certain space, and when she saw her time, she said to him in this wise, Alas, my lord, quoth she, why make ye yourself for to be like a fool? Forsooth it appertaineth not to a wise man to make such a sorrow. Your daughter, with the grace of God, shall warish and escape. And all were it so that she right now were dead, ye ought not for her death yourself to destroy. Seneca saith, The wise man shall not take too great discomfort for the death of his children, but certes he should suffer it in patience, as well as he abideth the death of his own proper person. Melibius answered anon, and said, What man, quoth he, should of his weeping stint, that hath so great a cause to weep? Jesus Christ our Lord himself wept for the death of Lazarus his friend. Prudence answered, Search as well I wot, a tempered weeping is nothing defended to him that sorrowful is, among folk in sorrow, but it is rather granted him to weep. The Apostle Paul unto the Romans writeth, Man shall rejoice with them that make joy, and weep with such folk as weep. But though temporal weeping be granted, outrageous weeping certes is defended. Measure of weeping should be conserved after the lore that teacheth us Seneca. When that thy friend is dead, quoth he, let not thine eyes too moist be of tears, nor too much dry. Although the tears come to thine eyes, let them not fall. And when thou hast forgotten thy friend, do diligence to get again another friend. And this is more wisdom than to weep for thy friend which that thou hast lorn, for therein is no boot. And therefore, if you govern you by sapience, put away sorrow out of your heart. Remember you that Jesus Sirach saith, A man that is joyous and glad in heart, it him conserveth flourishing in his age. But soothly a sorrowful heart maketh his bones dry. He said eke thus, That sorrow in heart slayeth full many a man. Solomon saith, That right as moths in the sheep's fleece annoy to the clothes, And the small worms to the tree, Right so annoyeth sorrow to the heart of man. Wherefore us ought as well in the death of our children, As in the loss of our goods temporal, have patience. Remember you upon the patient Job, when he had lost his children and his temporal substance, and in his body endured and received full many a grievous tribulation, yet said he thus, Our Lord hath given it to me, our Lord hath bereft it me, right as our Lord would, right so be it done. Blessed be the name of our Lord. To these foresaid things answered Melibius unto his wife Prudence. All thy words, quoth he, 
be true and therefore profitable, but truly mine heart is troubled with this sorrow so grievously that I know not what to do. Let call, quoth Prudence, thy true friends all, and thy lineage, which be wise, and tell to them your case, and hearken what they say in counseling, and govern you after their sentence. Solomon saith, Work all things by counsel, and thou shalt never repent. Then by counsel of his wife Prudence, this Melibius let call a great congregation of folk, as surgeons, physicians, old folk and young, and some of his old enemies reconciled, as by their semblance, to his love and to his grace, and therewithal there come some of his neighbors that did him reverence more for dread than for love, as happeneth oft. There came also full many subtle flatterers and wise advocates learned in the law. And when these folks together assembled were, this Melibius in sorrowful wise showed them his case, and by the manner of his speech it seemed that in his heart he bare a cruel ire, ready to do vengeance upon his foes, and suddenly desired that the war should begin, but nevertheless yet asked he their counsel in this matter. A surgeon by license and a son of such as were wise uprose, and to Melibius said, as you may hear, Sir, quoth he, as to us surgeons appertaineth, that we do every wight the best that we can, whereas we be withholden, and to our patient that we do no damage, wherefore it happeneth many a time and oft, that when two men have wounded each other, one same surgeon healeth them both. Wherefore unto our art it is not pertinent to nurse war, nor parties to support. But certes, as to the warishing of your daughter, albeit that so perilously she be wounded, we shall do so attentive business from day to night, that, with the grace of God, she shall be whole and sound as soon as is possible. Almost right in the same wise the physicians answered, save that they said a few words more that right as maladies be cured by their contraries, right so shall man warish war by peace. His neighbors, full of envy, his feigned friends that seemed reconciled, and his flatterers made semblance of weeping, and impaired and agreed much of this matter, in praising greatly Melibius of might, of power, of riches, and of friends despising the power of his adversaries, and said utterly that he anon should wreak him on his foes and begin war. Up rose then an advocate that was wise, by leave and by counsel of other that were wise, and said, Lordings, the need for which we be assembled in this place is a full heavy thing and an high matter because of the wrong and of the wickedness that hath been done, and eke by reason of the great damages that in time coming be possible to fall for the same cause, and eke by reason of the great riches and power of the parties both, for which reasons it were a full great peril to err in this matter. Wherefore, Melibius, this is our sentence, we counsel you, above all things, that right anon thou do thy diligence in keeping of thy body, in such a wise that thou want no espy nor watch thy body to save. And after that we counsel that in thine house thou set sufficient garrison, so that they may as well thy body as thy house defend. But certes, to move war or suddenly to do vengeance, we may not deem in so little time that it were profitable. Wherefore we ask leisure and space to have deliberation in this case to deem, for the common proverb say thus, he that soon deemeth soon shall repent. And eke men say that that judge is wise, that soon understandeth the matter, and judgeth by leisure. For albeit so, that all tarrying be annoying, all gates it is no reproof, in giving of judgment, nor in vengeance taking, when it is sufficient and reasonable. And that showed our Lord Jesus Christ by example, for when that the woman that was taken in adultery was brought in his presence to know what should be done with her person, albeit that he wist well himself when he would answer, yet would he not answer suddenly, but he would have deliberation, and in the ground he wrote twice. 
and by these causes we ask deliberation, and we shall then, by the grace of God, counsel the thing that shall be profitable. Up started then the young folk, and on at once, and the most part of that company have scorned these old wise men, and begun to make noise, and said, Right as well that iron is hot, men should smite. Right so men should break their wrongs, while that they be fresh and new. And with loud voice they cried, War, war! Up rose in one of these old wise, and with his hand made continence, that men should hold them still, and give him audience. Lordings, quoth he, there is full many a man that crieth, War, war! that wot full little what war amounteth. War at his beginning hath so great an entering, and so large, that every white may enter when him liketh, and lightly find war. But certes, what end shall fall thereof is not light to know. For soothly, when war is once begun, there is full many a child unborn of his mother, that shall starve young by cause of that war, or else live in sorrow and die in wretchedness. And therefore, ere that any war be begun, men must have great counsel and great deliberation. And when this old man weaned to enforce his tale by reasons, well nigh all at once began they to rise for to break his tail, and bid him full oft his words abridge. Forsoothly he that preaches to them that list not hear his words, his sermon them annoyeth. For Jesus Sirach saith, that music and weeping is a noyous thing. This is to say, as much availeth to speak before folk to whom his speech annoyeth, as to sing before him that weepeth. And when this wise man saw that him wanted audience, all shamefast he sat him down again. For Solomon saith, Whereas thou mayest have no audience, and force thee not to speak. I see well, quoth this wise man, that the common proverb is sooth, that good counsel wanteth when it is most need. Yet had this Melibius in his counsel many folk, that privily in his ear counseled him certain thing, and counseled him the contrary in general audience. When Melibius had heard that the greatest part of his counsel were accorded, that he should make war, anon he consented to their counseling, and fully affirmed their sentence. Dame Prudence, seeing her husband's resolution thus taken, in full humble wise, when she saw her time, begins to counsel him against war, by a warning against haste and requital of either good or evil. Melibius tells her that he will not work by her counsel, because he should be held a fool if he rejected for her advice the opinion of so many wise men, because all women are bad, because it would seem that he had given her the mastery over him, and because she could not keep his secret if he resolved to follow her advice. To these reasons Prudence answers that it is no folly to change counsel when things, or men's judgments of them, change, especially to alter a resolution taken on the impulse of a great multitude of folk, where every man crieth and clattereth what him liketh, that if all women had been wicked, Jesus Christ would never have descended to be born of a woman, nor have showed himself first to a woman after his resurrection, and that when Solomon said he had found no good woman, he meant that God alone was supremely good, that her husband would not seem to give her the mastery by following her counsel, for he had his own free choice in following or rejecting it, and that he knew well he had often tested her great silence, patience, and secrecy. And whereas he had quoted a saying that in wicked counsel women vanquish men, she reminds him that she would counsel him against doing a wickedness on which he had set his mind, and cites instances to show that many women have been and yet are full good, and their counsel wholesome and profitable. Lastly, she quotes the words of God himself when he was about to make woman as an help meet for man, and promises that, if her husband will trust her counsel, she will restore to him his daughter whole and sound, and make him have honor in this case. Melibius answers that because of his wife's sweet words, and also because he has proved and essayed her great wisdom and her great truth, he will govern him by her counsel in all things. 
Thus encouraged, Prudence enters on a long discourse full of learned citations regarding the manner in which counselors should be chosen and consulted and the times and reasons for changing a counsel. First, God must be sought for guidance. Then a man must well examine his own thoughts of such things as he holds to be best for his own profit, driving out of his heart anger, covetousness, and hastiness, which perturb and pervert the judgment. Then he must keep his counsel secret, unless confiding it to another shall be more profitable. But in so confiding it, he shall say nothing to bias the mind of the counselor toward flattery or subserviency. After that, he should consider his friends and his enemies, choosing of the former such as be most faithful and wise, and eldest and most approved in counseling, and even of these only a few. Then he must eschew the counseling of fools, of flatterers, of his old enemies that be reconciled, of servants who bear him great reverence and fear, of folk that be drunken and can hide no counsel, of such as counsel one thing privily and the contrary openly, and of young folk, for their counseling is not ripe. Then in examining his counsel, he must truly tell his tale. He must consider whether the thing he proposes to do be reasonable within his power and acceptable to the more part and better part of his counselors. He must look at the things that may follow from that counseling, choosing the best and waiving all besides. He must consider the root whence the matter of his counsel is engendered, what fruits it may bear, and from what causes they be sprung. And having thus examined his counsel and approved it by many wise folk and old, he shall consider if he may perform it and make of it a good end. If he be in doubt, he shall choose rather to suffer than to begin. But otherwise he shall prosecute his resolution steadfastly till the enterprise be at an end. As to changing his counsel, a man may do so without reproach if the cause cease or when a new cause betides, or if he find that by error or otherwise harm or damage may result, or if his counsel be dishonest or come of dishonest cause, or if it be impossible or may not properly be kept. And he must take it for a general rule that every counsel which is affirmed so strongly that it may not be changed for any condition that may be tied, that counsel is wicked. Melibius, admitting that his wife had spoken well and suitably as to counselors and counsel in general, prays her to tell him in especial what she thinks of the counselors whom they have chosen in their present need. Prudence replies that his counsel in this case could not properly be called a counseling, but a movement of folly, and points out that he has erred in sundry wise against the rules which he had just laid down. Granting that he has erred, Melibius says that he is all ready to change his counsel right as she will devise. For, as a proverb runs, to do sin is human, but to persevere long in sin is work of the devil. Prudence then minutely recites, analyzes, and criticizes the counsel given to her husband in the assembly of his friends. She commends the advice of the physicians and surgeons, and urges that they should be well rewarded for their noble speech and their services in healing Sophia. And she asks Melibius how he understands their proposition that one contrary must be cured by another contrary. Melibius answers that he should do vengeance on his enemies who had done him wrong. Prudence, however, insists that vengeance is not the contrary of vengeance, nor wrong of wrong, but the like, and that wickedness should be healed by goodness, discord by accord, war by peace. She proceeds to deal with the counsel of the lawyers and wise folk that advise Melibius to take prudent measures for the security of his body and of his house. First she would have her husband pray for the protection and aid of Christ, then commit the keeping of his person to his true friends, then suspect and avoid all strange folk and liars and such people as she had already warned him against, then beware of presuming on his strength or the weakness of his adversary and neglecting to guard his person. For every wise man dreadeth his enemy. Then he should evermore be on the watch against ambush and all espial, even in what seems a place of safety. Though he should not be so cowardly as to fear where is no cause for dread, 
yet he should dread to be poisoned and therefore shun scorners and fly their words as venom. As to the fortification of his house, she points out that towers and great edifices are costly and laborious, yet useless unless defended by true friends that be old and wise, and the greatest and strongest garrison that a rich man may have, as well to keep his person as his goods, is that he be beloved by his subjects and by his neighbors. Warmly approving the counsel that in all this business Melibius should proceed with great diligence and deliberation, Prudence goes on to examine the advice given by his neighbors that do him reverence without love, his old enemies reconciled, his flatterers that counseled him certain things privily and openly counseled him the contrary, and the young folk that counseled him to avenge himself and make war at once. She reminds him that he stands alone against three powerful enemies, whose kindred are numerous and close, while his are fewer and remote in relationship. That only the judge who has jurisdiction in a case may take sudden vengeance on any man, that her husband's power does not accord with his desire, and that, if he did take vengeance, it would only breed fresh wrongs and contests. As to the causes of the wrong done to him, she holds that God, the causer of all things, has permitted him to suffer because he has drunk too much honey of sweet temporal riches and delights and honors of this world, that he is drunken and has forgotten Jesus Christ his Savior. The three enemies of mankind, the flesh, the fiend, and the world, have entered his heart by the windows of his body and wounded his soul in five places. That is to say, the deadly sins that have entered into his heart by the five senses. And in the same manner, Christ has suffered his three enemies to enter his house by the windows and wound his daughter in the five places before specified. Melibius demurs that if his wife's objections prevailed, Vengeance would never be taken, and thence great mischiefs would arise. But Prudence replies that the taking of vengeance lies with the judges, to whom the private individual must have recourse. Melibius declares that such vengeance does not please him, and that, as fortune has nourished and helped him from his childhood, he would now assay her, trusting with God's help, that she will aid him to avenge his shame. Prudence warns him against trusting to fortune, all the less because she has hitherto favored him, for just on that account she is the more likely to fail him. And she calls on him to leave his vengeance with the sovereign judge that avengeth all villainies and wrongs. Melibius argues that if he refrains from taking vengeance, he will invite his enemies to do him further wrong, and he will be put and held over low. But Prudence contends that such a result can be sought only by the neglect of the judges, not by the patience of the individual. Supposing that he had leave to avenge himself, she repeats that he is not strong enough and quotes the common saw that it is madness for a man to strive with a stronger than himself, peril to strive with one of equal strength, and folly to strive with a weaker. But, considering his own defaults and demerits, remembering the patience of Christ and the undeserved tribulations of the saints, the brevity of this life with all its trouble and sorrow, the discredit thrown on the wisdom and training of a man who cannot bear wrong with patience, he should refrain wholly from taking vengeance. Melibius submits that he is not at all a perfect man, and his heart will never be at peace until he is avenged and that as his enemies disregarded the peril when they attacked him, so he might, without reproach, incur some peril in attacking them in return, even though he did a great excess in avenging one wrong by another. Prudence strongly deprecates all outrage or excess, but Melibius insists that he cannot see that it might greatly harm him though he took a vengeance, for he is richer and mightier than his enemies, and all things obey money. Prudence thereupon launches into a long dissertation on the advantages of riches, the evils of poverty, the means by which wealth should be gathered, and the manner in which it should be used, and concludes by counseling her husband not to move war and battle through trust in his riches, for they suffice not to maintain war, the battle is not always to the strong or the numerous, and the perils of conflict are many. Melibius then curtly asks her for her counsel how he shall do in this need. 
and she answers that certainly she counsels him to agree with his adversaries and have peace with them. Melibius on this cries out that plainly she loves not his honor or his worship in counseling him to go and humble himself before his enemies, crying mercy to them that, having done him so grievous wrong, ask him not to be reconciled. Then Prudence, making semblance of wrath, retorts that she loves his honor and profit as she loves her own, and ever has done, she cites the scriptures in support of her counsel to seek peace, and says she will leave him to his own courses, for she knows well he is so stubborn that he will do nothing for her. Melibius then relents, admits that he is angry and cannot judge her right, and puts himself wholly in her hands, promising to do just as she desires, and admitting that he is more the held to love and praise her if she reproves him of his folly. Then Dame Prudence discovered all her counsel and her will unto him, and said, I counsel you, quoth she, above all things, that you make peace between God and you, and be reconciled unto him and to his grace. For, as I have said to you here before, God hath suffered you to have this tribulation and disease for your sins, and if you do as I say you, God will send your adversaries unto you, and make them fall at your feet, ready to do your will and your commandment. For Solomon saith, When the condition of man is pleasant and liking to God, he changeth the hearts of the man's adversaries, and constraineth them to beseech him of peace of grace. And I pray you let me speak with your adversaries in privy place, for they shall not know it is by your will or your assent, and then, when I know their will and their intent, I may counsel you the more surely. Dame, quoth Melibius, do your will and your liking, for I put me wholly in your disposition and ordinance. Then Dame Prudence, when she saw the good will of her husband, deliberated and took advice in herself, thinking how she might bring this need unto a good end. And when she saw her time, she sent for these adversaries to come into her into a privy place, and showed wisely unto them the great goods that come of peace, and the great harms and perils that be in war, and said to them, in goodly manner, how that they ought to have great repentance of the injuries and wrongs that they had done to Melibius her lord, and unto her and her daughter. And when they heard the goodly words of Dame Prudence, then they were surprised and ravished, and had so great joy of her, that wonder was to tell. Ah, lady, quoth they, ye have showed unto us the blessing of sweetness, after the saying of David the prophet, for the reconciling, which we be not worthy to have in no manner, but we ought require with great contrition and humility, ye of your great goodness have presented unto us. Now see we well that the science and conning of Solomon is full true, for he saith that sweet words multiply and increase friends, and make shrews to be debonair and meek. Certes, we put our deed, and all our matter and cause, all holy in your good will, and be ready to obey unto the speech and commandment of my lord Melibius. And therefore, dear and benign lady, we pray you and beseech you as meekly as we can and may, that it like unto your great goodness to fulfill indeed your goodly words. For we consider and acknowledge that we have offended and grieved my lord Melibius out of measure, so far forth that we be not of power to make him amends. And therefore we oblige and bind us and our friends to do all his will and his commandment. But peradventure he hath such heaviness and such wrath to usward, because of our offense, that he will enjoin us such a pain as we may not bear nor sustain. And therefore, noble lady, we beseech to your womanly pity to take such advisement in this need, that we, nor our friends, be not disinherited and destroyed through our folly. Certes, quoth Prudence, it is an hard thing and right perilous that a man put him all utterly in the arbitration and judgment and in the might and power of his enemy. For Solomon saith, Believe me, and give credence to that that I shall say, to thy son, to thy wife, to thy friend, nor to thy brother, give thou never might nor mastery over thy body, while thou livest. 
Now, since he defendeth that a man should not give to his brother, nor to his friend, the might of his body, by a stronger reason he defendeth and forbidden a man to give himself to his enemy. And nevertheless I counsel you that ye mistrust not my Lord, for I wot well and know verily that he is debonair and meek, large, courteous, and nothing desirous nor envious of good nor riches, for there is nothing in this world that he desireth save only worship and honor. Furthermore I know well, and am right sure, that he shall nothing do in this need without counsel of me, and I shall so work in this case, that by the grace of our Lord God you shall be reconciled unto us. Then said they with one voice, Worshipful lady, we put us and our goods all fully in your will and disposition, and be ready to come, what they that it like unto your nobleness, to limit us or assign us, for to make our obligation and bond, as strong as it liketh unto your goodness, that we may fulfill the will of you and of my lord Melibius. When Dave Prudence had heard the answer of these men, she bade them go again privily, and she returned to her lord Melibius, and told him how she found his adversaries full repentant, acknowledging full lowly their sins and trespasses, and how they were ready to suffer all pain, requiring and praying him of mercy and pity. Then said Melibius, He is well worthy to have pardon and forgiveness of his sin, that excuseth not his sin, but acknowledgeth and repenteth him, asking indulgence. For Seneca saith, There is the remission and forgiveness where the confession is, for confession is neighbor to innocence. And therefore I send and confirm me to have peace, but it is good that we do not without the assent and will of our friends. Then was Prudence right glad and joyful, and said, Certes, sir, ye be well and goodly advised, for right as by the counsel, assent, and help of your friends ye you have been stirred to avenge you and make war. Right so without their counsel shall ye not accord you, nor have peace with your adversaries. For the law saith, There is nothing so good by way of kind as a thing to be unbound by him that it was bound. And then Dame Prudence, without delay or tarrying, sent anon her messengers for their kin and for their old friends, which were true and wise, and told them by order, in the presence of Melibius, all this matter, as it is above expressed and declared, and prayed them that they would give their advice and counsel what were best to do in this need. And when Melibius's friends had taken their advice and deliberation of the aforesaid matter, and had examined it by great business and great diligence, they gave full counsel for to have peace and rest, and that Melibius should with good heart receive his adversaries to forgiveness and mercy. And when Dame Prudence had heard the assent of her lord Melibius, and the counsel of his friends, accord with her will and her intention, she was wondrous glad in her heart, and said, there is an old proverb that saith, The goodness that thou mayest do in this day, do it, and abide not, nor delay it, till tomorrow. And therefore I counsel you that ye send your messengers, such as be discreet and wise, unto your adversaries, telling them on your behalf, that if they will treat of peace and of accord, that they shape them, without delay or tarrying, to come unto us. Which thing performed was indeed, and when these trespassers and repenting folk of their follies, that is to say, the adversaries of Melibius, had heard what these messengers said unto them, they were right glad and joyful, and answered full meekly and benignly, yielding graces and thanks to their lord Melibius and to all his company, and shaped them without delay to go with the messengers and obey to the commandment of their lord Melibius. And right anon they took their way to the court of Melibius, and took with them some of their true friends to make faith for them, and for to be their borrows. And when they were come to the presence of Melibius, he said to them these words, It stands thus, quoth Melibius, and sooth it is, that ye causeless and without skill and reason have done great injuries and wrongs to me, and to my wife Prudence, and to my daughter also. For ye entered into my house by violence, and have done such outrage that all men know well that ye have deserved the death. And therefore will I know and weed of you 
whether you will put the punishing and chastising in the vengeance of this outrage in the will of me and of my wife, or you will not. Then the wisest of them three answered for them all and said, Sir, quoth he, you know well that we be I unworthy to come to the court of so great a lord and so worthy as ye be, for we have so greatly mistaken us and have offended and a guilt in such wise against your high lordship that truly we have deserved the death. But yet for the great goodness and debonairty that all the world witnesseth of your person, we submit us to the excellence and benignity of your gracious lordship and be ready to obey to all your commandments, beseeching you that of your merciful pity you will consider our great repentance and low submission and grant us forgiveness of our outrageous trespass and offense. For well we know that your liberal grace and mercy stretch them farther into goodness than do our outrageous guilt and trespass into wickedness, albeit that cursedly and damnably we have a guilt against your high lordship. Then Melibius took them up from the ground full benignly and received their obligations and their bonds by their oaths upon their pledges and borrows, and assigned them a certain day to return unto his court for to receive and accept sentence and judgment that Melibius would command to be done on them by the cause aforesaid, which things ordained every man returned home to his house. And when the Dame Prudence saw her time, she framed and asked her lord, Melibius, what vengeance he thought to take of his adversaries. To which Melibius answered and said, Certes, quoth he, I think and purpose me fully to disinherit them all that ever they have, and for to put them in exile for evermore. Certes, quoth Dame Prudence, this were a cruel sentence and much against reason. For ye be rich enough, and have no need of other men's goods, and ye might lightly in this wise get you a covetous name, which is a vicious thing, and ought to be eschewed of every good man. For after the saying of apostle, covetousness is root of all harms, and therefore it were better for you to lose much good of your own, than for to take of their good in this manner. For better it is to lose good with worship, than to win good with villainy and shame. And every man ought to do his diligence and his business to get him a good name. And yet shall he not only busy him in keeping his good name, but he shall also enforce him always to do something by which he may renew his good name. For it is written that the old good loss of a man is soon gone and past when it is not renewed. And as touching that ye say that ye will exile your adversaries that thinketh ye much against reason and out of measure, considering the power that they have given you upon themselves. And it is written that he is worthy to lose his privilege that misuseth the might and power that is given him. And I set case ye might enjoin them that pain by right and by law, which I trow ye may not do, I say, you might not put it to execution per adventure, and then it were like to return to the war as it was before. And therefore, if you will that men do you obeyance, you must deem more courteously, that is to say, you must give more easy sentences and judgments. For it is written, He that most courteously commandeth, to him men most obey. And therefore I pray you that in this necessity and in this need ye cast you to overcome your heart. For Seneca saith that he that overcometh his heart overcometh twice. And Tullius saith there is nothing so commendable in a great lord as when he is debonair and meek and appeaseth him lightly. And I pray you that you will now forbear to do vengeance in such manner that your good name may be kept and conserved and that men may have cause and matter to praise you of pity and of mercy, and that ye have no cause to repent you of thing that ye do. For Seneca saith, He overcometh in an evil manner that repenteth him of his victory. Wherefore I pray you let mercy be in your heart, to the effect and intent that God Almighty have mercy upon you in his last judgment. For St. James saith in his epistle, Judgment without mercy shall be done to him that hath no mercy of another white. 
When Melibius had heard the great skills and reasons of Dame Prudence and her wise information and teaching, his heart gained inclined to the will of his wife, considering her true intent, he conformed him anon and assented fully to work after her counsel, and thank God, of whom proceedeth all goodness and all virtue, that him sent a wife of so great discretion. And when the day came that his adversary should appear in his presence, he spake to them full goodly, and said in this wise, Albeit so, that of your pride and high presumption and folly, and of your negligence and unconning, ye have misborne you, and trespassed unto me, yet forasmuch as I see and behold your great humility, and that ye be sorry and repentant of your guilts, it constraineth me to do you grace and mercy. Wherefore I receive you into my grace, and forgive you utterly all the offenses, injuries, and wrongs that ye have done against me and mine, to this effect and to this end, that God of his endless mercy will at the time of our dying forgive us our guilts, that we have trespassed to him in this wretched world. For doubtless, if we be sorry and repentant of the sins and guilts which we have trespassed in the sight of our Lord God, he is so free and merciable that he will forgive us our guilts and bring us to the bliss that never hath end. Amen. End of section 25, read by Bryce Christ, Ohio. Section 26 of the Canterbury Tales and Other Poems. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by C. Rowley. The Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer. The Monk's Tale. The Prologue. When ended was my tale of Melibe, and of prudence and her benignity, our host said, as I am faithful man, and by the precious corpus matrian, I had lever than a barrel of ale, that good leaf my wife had heard this tell. For she is no thing of patience, as well this melevious wife prudence. By God's bones, when I beat mine ace, she bringeth me the great club staves, and crieth, Slay the dogs, every one, and break of them both back and every bone. And if that any neighbour of mine were not in church unto my wife inclined, I'll be so hardy to her to trespass. When she cometh home she rampeth in my face, and crieth, False coward, rick thy wife by corpus domini, and I will have thy knife, and thou shalt have my distaff, and go spin. From day till night, right thus she will begin. Alas, she saith, that ever I was shaped to wed a milksop, or a coward ape, that we be overlad with every one. Thou darest not stand by thy wife's right. This is my life, but if that I will fight, and out a door and none I must me dight, or else I am lost, but if that I be like a wild lion foolhardy, I wot well she will do me slay some day, some neighbour, and then go my way. For I am perilous with knife in hand, albeit that I dare not her withstand, for she is big in arms, by my faith, that shall he find that her miss doth or saith. But let us pass away from this matter. My lord, the monk, quoth he, be merry of cheer, for ye shall tell a tale truly. Lo, Rochester stands here fast by, ride forth, mine own lord, break not our game. But by my troth, I cannot tell your name. Whether shall I call you, my lord Dan John, or Dan Thomas, or Ellis Dan Albon? Of what house be ye by your father's kin? I vow to God, thou hast a full fair skin. It is a gentle pasture where thou goest. Thou art not like a pennant or a ghost. Upon my faith, thou art some officer, 
some worthy sexton or some cellarer, for by my father's soul as to my dome, thou art a master when thou art at home. No poor cloisterer, nor no novice, but a governor, both wily and wise. And therewithal of bronze and of bones, of right well in person for the nonce. I pray to God, give him confusion that first thee brought into religion. Thou wouldst have been a tread foul of right, hadst thou as great leave as thou hast might, to perform all thy lust in genderer. Thou hadst begotten many a creature. Alas, why wearest thou so wide a cap? God give me sorrow, but an I were pope, not only thou, but every mighty man, though he were shone full high upon his pan, should have a wife, for all this world is long. Religion hath taken up all the corn of treading, and we borrow men be shrimps of feeble trees, there come wretched imps. This maketh that our heiress be so slender and feeble, that they may not well engender. This maketh that our wives will assay religious folk, for they may better pay of Venus's payment is than may we. God wot no less bridges pay ye, but be not wroth, my lord, though that I play, full oft in game a sooth have I heard say. This worthy monk took all impatience, and said, I will do all my diligence, as far as soundeth unto honesty, to tell you a tale, or two, or three. And if you list to hearken hitherward, I will, you say, the life of St. Edward. Or else first tragedies I will tell, of which I have an hundred in my cell. Tragedy is to say a certain story, as old books make in us memory, of him that stood in great prosperity, and is he fallen out of high degree in misery, and endeth wretchedly, and they be versified commonly of six feet, which men call hexametron. In prose, ick be indicted many a one, and ick in metre in many a sundry wise. Lo, this declaring ought enough suffice. Now hearken, if ye like for to hear. But first I you beseech in this matter, though I by order tell not these things, be it of popes, emperors, or kings, after their ages, as men written find, but tell them some before, and some behind. As it now cometh to my remembrance, have me excused of mine ignorance. The Tale I will be well in manner of tragedy, the harm of them that stood in high degree, and fell so, that there was no remedy to bring them out of their adversity. For certain, when that fortune list to flee, there may no man the course of her will hold. Let no man trust in blind prosperity. Beware by these examples true and old. At Lucifer, though he an angel were, and not a man, at him I will begin. For though fortune may no angel dear, from high degree yet fell he for his sin down into hell, whereas he yet is in. O oh, Lucifer, brightest of angels all, now art thou Satanus, that mayest not twin out of the misery in which thou art fall. Lo, Adam, in the field of Damascene with God's own finger wrought was he, and not begotten of man's sperm unclean, and welt all paradise saving one tree. Had never worldly man so high degree as Adam, till he for misgovernance was driven out of his prosperity, to labour, and to hell, and to mischance. Lo, Samson, which that was enunciate by the angel long ere his nativity, and was to God Almighty consecrate, and stood in noblesse while that he might see, was never such another as was he to speak of strength, and thereto hardiness. 
but to his wives told he his secret, through which he slew himself for wretchedness. Samson, this noble and mighty champion, without weapon save his hands to weigh, he slew, and all to rent the lion, toward his wedding walking by the way. His false wife could him so please and pray till she his counsel knew, and she, untrue unto his foes, his counsel gan bewray, and him forsook, and took another new. Three hundred foxes Samson took for ire, and all their tails he together banned, and set the foxes' tails all on fire, for he in every tail had knit a brand, and they burnt all the combs of that land, and all their oliveres and vines eek. A thousand men he slew eek with his hands, and had no weapon but an ass's cheek. When they were slain, so thirsted him that he was well nigh lorn, for which he gan to pray that God would on his pain have some pity, and sent him drink, or else must he die. And of this ass's check that was so dry, out of a wang tooth sprang anon a well, of which he drank enough shortly to say. Thus helped him God, as Judicum can tell. By very force at Gaza on a night, Margara the Philistine of that city, the gates of the town he hath up light, and on his back he carried them, hath he high on a hill whereas men might them see. O oh, noble, mighty Samson, lafe and dear, hadst thou not told to women thy secret, in all this world there had not been thy peer. This Samson never cider drank nor wine, nor on his head came razor none nor shear, by precept of the messenger divine. For all his strength is in his hairs were, And fully twenty winters year by year He had of Israel the governance. But sooner shall he weep a many a tear, For women shall him bring a to mischance, Unto his Lemon Delilah he told, That in his hairs all his strength lay, And falsely to his foemen she him sold. And sleeping in her balmy, upon a day she made to clip or shear his hair away, and made his vomen all his craft espyen. And when they found him in this array, they bound him fast, and put out both his iron. But, ere his hair was clipped or his shave, there was no bond with which men might him bind. But now is he in prison in a cave, whereas they made him at the querne grind. O oh, noble Samson, strongest of mankind, O oh, Willem, judge in glory and riches, now mayest thou weep with thine eye and blind, since thou from will art fallen to wretchedness. The end of this caitiff was as I shall say, his foemen made a feast upon a day, and made him as their fool before them play. And this was in a temple of great array, but at the last he made a foul affray, for he two pillars shook, and made them fall, and down fell temple in all, and there it lay, and slew himself and eke his foemen all. This is to say the princes every one, and eke three thousand bodies were there slain with falling of the great temple of stone. Of Samson now will I no more sayin'. Beware by this example, old and plain, that no man tell his counsel to his wife of such thing as he would have secret fain, if that it touch his limbs or his life. Of Hercules, the sovereign conqueror, singe his workest land, and high renown, for in his time of strength he bare the flower, he slew and reft the skin of the lion, he of the centaurs laid the boasted down, he harpies slew, the cruel birds fell, he golden apples reft from the dragon, 
He drew out Cerberus, the hound of hell. He slew the cruel tyrant Busiris, and made his horse to fret him, flesh and bone. He slew the fiery serpent Venomous. Of Achilleus two horns break he one, and he slew Caucus in a cave of stone. He slew the giant Antaeus the strong. He slew the grisly boar, and that anon, and bare the heaven upon his neck long. Was never wight since that the world began that slew so many monsters as did he. Throughout the wide world his name ran, what for his strength and for his high bounty. And every realm went he for to see. He was so strong that no man might him let at both the world's ends, as said trophy. Instead of bounties he a pillar set. Elemon had this noble champion, that height de Janeira, fresh as may. And as these clerks make mention, she hath him sent a shirt, fresh and gay. Alas, this shirt, alas, and well away, envenomed was subtly withal, that ere that he had worn it half a day, it made his flesh all from his bones fall. But natheless some clerk is her excuse by one that height nessus that it maked. Be as he may, I will not her accuse. But on his back this shirt he wore all naked, till that his flesh was for the venom blacked. And when he saw none other remedy, in hot coals he hath himself erect. For with no venom deigned he to die, thus stiff this worthy mighty Hercules. Lo, who may trust on fortune any throw? For him that followeth all this world of prayers, ere he be wary, is often laid full low. Full wise is he that can himself know. Beware, for when that fortune list to gloss, then waiteth she her man to overthrow, by such a way as he would least suppose. The mighty throne, the precious treasure, the glorious scepter, and royal majesty, that had the king Nabucodonosor with tongue unaids, may describe it be, he twice won Jerusalem the city, the vessels of the temple he with him led. At Babylon was his sovereignty, in which his glory and delight he had. The fairest children of the blood royal of Israel he did do geld anon, and make each of them to be his thrall. Among us others Daniel was one, that was the wisest child of every one, for he the dreamers of the king expounded. Wherein Chaldea clerkes was there none that wist at who what finer his dreamer sounded. This prouder king let make a statue of gold, sixty cubitus long and seven in breadth, to which image hath the young and old commanded he to lout, and have in dread or in a furnace full of flames red he should be burnt that would not obey. But never would a centre to that deed Daniel, nor his younger fellows to a. This king of king as proud was and elate. He weened that God that sits in majesty might him not bereave of his estate. But suddenly he lost his dignity, and like a beast he seemed afore to be, and ate hay as an ox, and lay there out in rain, with wilder beasts walked he. Till certain time was he come about, and like an eagle's feathers waxed his hairs, his nails like a bird's claw were. Till God released him at certain years, and gave him wit. And then, with many a tear, he thanked God, and ever his life in fear was he to do amiss or more trespass. Until that time he laid was on his bier, he knew that God was full of might and grace.
his son, uh, which that height of Balthasar, that held the reign after his father's day, he by his father could not beware, for proud he was of heart and of array. And eke an idolaster was he, ay, his high estate assured him in pride. But fortune cast him down, and there he lay, and suddenly his reign gan divide. A feast he made unto his lords all upon a time, and made them blithe be. And then his officers gan he call, Go, bring forth the vessels, said he, which that my father in his prosperity out of the temple of Jerusalem reft, and to our high gods, thank we of honour that our elders with us left. His wife, his lorders, and his concubines, I drank while their appetites did last. Out of these noble vessels sundry wines. And on a wall this king his iron cast, And saw in hand armless that wrote full fast, For fear of which he quaked, and sighed sore. This hand that Balthus also sore aghast, Wrote Mane, Tekel, Faris, and no more. In all that land magician was there none that could expound it what this letter meant. But Daniel expounded it anon, and said, O king, God to thy father lent glory and honor, reign, treasure, rent, and he was proud in nothing God he dread, and therefore God great wretch upon him sent, and him bereft the reign that he had, he was cast out of man's company, with asses was his habitation, and ate hay, as a beast, in wet and dry, to that he knew by grace and by reason, the God of heaven, had domination, o'er every rain, and every creature. And then had God of him compassion, and him restored his reign, and his figure. Eke thou, that art his son, art proud also, and knowest all these things verily, and art rebel to God, and art his foe. Thou drankest of his vessels boldly, thy wife eke and thy winches, sinfully drank of the same vessels sundry wines, and harried false gods cursedly. Therefore to thee, shapen fool, great pine is. This hand was sent from God, that on the wall wrote Mane, Tekel, Fares. Trust me. Thy reign is done, thou weighest not at all. Divided is thy reign, and it shall be to Miras and Persians given. Quoth he, on the ilk same night this king was slaw, and Darius occupied his degree. Though he there too had neither right nor law. Lordings, example hereby may ye take, how that in lordship is no sickness. For when that fortune will a man forsake, She bears away his reign and his riches, And eke his friendless, both more and less. For what man that hath friendless through fortune, Mishap will make them enemies, I guess. This proverb is full sooth and full commune. Zenobia of Palmyria, the queen as right Persians of her noblest, so worthy was in armus as so keen, that no white passed her in hardiness, nor in lineage, nor other gentleness. Of the king's blood of Persa she descended. I say not that she had most fairness, but of her shape she might not be amended. From her childhood I find her that she fled office of woman and to wood she went, and many a wild heart as blood she shed with arrows broad, that she against them sent, she was so swift that she anon them hint, and when that she was older she would kill lions, leopards, and bears, all to rent, and in her armors wield them at her will, she durst the wild beasties dinis seek, and runnin' in the mountains all the night, and sleep under a bush, and she could eke wrestle by very force and very might with any young man, were he ne'er so white. There might a nothing in her armour stand. She kept a maidenhood from every white, 
to no man deigned she for to be bond. But at the last her frienders have her married to Odinet, a prince of that country. All were it so that she them longer tarried, and ye shall understand how that he had a such fantasies as had a she. But natheless, when they were knit in fear, they lived in joy and in felicity. For each of them had other leaf and dearer, save one thing, that she never would assent. By no way, that he should by her lie but one us, for it was her plain intent to have a child, the world to multiply. And also soon as that she might espy, that she was not with child by that deed, then would she suffer him do his fantasy eft soon, and not but one us out of dread. And if she were with child at the hill cast, no more should he play the yoked game, till full forty days were past. Then would she once suffer him do the same. All were this Odinatus wild or tame, he got no more of her, for thus she said, it was to wives lechery and shame, in other case if that men with him played. Two sonnets by this Odinit had she, the which she kept in virtue and lettrera. But now unto our tale turn we, I say so worshipful a creature, and wise therewith, and large with measure, so pinnable in the war, and courteous eke, nor more labour might in war endure, was none though all this world men should seek. Her rich array it might not be told, as well in vessel as in her clothing. She was all clad in pierre, and in gold, and eke she left not for no hunting, to have of sundry tongue as full knowing, when that she leisure had, and for tin tin to learn a book as was all her liking, how she in virtue might her life dispend. And shortly of this story for to treat, so doughty was her husband and eke she, that they conquered many reigns great in the Orient, with many a fair city appertinent into the majesty of Rome, and with strong hand held them fast, nor ever might their foemen do them flee, I, or that Odinatus days last. Her battles whoso list them for to read, against Sapor the king and other mo, and how that all this process fell indeed, why she conquered all what title thereto, and after of her mischief and her woe, how that she was besieged, and it take let him unto my master Petrock go, that writes enough of this I undertake. When Odin it was dead, she mightily the rein held, and with her proper hand against her foes she fought so cruelly, that there ne'er's a king, nor prince, in all the land, that was not glad if be that grace of hand, that she would not upon his land warre. With her they made an alliance by bond, to be in peace, and let her ride and play. The emperor of Rome, Claudius, nor him before the Roman galleon, durst never be so courageous, nor no Armenian, nor Egyptian, nor Syrian, nor no Arabian, within the field a durst with her fight, lest that she would them with her hand is slain, or with her many put them to fight. In Kinga's habit went her sons too, as heirs of their father's reigns all. And Ermano and Tomaleo, their namers were, as Persians them call. But I, fortune, hath in her honey, gall. This mighty queen may no while endure. Fortune out of her reign made her fall to wretchedness and to misadventure. Aurelian, when that the governance of Rome came into his hand is tway, he shope upon this queen to do vengeance. And with his legions he took his way towards Zenobia, and shortly for to say he made her flee, and at the last her hint, 
and fettered her and eke her children to a, and won the land, and home to Rome he went. Among us other thing is that he won her car that was with gold wrought and pierie. This great Roman, this Aurelian, hath with him led, for that men should it see. Before in his triumph walks she with gilt chains upon her neck hanging. Crowned she was, as after her degree, and full of Pieri, her clothing. Alas, Fortune, she that William was dreadful to kingess and to emperors. Now galleth all the people on her, alas. And she that helmed was in starker stirs, and won by force town is strong in towers. Obstinate battle shall on her head now wear a vitramite. And she that bear the sceptre full of flowers shall bear a distaff her cost for to quite. Although that Nero were so vicious as any fiend that lies full lower down, yet he, as telleth us Suetonius, this wide world had in subjection both east and west, south and septentrion, of rubies, sapphires, and of pearls white were all his clothes embroidered, up and down, for he and Jimis greatly gan delight. More delicate, more pompous of array, more proud was never emperor than he. That ilk cloth that he had worn one day, after that time he would it never see. Netters of gold thread had he great plenty to fish in Tiber when him list to play. His lusties were as law in his degree, for Fortune as his friend would him obey. He Rome burnt for his delicacy, the senators he slew upon a day. To hear how that men would weep and cry, and slew his brother, and by his sister lay. His mother made he in piteous array, for he her womb was slit. To behold where he conceived was, so well away that he so little of his mother told, no tear out of his iron, for that sight came. But he said, a fair woman was she. Great wonder is how that he could or might be doomless man of her dead beauty. The wine to bring him commanded he, and drank anon, none other woe he made, when might is joined unto cruelty, alas, too deep will the venom wade. In youth the master had this emperor, to teach him letrior, and courtesy, for of morality he was the flower, as in his time but if bookus lie. And while this master had of him mastery, he made him so conning and so supple, that longer time it was ere tyranny, or any vice, durst in him uncouple. This Seneca, of which that I devise, because Nero had of him such a dread, for he from vices would him I chastise, discreetly as by word and not by deed. Sir, he would say, an emperor must need be virtuous and hate tyranny. For which he made him in a bath to bleed on both his armors, till he must a die. This Nero had ache of accustomments in youth against his master for to rise, which afterward he thought a great grievance. Therefore he made him die in this wise. But natheless this Seneca the wise chose in a bath to die in this manner, rather than have another tormentize. And thus hath Nero slain his master dear. Now fell it so that fortune lists no longer the high pride of Nero to Cheras. For though he was strong, yet was she stronger. She thought of thus. By God, I am too nice to set a man that is full field of vice in high degree, an emperor him call. By God, out of his seat I will him trice. When he least weaneth, soonest shall he fall.
The people rose upon him on a night, for his default, and when he it aspired, out of his doors anon he hath him died to loan. And where he weened to have been allied, he knocked fast, and I, the more he cried friendship, the faster shut are they their doors. All. Then wist he well he had himself misguided, and went his way, no longer durst he call. The people cried and rumbled up and down, that with his ears heard he how they say, Where is this false tyrant, this near own? Warfield almost out of his wit he bred, and to his goddess piteously he prayed for succour, but it might not betide. For dread of this he thought of that died, And ran into a garden him to hide, And in this garden found he cherus twae, That sat by a fire great and red. And to the cherus too he gan to pray to slay him, And to girden off his head, That to his body, when that he were dead, Were no despite done for his defame. Himself he slew he could no better rid, Of which Fortune laughed and had a game. Was never Capitan under a king That reigns more put in subjection, Nor stronger was in field of all a thing As in his time, nor greater of renown, Nor more pompous in high presumption Than Holofernes, whom Fortune nigh kissed so licorously, and led him up and down, till that his head was off ere that he wist. Not only that this world had of him awe, for losing of riches and liberty, but he made every man renie his law. Nebuchadnezzar was God, said he, none other God should honoured be. Against his hest there dare no white trespass, save in Bethulia, a strong city, where Eliakim priest was of that place. But take keep of the death of Holofern. Amid his host he drunk and lay at night within his tent, large as a burn. And yet, for all his pomp and all his might, Judith, a woman, as he lay upright sleeping, his head off smote, and from his tent, full privily, she stole from every white, and with his head unto her town she went. What needeth it of King Antiochus to tell his high and royal majesty, his great pride, and his workus venomous? For such another was there none as he, reader what that he was in Maccabee, and reader the prouder word as that he said. And why he fell from his prosperity, And in a hill, how wretchedly he died. Fortune him had enhanced so in pride, That verily he weened he might attain Unto the stars upon every side, And in a balance weigh in each mountain, And all the flutters of the sea restrain, And God as people had he most in hate, Them would he slay in torment, and in pain, weening that God might not his pride abate. And for that Nicanor and Timothy, which Jews were vanquished mightily, unto the Jews such an hate had he, that he bade grace his car full hastily, and swore and said full despitously, Unto Jerusalem he would eft soon to wreak his ire on it full cruelly, but of his purpose was he let full soon. God, for his menace him so sore smote, with invisible wound incurable, that in his gutter's cough it so enboat, till that his penis were importable. And certainly the wretcher was reasonable, for many a man as got as did he pain. But from his purpose, cursed and damnable, For all his smart he would him not restrain, But bade anon unparally his host, And suddenly, ere he was of it wary, God daunted all his pride, and all his boast, 
for he so sore fell out of his chair that it his limbs and his skin to tear so that he neither might a go nor ride but in a chair a min about him bare all for bruised both the back and side the wretch of god him smote so cruelly that through his body wicked wormes crept and therewithal he stank so horribly that none of all his many that him kept whether so that he woke or ellis slept nay might it not of him the stink endure in this mischief he wailed and ick wept a new god lord of every creature to all his host and to himself also fool wolot sim was the stink of his carain no manner might him bear her to and fro and in this stink and this horrible pain he starved full wretchedly in a mountain thus hath this robber and this homicide that many a man are made to weep and plain such guerdon as belongeth unto pride the story of alexander is so commune that every wight that hath discretion hath heard somewhat or all of his fortune this wide world as in conclusion he won by strength or for his high renown they were glad for peace to him to send the pride and boast of man he laid a down where so he came unto the world's end comparison yet never might be maked between him and another conqueror for all this world for dread of him had quaked he was of knighthood and of freedom flower fortune him made the heir of her honour save wine and women nothing might assuage his high intent in arms and labour so was he full of leonine courage what praise were it to him though i you told of darius and a hundred thousand more of kingus princes ducus and earls bold which he conquered and brought them into woe i say as far as man may ride or go the world was his why should i more devise for though i wrote or told you ever more of his knighthood it might not suffice twelve years he reigned as saith maccabee philip's son of macedon he was that first was king in greece the country o oh, worthy gentle alexander alas that ever should thee fail such a case empoisoned of thy known folk thou were thy six fortune hath turned into an ace and yet for thee she wept a never a tear who shall me give tears to complain the death of gentleness and of franchise that all the world had in his domain and yet he thought it might not suffice so full was his courage of high emprise alas who shall me help her to indict false fortune and poison to despise the witcher too of all this woe i wight by wisdom manhood and by great labour from humbleness to royal majesty uprose he julius the conqueror that won all the occident by land and sea by strength of hand or else by treaty and unto roma made them tributary and since of roma the emperor was he till that fortune waxed his adversary o mighty caesar that in thessaly against pompeius father thine in-law that of the orient had all the chivalry as far as that the day begins to daw that through thy knighthood hast them taken slaw say few folk that with pompeius fled through which thou put all the orient in awe thank a fortune that so well thee sped but now a little while i will bewail this pompeius this noble governor of rome which that fled at this battle i say one of his men a false traitor his head off smote to winner him favour of julius and him the head he brought 
Alas, Pompey, of the Orient conqueror, that fortian unto such a fine deep rot. To Rome again repaired Julius, with his triumphal laureate full high. But on a time Brutus and Cassius, that ever had of his estate envy, full privily hath made conspiracy against this Julius in subtle wise, and cast the place in which he should die with bodekins, as I shall you devise. This Julius to the Capitol went, upon a day as he was wont to gone, and in the Capitol anon him hint, this false Brutus, and his other phone, and sticked him with bodekins anon, with many a wound, and thus they let him lie. But never groaned he at no stroke but one, or else at two. But if the story lie. So manly was this Julius of heart, And so well loved a stately honesty, That though his deadly wound is sore smart, His mantle o'er his hips cast he, That no man should see his privity. And as he lay a dying in a trance, And wist verily that dead was he, Of honesty yet had he remembrance. Lucan, to thee this story I recommend, and to Swayton, and Valerie also, that of this story write word and end, how that to these great conquerors too Fortian was first a friend and since a foe. No manner trust upon her favour long, but have her in a wait for evermore. Witness on all these conquerors strong. The rich Croesus, William King of Lyde, of which Croesus Cyrus him saw dread, yet was he caught amid us all his pride, and to be burnt men to the fire him led. But such a rain down from the welcome shed, that slew the fire and made him to escape. But to beware no grace yet he had, till fortune on the gallows made him gape. When he escaped was, he could not stint, for to begin a newer war again. He weened well, for that fortian him sent such hap, that he escaped through the rain, that of his foes he might not be slain. And eke a sweven on a knight he met, of which he was so proud and eke so fain, that he in vengeance all his heart set. Upon a tree he was set, as he thought, where Jupiter him washed both back and side, and Phoebus eke a fair towel him brought to dry him with, and therefore waxed his pride, and to his daughter that stood him beside, which he knew in high science to abound, he bade her tell him what it signified. And she his dream began right thus expound. The tree, quoth she, the gallows is to mean, and Jupiter betoken snow and rain, and Phoebus, with his towel clear and clean, these be the sun of streamers, suit the sane. Thou shalt he hangeth be, father, certain, rain shall thee wash, and sun shall thee dry. Thus warned him full plat and eke full plain, his daughter which that called was Fanai. And hanged was Croesus, the prouder king, His royal throne might him not avail. Tragedy is none other man a thing, Nor can in singing cryin' nor be well, But for that fortian all day will assail With unwary stroke the reins that be proud. For when men trust to her, then will she fail, And cover her bright face with a cloud. O noble, O worthy Pedro, glory of Spain! When fortune held so high in majesty, Well art men thy piteous death complain. Out of thy land thy brother made thee flee, And after, at a siege by subtlety, Thou wert betrayed and led unto his tent. Whereas he with his own hand slew thee, Succeeding in thy reign, and in thy rent. The field of snow, with eagles of black therein, 
Caught with the lion, red-colored as the glade, he brewed this cursedness and all this sin. The wicked nest was worker of this deed, not Charles's Oliver that took I heed of truth and honor, but of Armorac Ganillian Oliver, corrupt for mead, brought to this worthy king in such a brag. O oh, worthy Petro, king of Cyprus also, that Alexandra won by high mastery, full many a heathen wroughtest thou full woe, of which thine own lieges had envy, and, for no thing but for thy chivalry, they, in thy bed, have slain thee by the morrow. Thus can fortune her will govern and guy, and out of joy bring a men into sorrow. Of Milan, greater Bonabo Viscount, God of delight and scourge of Lombardy, why should I not thine clomben wert so high? Thy brother's son that was thy double ally, for he thy nephew was and son-in-law, within his prison made thee to die, but why, nor how, not I, that thou wast law? Of the Earl Hugolin of Pice, the Langua, there may no tongue a tale for pity. But little out of Pisa stands a tower, in which a tower in prison put was he. Odd with him be his little children three. The eldest scarcely five years was of age. Alas, fortune, it was great cruelty such a bird as or to put in such a cage. Damned was he to die in that prison, for Roger, which that bishop was of Pice, had on him made a false suggestion, through which the people gan upon him rise, and put him in prison in such a wise as ye have heard, and meat and drink he had so small, that well unneth it might suffice, and therewithal it was full poor and bad, and on a day befell, that in that hour when that his meat want was to be brought, the jailer shut the doors of the tower. He heard it right well, but he spake not, and in his heart anon there fell a thought, that they for hunger would a do him dying. Alas, quoth he, alas that I was wrought. Therewith the tears fell from his iron, his youngest son, that three years was of age, unto him said, Father, why do ye weep? When will the jailer bring in our pottage? Is there no morsel bread that ye do keep? I am so hungry that I may not sleep. Now would a God that I might sleep in ever. Then should not hunger in my womb creep. There is no thing save bread that one will lever. Thus day by day this child begun to cry, till in his father's balmy adown he lay, and said, Farewell, father, I must die. And kissed his father, and died the same day. And when the woeful father did it say, for woe his armors too he gan to bite, and said, Alas, fortune, and well away to thy false will, my woe all may I wite. His children weened that it for hunger was that he his arms nod, and not for woe, and said, Father, do not so, alas, but rather eat the flesh upon us too. Our flesh thou gave us, our flesh take us fro, and eat enough. Right thus they to him said, and after that, within a day or two, they laid them in his lap adown and died. Himself despaired eke for Honda staff. Thus ended is this Earl of Pice. Of this tragedy it ought enough suffice whoso will hear it in a longer wise. Read of the great poet of Itel, that Dante height, for he can it devise from point to point. Not one word will he fail. End of section twenty six.